Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. What if Naruto was neglected and became the Dawn's Emperor? Movie. The blonde haired boy, no older than 19 years of age, awoke on a king size bed. The blood red covers getting shoved over as he awkwardly sat up. The rays of the sun glared in his closed blue eyes. A natural alarm clock signaled that the morning had arrived. With a hand, he brushed his calm, lifeless looking blonde hair out of his eyes. As he rubbed his tired eyes, last night really took strain on him. A muffled knock was heard on the large doors to his right. With heavy eyes, he turned his head to face the noise. Come in the boy managed to yawn out, looking at the tall, slender old man who walked in. He wore a butler's uniform, his hair was a dark grey and was kept short, and bore a small moustache in the same colour. His name is Mitsuhide Sanaka, and is the head servant within the palace walls, overseeing the events, which take place in its walls. He was also a close confidant to the boy, and is completely loyal towards him. What should be most interesting about him is the fact he was once considered to be a great warrior back in his youth, and a true servant in the way of Bushido, the way of the warrior. He was once a member of the Bushido Seven, a group of samurai which were renowned for trying to keep the chaos contained in the West countries and protect the innocent from the wars, but he is now the only survivor. Now he uses his knowledge and experience to help train the boy in the arts of war, which proved to be vital during his campaign. My apologies if I woke you up your imperial majesty he spoke in a clear, aged tone, did you sleep well? The boy just chuckled in response. Not really Mitsuhide san, my head still spinning from that late night party the blonde replied as he slowly got to his feet, and, after a stretch, walked over to the large wardrobe in the corner of the room. Upon opening it, he grabbed one of his many highly decorated white suits, which was complete with a double-breasted blazer, white pants, a white long sleeve shirt and a white tidy match. On his feet he wore white trainers. He grew out of sandals and found shoes too uncomfortable for him. He had golden shoulder boards fixed to his shoulders, and had an embodied sash running from his right shoulder to the left side of his waist. He then walked over to the wooden screen, which was placed next to the wardrobe. Well your imperial majesty yesterday was a big event, as it was the second anniversary of this empire's unification. Ah yes, the unification of the western empire, no throughout the elemental countries as the empire in the west. It all would never have happened if the current emperor, the young boy, were betrayed by his home. Naruto Yuzumaki Namikis, the founder and first emperor of this empire. Time was kind to Naruto, for he no longer looked the idiotic young boy he once was, but instead a tall and proud young man. Gone were the whisker marks that told the tale of his previous fate, and his hair was no longer spiky, but calm and lifeless. How did it all start? It began when he successfully retrieved the last Ichiha, Sasuke Chiha, back to the village hidden in the leaves, also known as Kanoha. However, despite having been incredibly loyal to his home, he was rewarded with scorn and banishment. The reason, releasing the nine-tailed fox and the attempted killing of the Ichiha. Now this didn't hurt him, in fact, he was glad to be away from the spiteful village, but what hurt him was that everyone he thought he could trust, everyone he thought was his friends and family, betrayed him. Tsunade had scowled him for the injury Sauce could receive, despite being personally injured himself. His sensei, Kakashi Haddock, had left him to rot. His teammate, Sakura, had shunned him, as did the entire rookie nine, and most of all, Iruka, his big brother, and Jiria, his godfather. Only Tucci and Aim remained his friends, but even they couldn't help due to heavy pressure brought onto them. The only other person who never truly betrayed him was Hinata, in fact, she confessed her love to him only before his banishment. It hurt him to know he could now never return her feelings. Soon after he left the village, word got out that Tsunade had told the whole village of Naruto's dark secret, and so he was sure she would hate him as well. But he soon realized how blind he was when he was out of the village for good. It was like the wool had been removed from his eyes, he could see clearly. Now, compared to popular belief, he wasn't the idiot he made himself out to be. It was a mask, a self-defense mechanism to use against the villagers who hurt him over the years. Now he had no need for it, and so he was free. He also found out his heritage before his banishment, how? The small scroll that appeared mysteriously in his apartment. He could remember how shocked he was to find out he was the son of the fourth Hokage, Minato Namikis, and it strengthened his hatred towards Konoha, how much more had it kept from him. The scroll also contained the family fortune and the scrolls of his father, including the art of seals, which now he is a master of but it was his mother's scroll which she was deeply shaken at reading. Not only did she herself hold the Kaiyubi when she was alive, but she was also related to the former daimyo of Whirlpool country. This shook him to the core, he was practically royalty in terms of where he came from, but instead he was treated like dirt. What hit him hardest however was finding out that Madara Chiha was the one who sparked everything of, even having had a hand in his mother's demise. For making him lose everything before he even had it, Naruto swore revenge. But he wasn't alone on his travels. The very demon inside of him was his only true companion, and had a close relationship. Ironic that the demon was the only one he could truly trust. Naruto found out how the seal that bound him worked, and after a year of hard labor, freedom from his prison, complete with all nine tales of power. 
Now he could have left Naruto to get his revenge on the one who controlled him that fateful night, Madara Chiha, but he stayed with the boy, out of a sense of duty, and began to teach him many things not just in the ways of ninja, but also in many other aspects of life. So this came useful when he gained an ambition. An ambition, which would make him the most powerful ruler on the continent. To the west of the known elemental countries, things were done much different in many aspects. This vast land, though far larger than the eastern counterpart was also far less stable. The eastern countries were in fact the only place of stability on the land mass, and it was in small pocket compared to the rest of the continent, primarily due to the fact the eastern countries managed to settle down and develop. In the rest of the lands, dubbed by the east as the primitive west, things were different. Firstly, since the shinobi wars hadn't gotten near these lands, the population was higher because there were no great wars to diminish human life. Also, the first shinobi war saw the end of the samurai era as the domain force, but only in the eastern pocket. To the west, both ninja and samurai worked together to create a strong, military force for which all the small western countries used. But the biggest difference was in fact a flaw of the western part of the continent. Unlike the east, where there were strong central governments that held power, such as the daimyos, the west was nearly a lawless and chaotic place. Countless local warlords rose up and took power away from the daimyos, leaving them powerless and without authority, and used their newfound power to terrorize and control the countries. These warlords even sought to expand their power and declared war on other warlords, fighting over land and resources, especially in the northern parts. And while the wars were less frequent, it didn't mean they were less fierce. Instead many small skirmishes were fought, and many battles resulted in both sides losing many sutters, and usually also resulted in the death of one or both warlords participating in the fight. However, there would always be another warlord who would rise up and take the place of his predecessor. Naruto saw the lawlessness of the land, and together with Kairubi, sought to bring peace to the war-torn continent. He became first known throughout the land when he challenged and killed one of the most dangerous warlords, Nabunaga Oda, in a duel, a warlord who easily was one of the most powerful, due to having the biggest size of territory, compared to his rival lords. While he was considered a godsend to the people in the land having liberated them from the vile warlord, to the other rulers it was a different story. To them, he was merely considered to be a young, naive fool going out of his depth, and was thus entitled by the other warlords and daimyo, as the eastern fool. How wrong they were. This did not stop him however, and as he began to take on and defeat the neighboring rulers, one at a time. All the while he began to see changes in his old beliefs of battlefield tactics. The most prominent was that he no longer saw the prospect of having small-sized elite groups, or in fact a one-man army, like in the east as prominent enough to bring victory. Instead, he saw that many, well-trained troops and new technologies that are coordinated and combined properly and appropriately, could easily overcome any foe. This was seen in the skirmish of Nagata Ridge, which his forces defeated forces of the infamous warlord of Yoshino and Mikigar, using a combination of battalion formations containing a variety of archers, spearmen, and the use of explosive detonations to trap and destroy the enemy. Yoshino did not survive. A few years later he was arguable the most powerful lord in the west, after he swept through the other warlord lands, and like a selective plague, killed many of the tyrannical lords. But the course of his war, many coalitions were formed to try to stop his growing power. The first coalition was the only one to prove any challenge to him. Soon after any coalition formed was simply swept aside. Finally, soon after the fall of Kyoto and the Ashika Shogunate, many of the remaining rulers who had not fallen united in a grand final coalition in a last gambit, attempted to defeat the boy, before he was able to solidify his power. But Naruto was no longer the hot-headed genin that came from the east, but now was a great strategist of near unrivaled skill. This was seen in the climatic battle of Nashijiro, the final great battle Naruto fought in the west. At the start of the battle the blonde constantly outmaneuvered the coalition forces that sought to depose him. The coalition had many lords involved, and as such. While the battle went to and through, the turning point of the battle when he lured the hot-headed warlord Shuri to Kita's forces, compromising primarily of cavalry formations into the open plain, and destroyed them using a combination of the standing spear wall formations, to stop the cavalry in their tracks, and then having the archer's formations fire wave upon wave of arrows to bring them down. After this disaster of losing their primary cavalry force, the coalition began to crumble. Naruto's forces soon began to overwhelm their defenses one position at a time, before going to the final thrust of victory, claiming many of the coalition leaders lives in the process. After this their lands were easy to take. Once the coalition fell, there was never another coalition to rise against him. After seeing the climatic defeat of the coalition, many of the other rulers, which had not joined, sought it best to join Naruto, rather than lose everything. After negotiating with them, the boy's lance grew as what remained of both warlords and daimyo alike, rushed to swear loyalty to him, hoping that they would be able to keep their lance as reward for their loyalty. In the end Naruto's empire stretched from the elemental borders to the western shoes, an extremely long distance. While several of his major victories did come from wars, it was his diplomatic tongue that was his greatest asset. 
he would use his skills of negotiation, taught thanks to Kaiyubi, to not only defuse situations and play one foe against another, but also to gain allies, then vassals, then retainers. This happened when Yasunaga Hattori and the Hattori clan became a close ally to him when he first rose to power. The Hattori clan were a ninja force unlike any other in the West. Their abilities, while made them feared, also made them targets by those who felt threatened. Soon after Naruto managed several expansions they were under threat of the Takeda, who swore if they were captured, they would be killed. To survive against this, they accepted becoming a vassal to Naruto's power, in order to ward away the threats of the stronger clans. It was when Yasunaga died that his son Hanzo took over, and he had his own clan swore loyalty to Naruto. Examples of this also happened with the Sonata, Hoho, and Fukushima clans, which all in turn swore loyalty to him as his power expanded. His biggest form of support however was not from the clans, lords or daimyo, but came from the people of the war-torn lands. To them he was a hero fighting for them, for their beliefs, and for their dream of peace. Some even rose up and tore down their ruling classes in order to side with the boy. And so, after nearly five years of unification, and seeing their own lives slowly begin to improve thanks to a peace never seen before, it was only natural that they would want him to become their ruler. Their emperor. The Saint Rito was greatly pleased with his accomplishments. He created an empire that made the eastern countries combined look tiny in comparison. He took his place on the political stage with the other nations to the north and across the seas, and he gained many friends and comrades during that time. He also gained many new allies and warriors, who helped bring his country's military might to be an inspiration to others who looked in awe. However, even after all these accomplishments, the one thing that still eluded him was the thing he wanted most which was denied to him all his life, a loving family. The empire itself, due to his vast size, had a great variety of different population densities, along with different ethnic groups. The empire was essentially divided into five regions. In the center of the empire, was the capital, Kyoto. Here Naruto ruled the western empire in his palace. The palace was constructed by the vain Ashikaga shogun, who ruled the region with an iron fist, and had much of the territory's resources used for his own pleasures. A large palace of great magnificence, it was built at the cost of those living in the city, draining much of its resources to build. Naruto was able to capture the city, and the palace, intact, and now used it for his own design. The two of the three most populated centers also were in the center of the empire, they being Osaka and Edo. The central region had little urban development, but it was the center of expanding ideas, and Osaka was considered the city of development for the empire, due to the large amount of guilds within its walls, which focused upon research and development. The third, Aori, was in the eastern region of the empire, and was a strong defensive base, due to its close proximity to the eastern countries. The eastern region was a place with large rural areas with few urban towns and cities. These however were all fortified, as it was in the eastern region where some of the strongest warlords had made their base before Naruto appeared. The eastern region is primarily a military area due to its high population density, and most of the military forts being built for the empire were located in this region. The western region was by far the largest of the regions, and such was considered to be the most important after the central region. It had many trade ports within the empire, which brought in vast material wealth as well as knowledge from countries far beyond the sea. The city port of Shuncheng, which was considered to the region capital in terms of trade, was the most influential in these terms, as it brought into the empire the majority of the foreign goods. The western region also held the highest population of the regions, covering both urban and rural areas. While not gathered, as there were few cities in the region, and none as densely populated as the three population centers, there were certainly many more small cities, towns and villages, than anywhere else in the empire. However, two regions were a constant problem for Naruto. The northern and southern regions. Both had suffered severely during the war of unification, but also new problems had arisen, both internally and externally, made both regions the hardest to govern, but also put strain on the empire's already low recourses. There are two reasons why Naruto is intent on holding on to them however. The northern region is highly rich in natural minerals. Great quantities of copper, ore, and gold were being found all over the north, and much more was being discovered. Some of this appeared shortly before Naruto's ascension, but after being persuaded by his advisors to search for any more mineral hotspots, the region was soon covered with many mines to extract these precious minerals. While the western region also held high quantities of minerals, the northern region's mineral wealth was considered to be more accessible. Soon the empire would benefit greatly when enough was extracted, not just from the northern, but also the western region. The problem was that it was on the border next to the religious Syrian empire. Tensions have been high between these two great powers, and war seems to be close to inevitable. The southern region on the other hand was plain and bare, but this vast, empty plain, the location would be perfect for creating many farms and livestock. The people in the south were naturally rural, and so to create vast farms to help cultivate the empire's ever-growing demand for resources would prove vital in the years to come. The system of government that the emperor used to rule this immense empire was quite complex. 
At the top of the vast bureaucracy, it involved three branches, each with its own style of appointment and its own level of power. The first is to be the House of Representatives, but is more commonly known as the House of Commons. The reason for this is that the people themselves elected all the members of the House. The Rito understood the value of democracy when it came to ruling the land, so it was best to give the people a voice when it concerned their well-being, and also guaranteed its popularity amongst the masses. The second was the more prestigious Senate, which contained those who could be considered wise individuals, as all the members were experts in their own fields. This branch was appointed by the Emperor himself, as it would be useful to have such experts in the government. Finally, the third branch was the House of Lords. This branch contained all the lords and high-ranking nobles, which had sided with Naruto during the wars, as a promise that he would restore their power if they joined. The House of Lords is considered to be the smallest of the branches, due to how few lords actually joined with the boy emperor, but it is in fact the one he works most closely with. While these branches did hold great sway over the empire, it was the emperor who held the most power, if all the power, as it was he who had final say over what decisions to take. In this form he was essentially an autocratic ruler, who wielded unlimited legislative and executive power, who had essentially delegated some powers to the branches to keep them happy. The emperor himself worked with a cabinet with individuals who worked on certain areas, such as agriculture and justice. Within this cabinet contained what was considered to be the leaders of the three houses. The speaker of the representatives, the speaker of the senate, and the lord speaker of the house of lords. So far this form of government has been effective, and so it looked like it wouldn't change soon. And so two years since the unification of the western lands, Emperor Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze was getting ready for an important meeting with one of his daimyo allies, who had regained some of their former power under the boy's leadership, just as he promised them. Upon putting his tie in place and put in a golden amulet on the top of the tie, he walked out from behind the screen, and looked towards the sharp-dressed man. I must admit even in my youth we never had a party like that, I guess this is what peace and prosperity brings you, Naruto smiled at his old-aged head servant. Well, it goes to show what you can do when everything goes as planned. He turned to his chief servant. Shall we go then? He asked Miss Tuhide, who bowed in response. Grinning, the boy walked past the man as he fixed his white gloves, which had strange markings on the back side of his hands, and headed to the corridor in the palace, his chief servant behind closed him. Walking out, he gazed at those ready to meet him. Naturally, twelve huge figures stood at attention. These men are the Praetorian Guard. What greater bodyguard could there be to a ruler of Naruto's caliber? There are twelve among the greatest warriors in the empire, who are in fact rumored to be some of the first to bow before Naruto, and have been rewarded with his complete trust. Armed with golden, highly decorated armor that has symbols of the eagle upon its surface, and are armed with both a halberd in their hands and a sword in its sheath, they are ready to take on any foe. These were created by the greatest of the empire's smiths that surpass even current modern achievements, and supported by magical seals to increase toughness and decrease the weight. It is said that even one of these warriors would even give a cage a challenge in single combat, but that has yet to be seen. Eternally loyal, these men would literally, and gladly give their lives to protect the Grand Emperor of the West. Also there to greet him is Lord Kamei Shida, the head of the Empire's civil service. He wears a bright white business suit that is termed yellow, with white gloves and black shoes. His hair is a short brown, along with his eyes. On his chin is a small beard, which is short, showing it hasn't been grown for long. Kamei is Naruto's chief of staff and coordinator of the mass bureaucracy within the empire, which helps manage the mass flow of information. If anyone wants an audience with the emperor, they have to speak to him first, for he is the one that helps organize Naruto's daily schedule. Even members of the government have to speak to him first to be granted an audience. Considered to be one of the most powerful men in the empire, Naruto trusts him due to the fact he has no real political ambitions. They however on their surface only had professional relationship, privately, he has helped Naruto through many situations in dealing with the often divided government. He bows his head in respect to Naruto. Your Imperial Majesty, how are you this morning? He asked, raising his head to see Naruto with a smile. Fine Lord Kamei Dono, so what's this day's agenda? Kamei handed Naruto a piece of paper, which essentially showed him of what is going on today. The first order of business is the meeting with the lords of the northern region, Naruto was glad this was to be dealt with first. When the Western Empire came into being, the neighboring Siren Kingdom to the north, seeing this new empire as a threat, has been launching raids to disrupt the northern provinces, but also to try and get at the recourses being discovered. Though significantly smaller than Naruto's empire, they were proving to be a thorn in his side. Any attempt at trying to come to terms with the Emir, the ruler of Siren, has failed. Naruto was afraid that soon, if these raids were not stopped, it could spill into all-out war. As large as the Western Empire was, it was not ready militarily, economically, or even culturally ready for another war. This meeting with the Northern Province Lords was to hopefully find ways of strengthening the borders, as two Imperial Legions had already been directed at the North to try and gain a measure of control on the situation. It was obvious to many people in the top of the Empire, including the Emperor himself, that the only thing at the moment keeping the Empire safe was his size. 
far bigger than any nation, and even combined it would still be small. The size of the empire gave of a feeling to invincibility to the rest of the nations. However, if they knew what exactly was happening within the, the sense of power would diminish. While the economy was stable, and grown quite exponentially, it was relatively weak when considering the size of the empire. The economy would have in fact been dismal if it was not for the fact that many of the daimyos hadn't surrendered to Naruto. Well this created a problem in regulating the provinces as it would require new appointments. The fact is much of the land's wealth was now in Naruto's hands, and not in the pockets of the individual provincial lords. Due to this advantage, he would be able to spend it when two would be most needed. Adding to this work still had to be done on both the infrastructure and the empire integrity. Even after a few years of unification things were rocky at best. Furthermore, the military strength of the empire was currently feeble. When local lords or daimyos had armies, it was primarily made up of Ashigaru, or peasant soldiers. Only few samurai were actually seen on the battlefield, and there was a major difference between an peasant with a spear and a trained soldier with a katana. As such the emperor has attempted to train a properly standing force that consisted of trained samurai over Ashigaru forces. However, to train an army vast enough to protect an empire as large as the Western Empire would take a great amount of time and recourses to create. Overall, while it looked formidable, the Western Empire was in a relatively vulnerable position, and would remain so for some time till it began to bear the fruits of the people's labor, then it would become the power it is rumored to be. Before Kamei could continue to talk about the schedule however, a voice rang out through the halls of the Imperial Palace. Your Majesty. Naruto turned his head to see another dressed man running towards him. He was clean-shaved and had short black hair. My apologies for interrupting your schedule, but there is a long white-haired man who wishes to see you, he says it is urgent. Naruto signed in annoyance, he turned to the other man next to him. Tell the lords of the northern provinces I will be slightly late for the meeting. The man bowed and walked off to perform his duty. The young emperor walked with the other man down the long hall to see whom this stranger was, and what he wanted that was so urgent. Did he say who he was? He asked inquisitively. The man shook his head. I am afraid not your majesty he replied, he only said he was from the eastern countries, I think he said it was fire country, and he was here on goodwill. Naruto stopped in his tracks, causing the servant to turn around. Is there something wrong sire? He asked. Naruto's features darkened. If this man was from fire country, then there was a chance he came from that place. We shall see, he muttered to himself, but proceeded to continue walking to where this man was, followed by Kamei and the twelve guards. Finally, they reached the doors to the guest room. The man walked to the door and grabbed the handle, opening it for the blonde. Upon stepping into the room, he saw a long-haired man wearing red, his back turned as he stared out the window. Hearing the door open the figure turned, and smiled at how he saw. Hey there brat, how's it been? Naruto's eyes widened in shock as he recognized the voice, before he gave the man a heated glare, his voice filled with both anger and hate, as he growled out the man's name. The glare told the members of the Praetorian Guard that this man was trouble, and readied themselves against him. Jiraiya. Naruto was usually a patient man. When he played the long wars for unification, he forced himself, with the help of his old friend Kairupi, to learn the value to patience. Thanks to this long patience he now has it helped him greatly in his war. Now he was a man who rarely lost his temper to anyone, or even lashed out when something took too long like in his genin days. But even that long gained patience was lost when he looked at the man that used to be his godfather. It showed that when hate runs deep, it could make your patience quickly disperse. Thinking back he realized this is how Sasuke must have felt with Itachi. Naruto stared at who was meant to be his godfather with absolute burning hatred in his eyes. This man, the same man who had betrayed him seven years ago, had forgotten his promise to his father Minato, and now had the shocking nerve to just waltz into his palace, and call for him, when he had other, far more important, matters to attend to. Yuri on his part looked deeply unnerved at the killing intent being directed at him by the young boy. He began to squirm uncomfortably and had looked down, trying not to look into the boy's eyes that told him he far from welcome here. That and the fact that twelve large men in armor, pointing their weapons directly towards him, also brought that belief of being unwelcome home. What are you doing here and what do you want? I would advise you speak quickly for I am a very busy man the blonde managed to say through gritted teeth, he really didn't want to waste his time on this old pervert who abandoned him all those years ago. Naruto, please let me explain the old man tried to reason with the boy, only to have it backfire in a spectacular way. Explain. Explain what? Naruto finally let loose the raging currents of anger, making the old man suddenly feel small. Explain why you never appeared in the first 12 years of my life like you promised my father and mother. Explain the reason why they left me, like the rest of Kanoha. Explain why you never told me of my heritage. Explain the reason you betrayed my parents' memory by not acting as a godfather. Explain why you think you can just appear in my palace univited. Jiraiya visibly flinched at the torrents of anger being directed at him, while at the same time Ishida and Mitsuhite both took steps back from the burst of anger. Never before had they seen their emperor so angry before.
Now Jerry felt like a clown. He really was a fool to abandon Naruto in his time of need, when he needed a shoulder to lean on, a pillar of strength. Instead he abandoned him like all the others that were his supposed friends. Now he was paying that price right now with a less than even a neutral welcome, and he wouldn't be surprised if he had to fight his way out. Looking at the twelve men in Golden Amar, he paled slightly, knowing it would be a difficult task. He watched as Naruto, with his anger dispersing, calmed himself, fixed his tie and straightened up. Then he noticed the cold blue eyes burrowing into his own, before lowering his gaze. How did you find me? He asked in a very calm voice, his face looking down, and his hair covering his eyes. Believe it or not, you are quite well known in the eastern part of the continent, even though your name hasn't been revealed yet. You are known as the Emperor of the West, first person to not only unite a majority of this unruly side of the continent, but to also create a grand empire which, even if the East united, would not be able to defeat. Hell, the Demio of the East are in fact so scared of you that none of them dare try to challenge you, Jirei explained himself. You were also last seen moving to the west on the borders of Wind Country, and everyone here knows your name, so naturally it was easy to find out your location. Naruto looked up to his former sensei. I will admit your security is tough, it took me nearly forever to find a good reason for you to see me. At this Ashida glared at him. Well it seems you managed to get by me, tell me what did you use? He asked in a polite yet restrained tone. At this Shireya laughed nervously while scratching the back of his head. Well I said I was on an errand of goodwill from the fire daimyo, as you can see I'm not. I apologies for the deception. Ishida glared at him a bit more before sighing. It seems since he is from the eastern side, he wouldn't understand what the respected way of asking an audience was. Naruto soon broke the silence. What are you doing here? And please, don't tell me it was to see my godson. That excuse of one you don't have the pleasure of using anymore. Again the Sanin flinched at the cold voice of his former student, but again it was to be expected. I came to explain myself why I did what I did Naruto looked up, shock visible on his features. The old man sighed. I admit what I did was wrong, and I did something that you would never be able to forgive me, but I did it so I could finally clear my head. Every time I saw you, I saw your father and your mother, and it hurt deep inside to see you so like to them both physically and mentally. When the time came when you retrieved Sosk, I just couldn't bring myself to help you, because I did in fact blame you for Minato's death. When I heard you got banished, I realized I made a huge mistake. I decided to do the right thing before I left you. I gave you your heritage. Naruto's eyes widened in realization. It was Jureya who planted the scrolls in his apartment. The Sanin continued his story, seeing you leave the village, I finally realized my mistake, but I didn't go to see you because I knew you would hate me, and what happened just now proved that Naruto snorted at this. You guessed right on that one old man. Unfaze, Jureyu continued. I also knew that for what I did Minato and Kashina would never forgive me, so I decided to do the next best thing, I decided to help you out from the shadows. The council on many occasions tried to put you in the bingo book, and also tried to send hunter nins after you. But I went to the Lord of the Land of Fire, as he was a good friend to Minato for saving his daughter during the Third Shinobi War, and I told him the whole story. Naturally he felt in debt to Minato, and so he went to the council personally to end it. Trust me when I say it was quite a show. Flashback, the Council of Kanoha sat in the dark grand chamber deep within the Hokage's mansion, standing in front of them all was the Demio of Fire Country, who was their lord and master. The look on his face showed his obvious discontent of both them, and the Hokage, who too was present. To the council something very serious must have transpired for not only for the daimyo, the lord of fire country, to make his presence known, but also to have the features of deep dissatisfaction. Whatever the reason was, the council braced themselves for what was to come. A very reliable source told me that you are trying to put a boy in the bingo book, for the sole reason of being the vessel of the nine-tailed fox. I must ask this council if this is true. The council on their part were naturally shocked at what they were hearing. Hiashi was the first to regain his composure. My lord he started, I am afraid that the reason for trying to put him in the bingo book is not that reason, well I do admit that it is a reason all on its own, it is not the main reason. The Demio looked at him. Strange he spoke, sounding confused, because I do believe that is the only reason, and only way you can put him into the bingo book the council looked quite nervous at this. Firstly, you Hokage banished the boy, so you cannot label him a missing ninja, as he isn't technically a ninja anymore. Secondly, you cannot have him placed as a criminal, because I can see no grounds in order to put him in as one. My third reason is in fact a political reasons the council looked confused, so he decided to clarify. The daimyo of wind in fact spoke about this Naruto with high regards, saying that he helped Suna's demon vessel, and also made him see his own fault in cutting their ninja's pay. Also, Princess Yuki of Spring Country also holds Naruto in high regards for what he did for her. So I do believe that if I was to allow you to put him in the book, then my own political influence with these two will begin to decrease, as well as those in the land of vegetables, and the land of birds. As you can see, I cannot allow this event to take place. The Demio then stood up from his chair, the council was frozen, and they knew what was coming. I am Ruby ordering you, all of you, not to put Naruto Uzumaki in the bingo book for any reason. 
If I find that you have put him in, then the consequences will be extremely dire. The threat was hit home. Now the council knew they were powerless to try and get rid of Naruto. Homura tried to protest. But my lord. He yelled, he could easily join our enemies and tell them our secrets. Konoha is now in danger. The cold glare he received instantly shut him and. And whose fault is that I wonder. The council flinched at their lord's words. The daimyo stood up from his chair and proceeded to walk out of the chambers. Remember that my warning stands, as it will be you who will pay the price. After this the chambers were in silence. Flashback end. Naruto looked at his godfather with complete shock. Both he and the daimyo of fire country did all that for him. A small smile graced his lips. Jureya, why I cannot forgive you for you abandoning me. I do thank you for both giving me my heritage, and for saving me from the council. The Sanin smiled in delight. He had repaired a small bond in their broken relationship, and although it was small, it was a start. He also noted that the guards were now at ease, which to him was a relief. I guess I must thank the Lord of Fire Country as well for getting me out of the to be added to the bingo book list he added as an afterthought. Then a look of horror quickly appeared of his face before turning to the old man. Does Konoha know about me yet? Naruto asked the dreaded question. He was deeply relieved when he saw the sand and shook his head. As I said, they know about you exploits, but not your identity, apparently you are visibly unknown in the east. Only known as the Emperor of the Western Empire. Naruto was happy to know he his identity was still a mystery. He could only imagine the horrors if they found out. They would be willing to bring Kanoha to his knees if it meant his demise. He then looked at the Sanin completely seriously. That's not the only reason for you coming here to see me is it? The Sanin nodded his head. Naruto sighed. This was going to be a long day. Tsunade was desperately trying not to rub her temples at the bickering of this council. They were dragged into a war with Iwa, Odo and Kumo in a war, which was easy to see it would be near impossible to win. Several over small countries had also joined in hoping to gain the spoils of Kanoha. It was widely believed that Arachimaru managed to get the cages of lightning and stone to attack the village in the leaves, using their not so great past as leverage. Now it was a three, if not more against one war, with Kanoha looking to be the loser. And even if they did win, Kanoha would find it incredibly hard to recover from the loss of lives and resources, which could take decades. Suna had retracted their alliance with Kanoha shortly after they banished Naruto, and now they refused to give aid in the war, and the Princess of Spring also refused to lend a hand to the Leaf Village. Bird and vegetable countries also cut their ties with Kanoha, and when Wave Country finally paid of the debt for what was meant to be an A-rank mission, they closed their borders to Kanoha. This was also unable to help due to the fact they were still recovering from the civil war they suffered from. Needless to say the rebels won. Because the third Hokage didn't support them in any way, they didn't consider it necessary to aid Kanoha. Now Kanoha was alone, and they needed an ally if they were to win this war and get out well. At this moment thought, that seemed impossible. But that wasn't the complete story, as it seemed that multiple daimyo of the foreign lands were converge of the land of fire, and take its recourses for itself. If this rumor was indeed true, then there was no way of winning this war. Arachimaru must have managed to enlist their support. Because of this, the fire daimyo was powerless to help them as this new coalition, called the Northern Alliance, was about to converge on the land of fire. This was a clever tactic on Arachimaru's behalf, as now the daimyo's lands were threatened, he was less inclined to send reinforcements to Kanoha. They had been outmaneuvered time and again in this war. They had lost a political battle, now it seems they were going to lose more than that. Sunade finally had enough of the loud noise that filled the chamber, the arguments that filled the air. She raised her fist high above her head, and then slammed it down onto the stone table, causing a crack to appear. The loud noise easily gathered the council's undivided attention to her. The council was made up of the main clans of Kanoha, and the Hokage's personal advisors. Sasuke was now a member of the council as well, but ever since his little betrayal to Orochimaru, he hasn't been completely trusted by any other of the members. Now does anyone have any reasonable solutions to this problem? We need an ally, a strong one if that if we are to win this war and survive in relatively good shape. Tsunade stated. Danzo nodded his head in agreement, while he disagreed many times with Tsunade in the past, now was not the time for divided government. The Hulkage is right, if we are to get out of this mostly intact, then we need to get another force involved on our side, if we are to turn the tide to our favor, credibly a force strong enough to turn the tide. Inachi shook his head at this, he like all the others, knew that there was a major problem. But who will aid us? He asked, Suna tore up the alliance with us to shreds when we banished Naruto Uzumaki. Following that, Spring Country has become very cold to us, as well as Wave, Bird, and Vegetable Countries, not counting the other smaller areas which the boy made an impact with. Furthermore, Miss has no reason to aid us, so they won't. Come to think of it, I do believe that banishing him was the worst mistake we have made since Kanoha's founding. It had brought more harm than good to us in the long term. Sure we no longer have to worry about the Kyubi coming back to terrify us, but at what price? Hell, the Kyubi even may appear again right before us if something happened to Naruto. 
many members actually agreed with the Yamanaka on these last points, as soon after the boy's departure, foreign relations began to plummet fast to an all-time low. Even their own daimyo seemed to be on the boy's side, forbidding them to place him in the bingo book, or try to send ninja after him. Yuri also seemed to be supporting the boy also, as soon after he left, the Sanin left too, never have they heard from him since. It seemed that the whole world was against the village for what they did to that one boy. I still say the third should have allowed me to make him into a weapon, that power would be gravely useful by now Danzo stated. Tsunade narrowed her eyes. Damn she had been foolish in banishing Naruto. Being pressured by the council, as well as the anger by the villagers to how Naruto handed the retrieval of Sasuke, Tsunade's hands were tied. Part of the her originally believed that if she banished Naruto, then waited a few years before calling him, everything would have calmed down by then. Turned out not to be the case. In desperation, she resorted to informing all of them Naruto's burden, hoping the younger generations would have stood by him by understanding his burden. How wrong she was. No sooner had she told them all, they all turned on him. Now because of her mistakes, she not only lost her surrogate grandson, but also caused his former friends to hate him. She never felt so old in her life, causing the ultimate betrayal of trust. I have an idea, it's crazy and no, but it may be our only hope. How about trying to bring aid from the Empire in the West? Everyone turned to the one who spoke, it was Sasuke Chiha. While people may not believe it, he regretted the actions and was even trying to become Hokage, in memory of the person who tried to help him, Naruto Uzumaki. Hope hoped that one day he could see the blonde once more, and try to help him in any way he possible could. Kahari smiled at the suggestion. It became well known throughout the east part of the continent, a young boy within five years conquered the vast lands of the west, which were separated by the vast mountains that go between the two parts, and in fact became the first person ever to be able to unify a vast amount of the continent, and in a brilliant record time as well. While they knew little about its military strength in detail, they did know that its army was easily the largest in the continent, and had some powerful warriors in its ranks. This had to be the case due to the sheer size of the empire. Yes, getting the empire as an ally would easily turn the tables in the war, and may even cause both Kumo and Iwa to surrender without a fight, as the emperor could have contacts with the demios of lightning and stone, and if the rumors were true, get them not to attack fire country. So it only made sense to try and get the emperor as an ally. One problem still remains spoke Shikakunar in his usual dull tone, how can we persuade the Emperor of the West to join in the war, they have no reason to. The Akimichi had nodded in agreement to his companion and friend. I must disagree with this idea, everyone turned to Hiyashi. First of all, why do we actually have to give in return for our aid? Also, this is the West we are talking about. Do you honestly expect them to come to the rescue to an Eastern power, just because we asked them to? Furthermore, what do we know of the Emperor? For all we know he could want fire country as a vessel in return for military aid. Many of the council began to look dejected at the last point. Becoming a vessel to another power would be humiliating. Tsunade sighed in annoyance. Well, it is worth a try, regardless of the cost we must seek aid. I for one am willing to serve a higher power if it means our survival the Hukage spoke with authority. I will send a team of my choosing into the empire, and see if they can get an audience with the emperor, which should be easy as he does a lid of foreign and domestic affairs personally. Hai she looked at Tsunade with unfazed features. Does anyone know anything about this Emperor of the West? Asked Chauza. Apparently the rumors which are circulating he is open-minded and treats his guests with care, no matter who they are. And I also heard that their economy is starting to become one of the best as well, so it could be possible to also gain a trade agreement. Danzo replied. He sounds also to be an idealist, being one myself it's best to find out his motives as well. I would not rather have to worry about the West as well. Tsunade nodded her head to the old Warhawk, it was reassuring to know that they were dealing with a powerful person. Well, I do believe that is all for today, meeting dismissed. You are asking me to help Kanoha. Naruto stared at the man in shock, he was asking for the impossible. Jiraiya knew he was pushing it, so he had to be careful how he moved, or it would end in a very bad way. I know what I am asking for you is a lot Naruto, and I do understand that you want to protect your people, but war is going to come to you sooner or later, the Sanin explained. Naruto signed in annoyance. Tell me Jiraiya. Why should I help a village that has scorned my very existence since the day I was born? He asked. The answer he got was simple. Because you are better than them, better than me the man spoke in a calm and soft voice, you never once let your hatred rule your judgment. You never once left people alone when they were at their time of need. He then smiled, so show them you are better than them. Prove to them that you aren't what they think you are. Naruto began to rub his temples, looking to be deep in thought. Should he help Kanoha? Would they accept him? Would they still hate him? Jiraiya hit home with his next sentence. What about Hinata? Do you still care about her? Naruto looked shocked at the name. Hinata. Hinata Hayuga, the girl who had confessed her love for him. But does she now see him as the demon fox? Or did she still feel something for him? But it's just not Kanoha that's in peril Naruto, the blonde looked up at him strangely. He saw the Sanin's face was one of seriousness. The whole of fire country is now in danger. His eyes widened at the news. How? 
he asked. Surely Orochimaru couldn't be that ambitious. Turns out that Orochimaru had enlisted the aid of the daimyos of Earth, Lightning, and several smaller countries to his aid. Also, he's gained the alliance of many other small countries, promising them all part of the lands of fire if they cooperate, and so now a grand army is moving against it. It now apparently being called the Northern Alliance. Naturally, the Fire Demio is in a state, and we both know that he won't survive against this many odds. To be honest it is a clever tactical move. With the Daimyo forced to protect his own lands, he won't be able to protect Kanoha, thus leave Kanoha with no aid whatsoever. I can understand why you would be deeply upset with Kanoha, but even if you don't help them, at least help the people of Fire Country. I'm sure in this current situation, the Daimyo would pay any price to survive. Naruto was now conflicted. He did owe the Fire Daimyo for sticking his neck out to stop Kanoha coming after him, but then he would be involved in a war that technically didn't involve him. He gave a deep sigh of annoyance. I'll think about it Jureya decided to leave it there. While he was not pleased with the decision on Omi thinking about it, he was happy that Naruto would consider the possibility. A loud knock on the door soon brought all in the room out of their thoughts. Come in Naruto shouted, turning his gaze to the person who entered. He was a tall, slender man, who wore a bright red suit, with a white long sleeve shirt. He had long flowing hair that reached down his back tight in a ponytail, and had a face that women could just faint over. So it's true that you are here he spoke, he voiced warm and soft. He then turned to Naruto with a confused look on his features. I thought you said you would never deal with Kanoha again after what they did to you. The blonde again gave yet another sigh. He seemed to be doing that a lot this morning. Well something came up that I wasn't expecting unfortunately, and now a grave situation is developing in the eastern pocket. The Redeed looked at the San and then smirked. Well I must say it's been 19 years since we last met, Jiraiya the Toad Sanin. Said Sanin looked at the man with a questioning glare. How did he know him? Who are you? He asked simply. The long-haired man extended his arm as he did a fanciful bow. Forgive me, where are my manners? I have gone by many names over my 10,000 year existence dear Jiraiya. But you know me, old man, as the Kyubi no Yuko. The nine-tailed demon fox. Jiraiya's face was the picture-perfect example of complete and utter horror, a face that Naruto couldn't help but burst out laughing at the sight of due to how ridiculous he looked. Tsunade sat in her office, fingers interlocked in front of her face, Shizun beside her. Standing before her was the assembled team in which she hoped would prove to be the salvation of Kanoha. Kakashi had it, Kurunai Yuhi, Kiba Inizuka, Shino Aburam, Sakura Haruno, and Hinata Hayaga. Many of the selected group was of the former Rookie 9, and she picked each one for a different reason. Kakashi Haddock was a skilled jonin, with over a thousand jutsu and the legendary Shuringen, he would be a formidable opponent to anyone they met, and a good group leader of this mission. Despite being of a lazy nature, his experience was vital. He was also sensei of the now deceased Team 7, and knew the boy, Naruto Uzumaki, quite well. She secretly hoped that if they did encounter Naruto along the way, even though it was a slim chance, he would be able to convince him to return. Kurunai Yuhi, the Jinjutsu mistress, would prove a valuable support by confusing the enemy with her illusions. She also would be a good second in command also due to her experience, and her outlook on life contrasted that of Kakashi's, giving the group different options on certain matters, should they arise. She was also a last column of support for Hinata, so she was also valued for that reason since she too was coming on this mission. Kiba Inizuka and his partner Akamaru were deadly double team, and being the rank of Jonin also showed his skills. Should the group encounter any trouble, he would easily be able to pull them out. When she told everyone of Naruto's dark secret, he was one of the first to turn against the blonde. Now she wished she hadn't have done it, as if they even got Naruto back, he would receive a less than warm welcome. Shino Aburam was also a very skilled jonin, having been good at reconnaissance made him needed should they run into trouble. His calm demeanor would be an added bonus to the group as situations heated up too much. Sakura Haruno, the best medic nin ever to be produced, even in Tsunade's prime, she couldn't achieve what her apprentice had done. So it was only natural that she takes this mission. Like Hiba, she despised Naruto, not for being a demon, but as danger that needed to be eliminated. Again she wondered if it was a good idea to tell them his dark secret. Finally, Hinata Hayuga was put on the team for a very special reason. While she was only a chunin, her diplomatic skills were second to none. So if the emperor were to decide not to aid the village, then Hinata would do her very best to persuade him to reconsider. She was the only one out of the rookie nine to miss Naruto, and finding out his secret only strengthened her love for the blonde. Love really is a special thing. The reason you are all here is because you all will be going to the western lands, to go to the western empire and try and persuade the emperor to aid us in this war. The assembled ninja were deeply surprised, they were going west. None of them had any knowledge of the lands, so this was a complete new adventure for them. You all have been entrusted with this mission because of your skills. You must do everything you can to make him join the war as our ally, or we will lose this war. The future of Kanoha hangs in the balance, so you must not fail. Tsunade spoke with a very rare seriousness, which made all present understand the situation better. They were to try and get an empire into the war, or Kanoha would surely fall.
Naruto rattled his head furiously as he attempted to face his most difficult challenge to date. He sat in his private study within the palace, so he could deal with this problem in peace, his guards outside to make sure he was not disturbed. Note Aimyo, demon or any other situation in the past was as annoying as this, yet he refused to back down. It was the bane of all rulers, and it would continue to be so for the next thousand years, until a proper solution was found, and could now understand what frustrated old man Suratobi the most in life. Paperwork, lots of it. Yes, ruling a big empire had its drawbacks, especially when Naruto preferred to check a lot of important things himself. His inability to delegate important matters to others came at the price of having a bigger load than one would expect. Within the pages contained reports of various matters, from cabinet briefings, meeting requests and regional industrial reports, to economic reports, various military affairs, and even research into new subjects. Some were daily, some weekly, others were monthly, and on the obviously rare occasion, yearly reports were given to him. Naruto sighed in annoyance. Often he wished he could trust people more, but betrayal after betrayal in his early youth left him disillusioned. Thank Kami he had been able to trust Lord Kamei Ishida as his chief of staff, this really took a lot of the workload of him. With Kamei dealing with the bureaucrats around the regions and the capital, and was able to decide which matters required his personal attention. He shuddered at the prospect of also having to do his workload as well. He sold his pen. Was he becoming paranoid? He did use the Hattori Ninja clan as his personal assassins, thanks to Hanzo they all swore loyalty to him, and in the west they take loyalty very seriously, more so than in the east. While well, he didn't have to assassinate anyone yet, he felt if any trouble occurred, whether internally or externally, he had a force that could deal with the problem. The Hattori clan were the traditional ninja, and showed Naruto how much the eastern shinobi had now lost the original meaning of what it was to be one. They were killers, plain and simple. They never used fancy jutsu or weapons, just dark clothes and simple tools to carry out their assignments. Thinking about it, it was scary to think that even the most powerful of warriors was as vulnerable as a child when asleep. And how well the Hattori clan carried out their assignments only made him more thankful for their loyalty. He also created his own secret police, the Aihei, the Sentinels. These men, under Lord Kazuma, were essentially his eyes and ears around the empire, finding out plots and events that if left unchecked, could hold major problems in the future. Using ancient techniques only known to their group, they were able to bend time and space to essentially go invisible, become invulnerable to damage, and even teleport over long distances. He met this force shortly before becoming emperor. They were looking to put their abilities to the use of someone worthy of them. The agreement between them was simple, they would serve him loyally, if he would not try to find out the secrets of their techniques. Naruto didn't see the problem in this, after all everyone had secrets that they guarded jealously, and accepted the terms. He hasn't regretted it since. His mind wandered back to the east, ever since Shuri informed him of the situation, he began to wonder if he should do something. Of course there was no reason for the empire to go to war, as they never had any relations in the east at all. At the same time, the full fire country could easily disrupt the balance of power between the shinobi forces. What if they decide to Tsuna of Miss Snacks? Kayubi taught him that the best way to keep your enemies under control, is to have them fight amongst themselves, weakening each other in the process. If Fire Country and Kanoha were to fall, what was to say this new alliance would be bold enough to actually challenge the empire? Perhaps for this it could be a good reason to aid Fire Country, just so they could keep tearing at each other's throats, and not bother with the empire, they would have good reason too and they found out his identity. I would want to have his head solely for being the son of the Yellow Flash, Minato Namakis. Also, Arachimaru wouldn't have forgotten about their past bouts, and so would most probably want to strike first at him before he could do the same. Come to think of it, he also had a score to settle against Arachimaru. He was the one who essentially caused his grief of being banished by going for Sasuke, but also caused the death of the third Hokage, the only person Naruto truly trusted. But that was a personal vendetta, just like Kanoha's. He wouldn't bring the Empire into war so soon after its founding. Several knocks on the brought Naruto out of his thoughts. Turning to see who was coming in, he saw Lord Kamei standing tall at the door. Your Imperial Majesty, the cabinet meeting will be starting in a few minutes. Kami, he was so wound up in his thoughts, he forgot about the cabinet meeting today. He would have to finish the paperwork later, he had other things on his mind at the moment. Thank you Kamei, he replied as he stood up from his desk. After the meeting, could you call Lord Kazuma to my office, I need to speak with him on a matter referring to the situation in the east. Lord Kamei knew which matter he was talking about, as he was there when Jiraiya made his appearance. Are you seriously thinking on getting involved? He wasn't jumping to conclusions, but by needing Kazuma meant he needed information, and that was usually not in the good sense. Naruto shook his head. Still thinking about it, he muttered, however I do need to know what their plans are, after they deal with Konoha and Fire Country. Okay, so he was being paranoid, but he was not going to let his hard work be ruined by the Eastern Shinobi, no way in hell. It's been several days since they departed from Konoha. The squads sent by Tsunade were, at this moment traveling through bird country, crossing through the neutral countries to get to their destination, the Western Empire. 
It was a delightful feeling to know that not all the lesser countries had not joined the war as enemies. Kanoha got quite hopeful when they saw that they didn't join the Northern Alliance. When they sent delegates however, they too were turned down for aid. They simply wanted nothing to do with the war. Many in the squad, mainly Sakura and Hinata, were wondering what type of person the Emperor is. They all heard rumors of him being the same age as them, and rumors on his rise to power, but they wanted to see this Emperor for themselves. This left them to wonder if he was an arrogant man, or was he an idealist. Very few words had actually been spoken as since they left Kanoha, as all were pondering on the mission at hand. They felt a heavy burden on their shoulders. If they didn't gain the Emperor's aid, Kanoha would surely fall. Everyone in the squad knew of Naruto's secret of being the vessel of Kayubi, thanks to Tsunade, in a naive attempt to calm down the situation, informed them all of his burden. Most of their reactions were not good ones. Kiba saw Naruto as the Kayubi incarnate, adopting the view of his mother, Soon, who hated Naruto for far deeper reasons as well. Soon was a good friend to Kashina, and blamed Naruto for her death. She never accepted him as her son, only claiming that he was now possessed by the demon. Needless to say Kiba would kill Naruto if he ever saw him again, feeling deceived by the blonde. Sakura saw Naruto as a threat that needed to be eliminated for the safety of the world. When Naruto brought back Sasuke in his beaten state, Sakura believed it was unnecessary force needed to bring him back. Needlessly to say, little friendship she had with him, especially using that accursed power. Now, while she didn't see him as the Kayubi himself, she saw him as an unstable threat that needed to be eliminated. Shino's view was unknown, but most reckoned he didn't trust the blonde anymore. Then again he never got to know him. His bugs always seemed to warn him about Naruto when he was close by. Now he knew the reason for this uneasy feeling. While he had nothing against Naruto, his orders on the banishment were clear. If he ever returned, he was to be eliminated. Hinata however still loved Naruto. She secretly held the belief that he would return for to Kanoha for her. But now she was to be put in an arranged marriage with the son of a noble, increasing the clan's prestige. Even now they saw her as a weakling, and they showed it by making Hanabi heir to the clan. But that wasn't the blow that made her now hate her own family. Now she had to rely on Kurenai for support, for even her friends showed none. After a few hours of silence, Kiba decided to break the silence. So Hinata Hinata looked at Kiba, when this mission is over, do you want to go on a date? He asked, more like pleaded with Hinata. She shook her head. Sorry Kiba, but no thanks. At this Kiba looked very angry, he knew the reason for this. Why do you still hold feels for Naruto? He yelled in anger, causing Hinata to flinch at the tone. I don't understand you Hinata. He is the Kayubi for Kami's sake. Why do you hold feelings for that demon? Kiba, stop it. Kurenai spoke with a bitter voice, she couldn't believe that Kiba could be so blind. Kiba luckily settled down, but still looked quite irritated. But Sakura started up next, trying to make Hinata see reason. You need to let go of the past Hinata Sakura said in a smooth and gentle tone, he won't come back to Kanoha, he's not welcome there anymore. Hinata suddenly got bold and looked at both Sakura and Kiba in fury. The only reason he is no longer welcome is because you all betrayed him, some friends you all are. At that everyone visibly flinched at what she said. She was right, they did what Kakashi said was worse than trash, they abandoned a comrade. Before Kiba could retort Kakashi jumped in. Settle down all of you, he agreed with Hinata a lot, and soon after Naruto left the village he realized his own mistakes. The main one was that he left Naruto alone in his time of need, just like everyone else. Only Hinata now had the right to call him a friend, because they were not for what they did. He hoped that he could see Naruto again and apologize for his actions, but the chances of that was slim to none. They all stopped talking when they reached what would be the border, which divided both east and west. This would be the first time that Kanohan Inn had traveled to the western side of the continent, and it was for a mission of great importance. Right, I do believe this cabinet meeting is now in session. Asked Naruto as he sat down in his chair at the head of a large rectangular table. Around this table were some of the most important men and women in the empire. Of course you had the emperor, at his right was his chief of staff. To his left was the chancellor, who ministered the empire's finances. Down the table were the ministers of the various departments set up to minister the areas of their selected fields. These ranged from agriculture, to research and development, to culture and education. Also in the group were the representatives of the three houses. Behind him were Kaiubi, and the members of Naruto's advisory council, five members wearing purple robes and headwear, who helped to give the emperor a range of opinions when he asked for it. Flanking the room was the Praetorian Guard, all twelve of them. Some of the more notable members of the cabinet included the Minister of Defense, Old Man Yashimoto Nisaki, who is essential the head of the army after the Emperor himself. Dubbed the Old Warhawk, Naruto found his style very similar to that of Danzo back in Kanoha. While he always believed that might was right, he was loyal to his cause. In many cases he looked like him. He had an eye bandaged over and his left arm is missing. This ideology, compared to Naruto's negotiation first strategy, often came to disagreements, especially when dealing the Siren Kingdom. But it is when war is the agenda for both that he considers him a valuable ally. He was a natural leader of men in times of war, and was an innovative general who liked to use new technologies to his advantage over his enemies. 
When Naruto and Yashimoto faced each other for the first time, Naruto was close to suffering a catastrophic defeat. It was only thanks to Kayubi that he managed to gain a small victory over the old man. Time and again they fought, until, at the end of Naruto's crusade, Yashimoto swore loyalty to him, impressed at the boy's fighting spirit. Needless to say he has been one of Naruto's strongest supporters, despite their differences. Another notable minister is the Justice Minister Kisu Chosuke. Being a common-born young man, he was brought into his position by his great understanding of law. Most of this knowledge came from the fact that he was completely a self-taught man. Well because he was of common birth, the nobles looked down on him, they dare not speak out against him due to his position. Naruto was impressed of Chosuke's track record when nominated by several influential people who had relied on his services beforehand. He had an influential role in writing the new constitution for the empire, which granted Naruto his autocratic powers, and was the one who interpreted the law on the emperor's behalf. He wore formal attire similar to that of a daimyo, wearing a loose grey coat with long sleeves, and wearing a cone-shaped black headwear. Finally, there was the minister of the established religions, his name is Keito Kiyomasa. He was a cheery old monk with a bald hat from the southern provinces, and during the wars before Naruto appeared, he spent most of his time trying to help the people in his province. Due to his kind nature he was very popular, so popular that the warlords dared not try to remove him in case of a severe backlash. When Naruto appeared in the area, he discovered this mink at work, helping those less fortunate. Both he and Naruto quickly got on due to their visions of peace. When the blonde became emperor after finally unifying the lands, he found that there was much religious discrimination happening all over the empire. This was due both to the rising popularity of Buddhism, and the religion of Christianity brought by trade. In response, he appointed Keito Kiyomasa as the appropriate minister, thanks to his light-hearted nature, to help sort out the religious tensions within the empire. As such for one of his religion, he wore the orange robes of Buddhism, but also wore over them another long sleeve robe that was had a red sash wrapped around his waist. Right then, what is the first order of business? Asked the young emperor, interlocking his fingers as he placed them on the table before him, and setting the start of a cabinet meeting. The imperial majesty the chancellor began, the first order of business is the economic stability of the southern provinces, in the southern region of the empire, he handed the teen emperor a piece of paper containing the details of the situation from his file. Naruto sighed in irritation as he looked at the report. It was the southern region that suffered the worst in the war. What brought it down to near poverty was by the act of the despotic daimyo, which had a firm grip over most of the region. When he saw he was losing the war, he ordered his men to impose scorched earth on the land. Farms, woodland, homes, buildings and livestock were all but destroyed. While Naruto won against his soon after, the damage was done, and it was at the expense of the population that Naruto gained his victory. Knowing it was primarily his fault for the situation they now endured, he aimed to restore the land to its original beauty. Furthermore, restoring the southern lands, which was primarily open plan, could mean that large farms could be built to benefit the whole empire. The poor souls, it seems that the evil that plagued them for so long, still bears its curse upon them, Kato spoke in a calm yet wise tone. He personally did not blame Naruto for what happened in the south. He knew that eventually the daimyo would cause great misery, even if Naruto didn't appear. Upon seeing what the tyrant did firsthand he knew that after the southern province was finally restored, the people would flourish under the empire. It is a serious situation still I'm afraid the chancellor continued while shuffling the papers in front of him. While the other regions, particularly the west and east are seeing a significant increase in trade, commerce, and agricultural expansion, the provinces that make up the southern region have made only diminutive gains. The Minister of Commerce stated his peace, indeed commerce has had a significant boost in the central, western and eastern regions of the empire. People are now starting to become affluent enough to start their own businesses. Trade guilds have been working with the commerce in the west, making that region even more prosperous than before. Agricultural goods have also seen an increase in all the other regions, many farmers now have enough spare produce to be able to sell far more on the markets. Furthermore, the new tools developed by the research guilds, such as using water power with watermills for the irrigation of the land to help with the regrowth of crops, also with other tools invented, would easily bring a greater amount of crops for the future, the Minister of Agriculture put in. As such, people are not feeling the strain of food supplies like it was when this empire was first founded. It is clear that more investment is going to be needed in order to attempt to re-establish the southern region to its former state. The rural landscape, if restored, could provide us with the agricultural farms needed to put the final strain of food supplies to rest. Also, we would have enough room to be able to construct any other vital storages needed for the empire. While it proves to be an annoyance now, I know that bringing back the southern provinces will be a benefit to the whole of this empire. As with the new inventions for agriculture, the amount produced would be astronomical, Naruto concluded. Many of the ministers nodded their heads in agreement, like the northern province it was proving to be a pain. But in the long term, it would provide essential materials to bring the empire to splendor. However, the chancellor looked quite uncomfortable at the young emperor's conclusion. That's the problem your imperial majesty, Naruto turned to give him a questioning look. 
If we are to give any more investment to the southern region, due to our current economic state, it would mean that we would have to cut the investment of the other regions. We are at the limits to our current budget capacity with our reconstruction program for the provinces in question. Naruto sighed again, this time in annoyance. If he was to cut the budget to the other areas, it could stun the growth. On the other hand, the current budget for the southern province was not doing enough, and at it rate, it could drain much needed recourses to the empire. He could hear the advisors behind him giving him the pros and cons of both decisions. He had to come to a decision. Very well, have the budget and investment for the other regions cut to help support the supplies needed to restore the southern provinces. Also, have the program look at to see if any alterations can be done to improve what we can get out of the budget. I want more emphasis on buildings and agriculture. Let's see if we can restore the infrastructure first and foremost. Very well your imperial majesty, the chancellor gave in, reshuffling his papers once more. At this Kyubi smiled, it seems Naruto learned a lot about taking risks. He could understand his determination to bring back the southern lands, as he felt it was his fault they were in their current state. What he hoped was that they boy didn't let that one goal overshadow all the others. Be careful Naruto that your determination does not become an obsession Naruto, Kyubi spoke in a hushed tone so only Naruto could hear. The teenage emperor nodded in recognition of his friend's worry. He was determined to get the southern lands back on course, but he would always make sure to see the bigger picture. Are you sure this is wise your imperial majesty? Asked one of his advisors. I am looking at the long term, the southern provinces would reap great rewards if it able to flourish like the others, was his reply. Right, any other business? He asked, opening the floor to the cabinet. Your imperial majesty, the emperor turned to the minister of research and development. He was working in close relations to the research guilds that were located within the central region of the empire. We have discovered a new invention, brought forward by the guilds interested in protecting the empire, which could prove useful in the future. He handed the boy the paper, which showed the invention and the details of what it was. Then the minister reached down next to his chair and brought up a jar with what looked to be a black powder, onto the table. The members of the cabinet all began to eye the object with interest. They call this gunpowder, and it has quite a range of uses. When ignited, it spontaneously combusts. As shown on the paper, if used within a tube and one end is sealed, it can hurl a projectiles, depending on the size of the tube and projectile over distances for superior than that used with the torsion in a bow. At this the cabinet began to buzz at this information. The old warhawk smiled at the prospect of this new weapon, even the Kyubi raised an eyebrow at this. That's not all, it can also be used as an explosive device. If packed into a tight hollow sphere, it can be thrown as an explosive device, the outburst of energy causing the shards of the sphere as shrapnel. Also, if you add metal pellets to the equation within the sphere, then you have something, which can take out large groups of infantry. Furthermore, if enough of this powder was massed, the power behind it would be greater than that of an explosive tag. At hearing this several ministers looked unnerved at the prospect of something more powerful than what was used for the past three centuries. However Yashimoto was close to foaming at the mouth, for now he had a new invention that would carve a path through the empire's enemies. Well then, may I ask when the armed forces received the formula to create this powder? Asked the minister of defense. Whenever his imperial majesty says the time was the minister of research's reply. All eyes turned to the young emperor. Naruto was wary of allowing the old warhawk a new weapon due to her radical nature. Being a man who believed might was right, that the end justified the means, the teenage emperor had to keep him on a leech, so to speak, to keep him in line. However, this new invention would be incredibly valuable, and he had to admit Yashimoto would use it to full effect. He noticed Kamei leaned towards him. We should not pass up such an opportune weapon that would give us an advantage such as this your majesty. Turning his eyes to his old comrade, he saw Kaiubi nod his head. I agree with his your imperial majesty, this would prove advantage against our enemies, I suggest we trust Lord Yashimoto with this new weapon, Naruto's advisory council informed him. After a few more seconds of pondering, he came to a decision. Very well. Lord Yashimoto, I'm entrusting this new powder to use it to the best of your military knowledge. I know that out of all of use, you would now how best to use this new invention for the benefit of the empire. The old man bowed his head to Naruto's decision. He was pleased that he was trusted enough to use this potentially dangerous powder. He was well aware how little Naruto trusted him due to their past, and especially some of the decisions he had made. Even after seeing the benefits of joining Naruto, and was rewarded with a position within the cabinet for his vast military skills, he still came into conflict with the Emperor on several occasions. Idealistic men usually do. Right, what else is there for this meeting? Naruto once again asked. Your Imperial Majesty, Naruto turned to the Minister of Culture, I take it there is still serious tensions with the Siren Kingdom to the north. Naruto however immediately knew what he was going to say. I know what you are going to say, you are not the first to bring this proposal to me, but the answer is still no. The minister looked downcast of the proposal being dropped, he however knew not to push an agenda when his majesty made his mind up beforehand. Your imperial majesty, have you decided yet what action is to be taken with the east? Kamei asked, seeing this important. Naruto sighed at this. 
he was still in conflict on what to do. Your Imperial Majesty, one of his advisors began, if this northern alliance was indeed to defeat Hai no Kuni, then the balance of power would shift dramatically. I don't think I need to inform your Imperial Majesty of what could be the consequences of this. Indeed, the balance of power in the east was what could directly affect the safety of the western empire. Chasukup began. The Fire Country and Kanoha were destroyed, then the northern alliance, led by this Sarachimaru, would the only dominant force in the east. This must be dealt with in some way as the empire could be in peril. With that in mind, Naruto remembered what Juriya said to him when he told him of the situation. Because you are better than them, better than me. You never once let your hatred rule your judgment. You never once left people alone when they were at their time of need. So show them you are better than them. Prove to them that you aren't what they think you are. Yuria soon left after his small confrontation with Kayubi, hoping to find more info in his spy network. He was not convinced however of the Sanin's intentions, so he ordered one of Kazuma's sentinels to keep an eye on him. Indeed Kayubi's voice brought Naruto out of his musings, while we won't gain anything of material value form help the land of fire, it would certainly keep the balance of power in line. As I have said before, the best way to weaken an enemy is with another in a power struggle. This time however Kamei interjected. I should not have to remind his imperial majesty of the state of our army at this moment in time however. Most of what actual force that is properly is in the northern region keeping the raids at bay. The rest of our army won't be ready till the next few months. At this Yashimoto replied. It is not you have it is how you use it. As our force currently stands we have three legions of the empire standing. All these have the unit strength of 100,000 men each. Two of these legions are in the northern region, as you said Lord Kami, but surely one legion would be enough for this. No, it won't Lord Yoshimoto at this everyone turned to the speaker who just joined the group. It was a man clad completely in a black robe complete with hood, but also a high collar black cape as well. I hey Lord Kazuma the young emperor spoke gently. The figure turned and bowed to him. Your imperial majesty, I had a feeling you would have wanted to find out our potential enemy strength, so I sent my sentinels to find out what we could be up against. He then turned to address the cabinet. The ninja of the eastern villages are all versatile in their fields. Numbers won't mean much if your opponent can negate this. The ninja of the east are a cross of tradition ninja and samurai. From reports I have received both Iwa and Kumo have army strength of 1000 well-trained ninja each. This number is increased when you take into account the ninjas from the sound village, which is roughly 600. This is increased further by the rogue ninja he managed to employ. This ninja force when combined is about 3000 in total. The daimyos of those countries also have armies of their own, which are at least double the numbers of ninja of their respected ninja villages. Kumo's daimyo is a military man, and thus out of all the rulers in the east, has the largest army. A force of roughly 5,000 men, but this is due to the conscription policy he uses. So while it's large, many of the men are untrained. Iwa on the other hand has a force of 2,000 men, but these men are properly equipped, and are given a great deal of training. These soldiers are the most dangerous out of the members of the Northern Alliance. If you include the smaller villages also allied to this alliance, with the varying amounts of men at their disposal, then the numbers are approximately 13,000 men on the side of the Northern Alliance. At this a minister jumped up from his seat. What? 13,000. Kazuma nodded. When are the next legions due to be ready? Asked another cabinet minister. Two imperial legions will be ready in about two to three months, and after that another three more will be ready in about six months time. Yashimoto informed them. Naruto decided to end it here. We shall wait until something critical happens, if we are lucky the eastern countries will stay in this standoff long enough for the other legions to get ready. Lord Yashimoto I want the 3rd Imperial Legion in reserve relocated to the eastern region. If we have to get involved I would prefer to be ready. At this Yashimoto bowed his head. Right then, is there anything else? He asked once more. This time no one said anything. Then I do believe that is the end of our meeting Naruto finished, and with that, the members of the cabinet began to disperse. As they walk out they bowed their heads to Naruto in respect to their emperor. Your Imperial Majesty, as Naruto sat up from his chair, he turned to see who was calling him. It was Yashimoto. I didn't want to bring this up in the meeting as it essentially strictly military business. We have a few new weapon designs that have been put to the test. I was wondering if your Majesty was willing to see these new weapons in action later on this week. Naruto gave a small smile. But pleasure Lord Yashimoto, with our current situation, we are going to need all the technological advantage we can get over our enemies. I would love to see these new weapons in action. At this Yashimoto bowed his head in thanks, before leaving to join the other ministers in their respected fields of work. The people left with Naruto was Kamei, Kayubi, Kazuma, the Praetorian Guard and his advisors. It seems that we may get involved after all then your Imperial Majesty Kamei noted, seeing the way the events were turning. Your Imperial Majesty, one of the advisors quipped, would it be best to inform the countries between us and the eastern countries of us, possibly moving through them. If we don't it could prove to hinder us diplomatically in the future. Naruto shook his head at this. No, I would like for this to as quiet as possible. 
The countries west of Earth have joined the alliance, and so are effectively right on our borders. If Rajmer got wind of our troop movements through those countries, he would get suspicious. For now I would prefer to keep these troop movements strictly confidential. Lord Kazume, have your sentinels keep a close eye on the Northern Alliance. If they so much as relocate their forces, I want to know. Kazuma bowed his head to His Majesty's orders, before disappearing in a puff of black smoke. Kayubi gave a sigh. To think all this commotion because of what that old Sanin told you, then again it was beautiful to see his expression once he saw me. At this Lerido gave a chuckle at the memory. Flashback, Furious stood in complete fear as he gazed upon the nine tails in human form. This was the Kayubi. Looking to the right he could see Naruto was almost on the floor laughing, having to use the table to support himself. Behind him the two men who were with him, later found to be Kamei and Mitsuhide, gave smiles of amusement at the old man's predicament. They must really find his fear quite amusing as just to stand and watch him. Finally he managed to regain his voice to ask the question. Why are the Kayubi? He asked with a shaken voice. For a second he felt a violent and horrific killing intent, which forced him to his knees, a killing intent that could only have come from the demon lord himself. Said demon was smiling at him. I hope that answers your question, he turned to Naruto. You okay there, Naruto? He asked with an amused expression. Naruto finally stopped laughing, and managed to stand up straight, regaining his composure. I'm fine Kayubi, he replied, humor dancing in his voice. He turned to his godfather, who looked close of having a heart attack. Here was the demon that nearly destroyed Kanoha 19 years ago, and Naruto was standing next to him like he was an ordinary man. Naruto, you do know he is the Kayubi? He asked, trying to understand what was going on. Naruto smiling and nodded his head. H how did he get out? I thought that the seal was near unbreakable. Naruto's smile only white into the stab injury you made. Well I broke it, he said. Turning to Kayubi he spoke again, Kayubi, unlike popular belief, isn't the bloodthirsty monster that everyone portrays him as. He then turned to Juriya, he was the one who helped me unify this country. The Toad Sage finally calmed himself down. I hope you know what you're doing Naruto he spoke with a serious tone. I will trust your judgment. But unlike you, I have bad memories with him. The Kayubi signed, getting the Sanin's attention. You know if I had a choice in the matter, I would never have attacked Kanoha in the first place. Juriya raised a brow. I was under the control of a very old Achiha, who made me attack the village because of his own hatred for it. So I am not to fully blame for the attack, for I was merely the weapon used by the Ichiha. Yuri understood what he meant, for the kunai isn't to blame for the killing, but the person wielding it. Flashback end. Naruto was quite surprised that the two would get along so well. He believed that Juriya would have tried to fight the demon, but soon realized that would be stupid on his part. He sighed, still, in some ways Kanoha was his old home, even though it really didn't act like one. But then again he felt he was really doing this for the Empire's benefit of not getting drawn into a long-term war. Using Hai no Kuni as the land to face on would be much better than having to fight on the Empire's own soil. And there was Hinata, she would surely die if Kanoha fell. He admitted that he still held deep feelings for her, but how did she feel about him? He remembered the late Saratobi's speech about the will of fire, and in many ways he had to thank the old man for being the family he never had, the grandfather that always looked after him. In fact if he were still alive he would have gone and supported Kanoha straight away, because he was one of the few who treated him like a human, again like Hinata. He was brought out of his thoughts when heard a knock on the cabinet door. Turning, he could see Mitsuhide walking in and bowing to him waiting at the door. Pardon me your imperial majesty, but there is a lady waiting to see you in the guest lounge, he spoke. Naruto raised an eyebrow, who could it be? Did she say who her name was? The head servant looked deep in thought as he tried to remember her name. Upon seeing so many guests all the time it was hard to remember all their names. Then it suddenly came to him. Ah oh, yes now I remember. She said her name was Yuki Fujikas at this Naruto smiled, one of the few people outside the empire he could say truly was a close friend. He turned to the rest of the group that he was with. I will leave you now to your duties, as I have a lady to see to at this Kamei and his advisors gave bows before they left, while Kayubi just gave him a grin, before attending to his own business. The emperor then left to the guest lounge, his bodyguards in tow. The team from Kanoha stood in awe as they appeared in front of the gates to a large city in the empire. The walls stood tall, towering over them as they saw how high they were. They could see soldiers on the battlements, patrolling the city perimeters. It was ironic that it would be the first thing they found when they crossed the border to the west. Kakashi turned to the others. Okay, take of your headbands and take out your false identity cards, we must not tell them we are from Kanoha, or they could get the wrong idea. The other nodded, understanding the situation, and did as they were told. Kakashi even took of his face mask, which came to a shock at the others. Finally they saw his face. He turned to them. What? He asked. The others just shook it off, while put a simple headband on to cover his Sharingan eye. After getting ready, they started to walk down to the main gate. Upon arriving they were stopped by a group of guards standing on duty. The team's surprise, they were samurai, and well trained at the stances they took. 
This easily showed them that in this part of the continent, being a samurai was highly common, unlike in the east, where they were merely private retainers. Halt. State your business here. The guard who spoke was easily seen as a veteran due to his age. The others looked only to be in their late twenties and thirties, as such the old one must have been the leader. Kakashi took the lead. Hello there, we're a group of tourists from the east, the Jonin replied, we came to see the empire sites, as they were told to be quite exquisite at this, the guard merely laughed. Well I have to say we get a lot of tourists in the empire ever since it was officially founded. Ever since the war ended, things have been a lot more quiet than they were before the emperor liberated us from the chaos, he explained. If I had to recommend a site, I would say you would want to go down to the Jai Shang province in the northwest, and visit the dragon temple. If you're lucky, you may get to see a real, live dragon. At this the Kanohanin looked shocked. A real dragon. The guard laughed again as he saw the looks of disbelief on their faces. Yes, a real dragon. That's why it has been titled, The Land of Dragons because of that reason. Nearest location is Dragon's Peak, where they reside. It is said, that he who controls the temple, controls the dragons. Well if it is true then the emperor has some mighty allies under his command. Sakura saw the perfect chance to ask some questions about the emperor. Speaking of the emperor, what is he like? She asked, trying making herself sound as excited as possible. I have to say he is by far the best ruler ever to come across the western continent. We are truly blessed by Kami, the guard started. He loves his people dearly, and tries not to resort to force, only seeing it as a last resort. He is a truly a charismatic individual. In fact, half of the wars he fought were in fact with words, and not swords. Either way, he won them all. But he is not the type of person you want to cross if you anger him, which would be a feat all on its own, because if you do then his vengeance is swift. Luckily that rarely happens. He is only 19 years old, and yet he manages to rule the empire with great wisdom. Mind you, I think his companion has something to do with that. Kiba raised a brow. Companion. He asked intrigued that there may in fact be a hidden power behind the throne. Yes, when his imperial majesty first appeared, he was accompanied by this strange character in red, a very mysterious person. He looked human, but I could swear on my life that he wasn't what he viewed himself to be. I can remember watching him fight during the wars. He would take countless warriors on single-handedly, and would dispatch them all with ease. I tell you no he is a force to be reckoned with, and not one to have as an enemy. But the emperor seems to trust him a lot, being one of his personal advisors and all. Will we be able to see him? Hinata spoke, trying her best not to stutter. Well he does hold public speeches once a month, talking about the current events that are usually important. In fact the speech that was on some days ago was the speech of the anniversary of the empire's unification. I have to stress he is a very good public speaker, able to capture the crowd's attention with just his words. But if one to try and see him on a one-to-one, -one, I think that wouldn't happen. Kakashi frowned slightly, it would be difficult to get an audience with the emperor if this was the case. You know where we can get a map of the empire, so we know where we are going. At this a younger guard reached into his pocket, and pulled out a folded map, which he gave to Kakashi. He thanked him for the item. Now before I can let you in, can we see some ID? The team pulled out their fake ID cards and showed them to the guards. Security's tight Kiba commented, before being silenced by a glare from Kurunai. The old man sighed. Yes it has to be he said, gathering their attention, with that war that's going on in the east, these are feared that it could spill into the west. The emperor really doesn't want to get involved in this war for some reason. Maybe it's because it's because he wants to protect his people from a war that is not ours to fight. Then again it could easily spill over to this side of the continent. Suddenly for the team, it felt that getting the emperor to join forces with Kanoha had just gotten a lot harder. Finally, the gates opened, and they were led into the city. But with all this happening, one of them noticed that not far from their current position, they were being watched by a black robbed headed figure, who had in fact watched them since they crossed the border into the empire. Well it seems you have been busy in your court by the sounds of this, Naruto quipped as he listened to what had been going on in spring country. Yuki, also known as Koyuki Kazuhana, merely laughed in response. They can be bothersome at times, being a daimyo is not easy I have to say, with all the work that comes with it, she replied before finishing her red wine. How do you cope with it? Essentially I just get it over with. Then again I don't delegate much, so I make near enough all the decisions. Call me paranoid, it's just I don't want things to go wrong in someone else's hands. How do you get so much time if you work so much ah I get it, you simply put it off. A ruler shouldn't do that she scolded playfully, waging her finger at the same time. Naruto merely smiled at Yuki as he poured her another drink of red wine. After the mission to spring country, the two had remained good friends. Yuki went as far as to cut all ties with Kanoha when Naruto got banished, causing a huge blow for the village. When she found out Naruto became the western emperor, in which she was the first to find out his identity, she visited him regularly when she had some free time of being the daimyo. She was one of the few people outside the empire he could fully trust with his feelings, and had his complete trust. You know I still cannot believe you want to star in Jiryuzichu Ichi movie, at this Yuki laughed. Well I thought it would be an interesting experience, Naruto smiled as he took a sip of his wine. 
You don't know how much of an experience you are going to get Yuki-chan, she blushed at the comment made by the blonde. Naruto's smile only got bigger as he saw the look on her face. A knock on the door unexpectedly interrupted the two. Naruto turned his head to the door. Come in. He shouted, and with that silent creak the door opened, revealing Kazuma walking through the door. Naruto's face suddenly turned serious. What is it Lord Kazuma? He asked. The figure looked to do a sign as he explained what he had found. Your Majesty, one of my sentinels, discovered a group of Kanoha ninja posing as tourists that have just entered the city of Hyogo in the Kinki province, the eastern region. At this Yuki gasped as she put a hand to her mouth. Naruto's eyes widened in shock, then narrowed in anger. Show me, he ordered, he voiced barely able to contain his fury. The leader of the sentinels extended his hand, and a large blue sphere appeared in front of him. In the sphere it showed the faces of the group who entered his lands uninvited. Naruto instantly knew who they were, and his anger increased tenfold. How dare they just walk into his realm like this uninvited. Especially them. Bring them here, I want to ask them personally what the hell they are doing here in my lands. The team from Kano had tried very hard to navigate through the busy streets. Thanks to the map the guard gave them, they would be able to find a hotel in which they could stay for the night, as well as tourist information to get another map, so they can travel to the capital, and try to seek an audience with the emperor. As they walked past, they saw that much of this place wasn't much different from Kanoha, as they saw similar shops and people wearing similar clothing. What they did find different though was from time to time, they would pass a two-squad patrol that consisted of black-armored samurai. Takashi had to admit, the only reason why the samurai had come close to dying in the east, was because of a quick change, and that change can easily have an opposite if another shinobi war took place. Akamaru, Kiba's partner, didn't like the crowded streets, which could be easily told by his whining. Must because of the small room available. Kiba did his best to comfort his canine companion. So Kakashi do you know where we are going? Kurunai asked. Kakashi turned his head to face her. Yes, all we need to do is to turn right at the next corner, then we will be at our destination, the Jonin replied. Kurunai suddenly felt fast movement, and quickly spun around, gathering the other member's attention. What's wrong sensei? Sakura asked. She got her answer when she saw a group of about 10 samurai running towards them. Stop right there. One of them yelled. The Kanoha team got into a defensive stance. All around them the civilians tried to get away from the group, making a large circle around them. The samurai encircled the group, spears drawn and pointing towards them. Kiba growled, and was about to charge, but a hand from Sakura stopped him. No, if you attack, it could make matters worse she pleaded. Kiba understood, and decided not to attack. They were here for an alliance, not to make war. You will come with us. Kanoha ninja the team froze. They had been caught. Before anything else happened a black hole appeared in the ground near the samurai. A hooded robed figure appeared from it. The sight of him caused the crowd to muttering to one another. It's one of the sentinels. The emperor's eyes and ears. What is one of them doing here? All the muttering stopped when they felt a wave of demonic killing intent. But to Kanohe it felt all too familiar, especially to Kakashi. No, it couldn't be. They got their answer from a loud demonic roar, and suddenly a giant red fox of about 8 feet crashed to the ground, landing next to the seeker. It had 9 tails. The ninja from Kanoha were now paralyzed in fright at the sight of an ancient adversary. Kayubi Sakura muttered. How is this possible? The fox burst into flames, and as quickly as it appeared, it died down, revealing a tall red-haired man in a red suit. Kayubi Sama. One of the samurai yelled, standing at attention. The other followed his example. The fox turned man gazed upon the ninja, and sneered with disgust. Just like Kano had to just walk into places uninvited, as if they owned the place though his voice was soft, his tone was harsh. Kiba was the first to recover, and retorted. What's it to you demon? Or should I say Naruto? At the crowd started to murmur, what is he talking about? Kayubi growled in annoyance. This boy truly was a fool. Let me tell you this once, fool. Naruto and I are completely separate in titles. Don't get the jailer mixed up with the prisoner. Kiba was in shock. Naruto wasn't the Kayubi. The demon signed in what seemed to be boredom. At any rate, his imperial majesty has asked me to bring you to him alive and in one piece. Trust me if you ordered it, I would kill you all in a heartbeat. The team looked hopeful, the emperor wanted to see them. But they did know however it was all for the wrong reasons. Kayubi turned to the sentinel standing next to him. Could you open us a portal to the palace? He asked. The seeker complied by summoning a large rift for them to travel through. Kakashi nodded to his team, they would go quietly. They were after all, uninvited guests in another land. Without any force they walked through the portal, the Kayubi in tow. They could only stare in awe at the sight they gazed upon. The architecture of the palace was nothing they ever saw before. It truly was fit for the emperor. The building easily overshadowed nearly ever other in the whole city it was that large. Kayubi turned to the ninjas. I don't know what your purpose is for coming here, but I should warn you know that his majesty is not happy with your little infiltration of his lands, he spoke with a serious tone. The large gates in front of them opened, allowing them entry into the palace. Come he ordered, and they all obeyed. They had to if they wanted to see the emperor. 
Behind them were ten samurai who were similar to the ones encountered in the city, but wore a dark yellow amara instead of black. It seems they were here to help escort them to the emperor. They could tell they were not well trusted, for obvious reasons shown. As they walked through the grand halls, they noticed the amount of guards, which stood at attention through the palace. Unlike the town guards who wore black armor, these men were colored in what seemed to be a golden yellow dye. Considering this was the seat of power for the emperor, this amount of men stationed in the palace was only natural to protect him, and the difference in color clearly showed these men were in a different league. They also couldn't help but look at the decorated paintings of who they believed to be heroes and well-authoritative figures in the empire, one of which was in fact a Kayubi in human form. Hanada broke the silence. Um, Kayubi. The demon turned his head to see the Hayaga. Could I ask why someone such as yourself would serve the emperor? To his surprise her eyes held little fear, and could only chuckle in response. I have my reasons dear Hinata, which you will see soon enough. The ninja made their own conclusion, whoever was the emperor was powerful enough to gain a demon lord as his ally. They also knew that if they ever did go to war with the empire, they would easily lose. Finally they came to a pair of decorated doors, a guard on each side. Kayubi nodded to the guards, who saluted in response. His majesty is waiting inside Kayubi-sama. Kayubi nodded, and turned to the Kanoha sent team. I would advise you to watch your mouths the threat was more directed at Kiba and Sakura more than anyone else, much to their confusion. The doors were opened, and they slowly walked through. What they laid eyes upon was a grand hall, the walls a golden color and great design that was lost in the east. They could see many people in the hall, all stopping their conversations to see who was it that came into the hall of the emperor. From the clothes they wore they could tell they were important. They walked along a large red carpet, which traveled all the way to some steps. Beside each side of the sides was two large golden statues, one of a dragon, the other of a phoenix. On top of the steps was an elaborate throne of exalted design and architect, sat on the throne was arguably the most powerful man on the whole continent, the Emperor of the West. Flanking the Emperor were twelve large figures in ornate armor, wielding large halberds and standing at attention. Said Emperor looked angry with the party. But that wasn't what shocked them all to the core. The Kanbi Sakura muttered to herself, deep in distress on who sat on the seat of power. Even now Kanahagakur seems to scorn my existence, by sending you to my lands the figure spoke, his voice filled with venom. Kakashi finally managed to regain his voice, but still only able to mutter but a single word. Naruto. It seemed time just stood still, as the members of the Kanohan team gazed upon in shock, the Emperor of the Western Empire, Naruto Uzumaki Namikis. The same Naruto banished from their home seven years ago. And boy he looked as mad as hell, and by all rights he had good reason to. He was a team, sent by the place he despised with nearly his whole being, coming into his realm without his consent, and made up of some of the people he hated most in that place. Takashi truly was a hypocrite. He spoke about friendship, and those who broke the rules are trash, but those who abandon their comrade are worse than trash. He turned back on his own saying, leaving him alone to train his precious Ichiha. He couldn't stand this fool. He even turned his back on him when he brought the Ichiha back, which caused him to hate his former sensei even more. Sakura was just as bad, always calling him a baka, and never once showed any gratitude to saving her from Gar. Thinking about it, maybe he should have let his good friend kill her, since she was so pathetic. Looking at her now, he realized how much of a fool he had been to waste him time on this pink-haired banshee, when he could have spent it with the girl that truly mattered to him, Hinata Hayaga. Next to his former teammate was the idiot Kiba, always going into things head first. But looking back he saw he wasn't any better. But it angered him that this dog lover was one of the first to turn his back on him. For that, he would never forgive him. Kurenai he had real no problem with, but then again he never knew her. But he did know that every time she saw him, she would look down on him with disgust. She was like everyone else, blind and pathetic, hurting a child to cure her own problems. Shino was hard to tell, but he was sure that he was like all the others. Even when they were in the academy Shino would stay away from him, as if he was afraid. The last member was one he never though he would see again, Hinata. He could still remember the day she confessed her love for him, the day he had to leave. Out of everyone there, she was the only one who stayed with him. He couldn't believe himself being so blind not to see the signs she loved him, begin so engrossed with Sakura. Now he regretted it. But looking into her eyes he found no hate, maybe there was a chance to bridge the new divide made by the long, seven-year absence. However, he had other matters that needed his attention, such as the reason why they were here in first place. Naruto's eyes gazed around the hall. He could hear the whispers of shock and astoundment of this group, from Konoha, who were from Fire Country, who had the audacity to try and sneak into this empire, our empire, his empire. He could hear the glares some were giving the group as they stood in the center of the hall, much like what the villages of Kanahagakur would give him. How fitting. He could see all the remaining nobles of the land. Those few who actually joined him rather than falling in a pathetic attempt to stop his ambition. Now they were just essentially a group of yes-men, all trying to remain on his good side to save their own skin, and their own self-interests. He could see the members of the House of Representatives and of the Senate. 
he knew that those elected by the common masses, as well as those of specialist fields, would not want to go to yet another war without good reason. He also knew that the speakers of those houses would be watching intently on any decision he made. While he had absolute power politically, he knew that the true power lied with the people. It was important to keep them on board regardless of the decision. He could also see his cabinet amongst those with the masses in the hall. Once they knew who this group was, they all fall amongst the members of this hall, would be most interested in his reaction, and how he dealt with the situation. Most of all he could see the old Warhawk's eyes bear the sight intently. It seems that Yoshimoto was wanting to see if he would be soft on these intruders. How amusing. Either way, this ninja team was trespassing on foreign soil without his permission, and he would make them understand that there are consequences. Then again the fear of the consequence would be greater than the actual act, if done correctly. The Kanoha team on their half were scared, very scared. They could see the hatred that welled the blonde's blue orbs, but what scared them more is that he could easily get his revenge on Kanoha, and they wouldn't be able to stop him. Looking to their side they could see the Kaiubi in human form grinning like a madman. But what scared them even more was all the delegates from around the empire, members of the three branches of the empire's government, give cold glares at the fact they had the audacity to come to this place, now with hindsight, knowing they would be unwelcome. They could hear to coarse whispers about them, and some were pretty damn insulting. Kayubi on his part was obviously enjoying their discomfort, a discomfort that they had made themselves. Hyakunoha was about to find out, firsthand, at how big a mistake they had made. After all, all actions have a consequence. The Kanohan team were obviously disheartened at the face of seeing their biggest mistake come and hit them back on the head, but they had to stay focused, maybe there was a chance of him helping Kanoha, though it would most likely be at a heavy price. Snapping out of his stupor, Kakashi quickly went into a kneeling position, a sign of respect for one's great superiors. The others quickly followed his example. How it must have felt for them to face their mistakes, by submitting to the one you scored your whole life. Your Imperial Majesty Kakashi spoke, trying to sound as calm as possible. Looking back he now wished he had been there for the boy in his most needed moment, since he wouldn't be in this situation now. How he wished he listened to his own words, now he had to face his old student. It's true what they say, the past always catches up with you. Allow me to apologize for our rude intrusion on your lands, and allow me to explain why we have come here seeking your counsel. Kakashi hoped that Naruto would let him explain the reason for coming into his realm. The voices of those watching once again began to start up again, this time the tone more inquisitive than insulting. Looking up, he could see the blonde gaze into him, searching for any hidden secrets. It was there he realized that standing there wasn't his former student, but now someone who was a shrewd and powerful ruler of the most powerful nation on the elemental continent. The blonde stood up from his throne and walked slowly down the steps towards the team. This action caused the whispers around them to cease. I would advise you to speak quickly the cold tone of his voice was enough to make Kakashi and the others flinch. Well, it was now or never. At this moment our village is beset by three enemies. Kumo, Odo, and Iwa. Your Imperial Majesty, if this war continues in the flow it is currently going, then Kanoha will surely fall. Not only that, Your Imperial Majesty, but our land of H no Kuni, is beset by the lands of sound, earth and lightning, with the support of several other countries. If this war was to escalate into complete conflict, we will not survive. Great Sire, we deeply ask of your aid in this war. If you were to join us as an ally in this war, not only will we stand a good chance of survival, but also maybe the war will end without any more blood being spilt. Your Imperial Majesty, I beseech you to aid Yuz in our time of need. I am sure that the Council, and the Daimyo, will pay any price you wish to send, so please Emperor of the West, help us. At the end Kakashi was practically begging, his voice easily told Naruto of the plea to send help to a losing contestant in a war. How he hated to see a grown man grovel. Tell me Kakashi had the Jonin looked up to see Naruto hard eyes staring at him, what could I possibly gain in the long term, that would prove to be beneficial to my empire? Though it was a clear and simple question, the answer eluded Kakashi. Another voice spoke up for his defense. Sire, I am sure that an alliance between both your empire and our country would greatly improve the ways of life for both countries, and I am also sure that both our realms would learn greatly from one another, for I am sure that in the long term, an alliance between our nations would allow both to prosper. Kakashi silently thanked Kurenai for the response, but soon felt sorry for her when he saw Naruto turn his hard gaze towards her direction. Is that so Kurenai Yuhi? He asked her. He didn't wait for a response as he quickly turned around and walked back up to his throne. You know what I see Kakashi? He asked, as he sat back down, his voice betraying no emotion. I see a group of pathetic ninja, from a village that dug itself its own grave. At this the team looked at the young emperor in shock, but he wasn't finished. I see a group of ninja who want me to waste my time, resources, and manpower on a war that doesn't concern me in any way. I see a group of ninja who want me to get involved with a village that scorned my very existence from the day I was born into this world. I see a group of ninja who want me to get involved with a village that betrayed and banished me for doing my duty. The last part was said with such anger even the Kaiubi himself flinched from the anger Naruto was releasing. 
He knew Naruto would never forgive Konoha, and he knew of the anger that burned inside the boy, being kept inside for so long, it was all getting released now. I can name only one person who didn't turn her back on me. I can name only one person who didn't leave me when I needed my friends the most. I can name only one person who never saw me for what I held inside. The rest of you left me when I needed you at my most venerable point. I can say only one person in your group was that only person in the whole village who treated me as a human being. Naruto left time for his words to sink in, letting them know how he felt when they turned against him. Then he decided to drop the bombshell. I will not give Kanoha aid in any way shape or form. I will let you shrivel in the mess that you created. I will not save you from your own destruction. The Kanohan team looked horrified at what Naruto said, he wouldn't help them. He actually sounded like he wanted them to fall to ruin. But he wasn't done yet. As for your trespassing of my domain, you will all be sent to the palace dungeons for the night. Tomorrow you will be escorted by my men to the borders to return to your village for your defiance. Should I find that you have entered my lands again, you will not return to your home alive. Take them away from my sight. The ten samurai that followed them from the entrance, then grabbed each of the team, and took them down to the dungeons below. No one put up a fight, too mortified at what Naruto had said to him or her. Not only would he not help them, but also he would kill them if they were found in his lands again. Sakura however managed to find her voice, and tried to call out to her former teammate, trying to make him see reason. But her words fell on deaf ears as he watched them be taken down to the cells. Not one person however saw the lone tear that slid down his cheek. Silence filled the hall after the doors slammed shut. The emperor gave a sigh, before sitting back down on his throne, the tear was allowed to freely drop down his chin before he wiped it away. Your imperial majesty, Naruto looked up to see who was addressing him, it was Kamei. The middle-aged man looked quite concerned. Is his imperial majesty alright? Naruto couldn't help but smile. I'm fine Lord Kamei he addressed his chief of staff. Thank you for your concern. I take it that your imperial majesty has not decided to get involved in this war. As I said Lord Kamei, I wouldn't waste the resources of the empire in a war that does not concern us. Until I see sufficient evidence that shows that we are in danger of being under threat, I will not take part in the war in the east. Before Kamei could reply however, another member of the imperial court involved himself. But your imperial majesty, after the land of fire goes, there will be no sufficient power in this small eastern bloc to face this northern alliance, it was the speaker of the senate. He was a middle-aged man who actually quite wise, and for that, he was ideal to be the representative for them in his cabinet. If this alliance actually lasts long after Kanoha's demise, and with the land of fire subjugated, then there could be a chance they could perceive us as a threat and target us afterwards. Naruto smiled, good to see he had some intelligent men in court. Others on the other hand were shocked that one would go against the emperor's verdict. Speaker of the Senate, are you defying the will of the emperor not to involve ourselves in this war? The Lord Speaker of the Lords asked in a condescending tone. A part of Naruto hated that old man, simply because he was a pompous fool at times. However compared to the other nobles, he was by far more tolerable. He was a man who had great intellect, but his pride as a noble member was his vice. Luckily he was one of the few who were able to rein it in, as seen when he submitted himself to Naruto as his ruler. I am not going against the will of our emperor, Lord Speaker of the Lords was the old man's reply, what I am afraid of the Northern Alliance, upon seeing us as a united empire, will see us as a threat. It is not just whether or not we involve ourselves in this war, it is also the fact that this alliance, fearing our power, might want to strike first. Furthermore, if they see that a Kanahagikar team came from our lands, then their suspicion will increase. Your Imperial Majesty, I humbly request that we prepare ourselves for the worst. Naruto could see that many in the Grand Hall seemed to agree with him, seeing men from all three houses nodded their heads in agreement. Your request is noted Speaker of the Senate. He turned to the old Warhawk in his cabinet. Lord Yoshimoto at this said man stood at attention. Send word for the Second Imperial Legion to reorganize for a potential attack from the east. I'm sure all Shimazu of the First Imperial Legion will be able to cope with the Siren Empire. The combined might of the Second and Third Imperial Legions should be adequate to deal with any threat coming from the Northern Alliance. Yashimoto Nisaki bowed his head in acknowledgement. While I highly doubt they will attack us, due to the Alliance being merely one of convenience, it doesn't hurt to be prepared. At seeing the questioning looks of the court, Naruto though it best to explain. The lands of Earth and Lightning have historical grievances with the Land of Fire. Similarly the ninja villages of Kumo and Iowa have historical grievances with Kanoha. The smaller countries that have joined this alliance feel threatened by Hai no Kuni's former supremacy, and thus hope to disperse it, and gain some land in the process. Arachimaru, the leader of this alliance has used that to gain this force, so he can crush Kanoha, nothing more. After the land of fire has been subjugated, and Kanahagikar has been destroyed, I would be deeply surprised if the alliance lasted long after their objective has been fulfilled. At this the court began to understand the emperor's logic of not getting involved. After the defeat of Fire Country, when the alliance dispersed, the balance of power in the Eastern Bloc would revert to normal, only that there would be four great powers instead of five.
Still, the fact that afterwards each country would be on its own again, none of them would prove to be a sufficient threat to the empire. But, in the chance they were to attack the empire, however small, at least they would be prepared. After understanding the reason of not involving themselves, the court began to feel relaxed, and reverted to what they were doing before the little fiasco happened. Naruto stood on the edge of a large balcony in the imperial palace, thinking of the events that transpired today. He was shocked to see that even after all this time, Kanoha would think he would help them. The arrogance. He hated Kanoha with nearly his entire being. They had turned on him. Betrayed him. Used him for their own, selfish purposes, then just threw him away when he was no longer needed. How he hated them, he had no reason to help those that abandoned him after all this time. But, he also felt it was his duty to help Kanoha. After all, he promised long ago to protect it, and he never went back on his word, that was another promise he had made when he was a kid. How naive of him to think he could keep every promise he had made. This was a war that didn't involve him or his country, and so he chose to stay out of the war. Even looking at their faces brought back unwanted memories of his past treatment. Kiba humiliating him, Kakashi ignoring him, Sakura hurting him. Hinata confessing to him. That what hurt the most, knowing that Hinata was always there for him, if he had just talked to her and got to know her better, then maybe his days in Kanoha wouldn't have been as bad. But then, her father might not have approved of their relationship. He was after all a lowly orphan, a demon child, an abomination in their eyes. He knew he was an arrogant fool. He looked up as seeing the sun beginning to set. The day was near enough over, and tomorrow would start anew. Hopefully he would never see the ninja from the village hidden in the leaves ever again. He seemed troubled, a female voice brought him out of his thoughts. Turning around, he saw Yuki, Mitsuhai, and Kayubi standing near the entrance to the room he was dwelling in. I still don't know whether to stay ignorant or play the unsung hero. A part of me says not to help Kanoha for everything they did to me. But another part of me tells me to help them anyway he stated. Yuki frowned, even now she never liked how Kanoha treated him. Sure it was a good place to be in, but after finding out how they could treat a child, she was reluctant to go there again. Human nature was awful at times. Remember Naruto, all paths have their gains and consequences. While I do not like Kanoha, I hate Orochimaru even more. So if you do decide to go into war, then I will stay by your side Kayubi said. Naruto smiled. He could always relay on Kayubi when he needed support. Looking back, it was Kayubi that essentially helped him in every predicament he was in. He felt bad on relying on his friends so often, and a part of him wondered why he decided to stay with him after all this time. Thanks, you enjoyed that little show didn't you? Kayubi smiled his traditional cruel smile in return. It's not every day you see some of Kanoha's finest cower before someone who is superior to them. Their daimyo is good for that, but seeing them cower before a foreign lord is far more satisfying to watch. Naruto turned around again and gazed over the city in which he inhabited. He looked at all those walking in the streets. He watched as shops began to close, turning it in for the day, and relax for the night before work begins anew the next morning. He saw children with their parents, laughing and having fun, enjoying the tranquil life he had blessed them all with. He had worked so hard to bring peace to this side of the continent, to his empire, and was working to bring it to greatness, so everyone within would prosper. To see the other in such a state, I will only enter this war if I has a very good reason to the blonde said. Kayubi and Yuki looked slightly puzzled. He turned to face them. At this moment I have no real reason to go to war. This time I put my country before my heart. As he said that he however remembered something. His eyes widened in realizing what it was. Now he had a chance to find out something, which had bothered him ever since he left Kanoha seven years ago. He had to know. In a single motion he spun around and with pace, started walking past the three over inhabitants of the room and out through the door. This sudden move caught said inhabitants of guard. Where are you going Naruto? Kayubi asked. Yuki and Mitsuhide were thinking the same thing. The reply caused the former to smile, and the latter to wonder. There is a certain person I've been meaning to get reacquainted with for the past seven years. Mitsuhide. Your Imperial Majesty. The old servant asked, running out the room to catch up with the teenage emperor. There is someone I want you to fetch. It had been only several hours since they were thrown into the dark prisons under the palace. To the team from Kanoha however, it seemed like an eternity. An eternity for them to reflect on their past misgivings to their former comrade turned enemy turned emperor, and how it was their fault that they now laid in this predicament. Not a single word was spoken as none could get over the fact that Naruto had not only rejected their plea for help, but also threatened them with death, should he see them again. Sakura was hugging her knees, muttering unheard apologies to her former teammate, the teammate she betrayed. Kiba just sat quietly, looking lifeless as he stared at the wall. Kakashi had tears down his face, finally realizing how stupid he had been to abandon Naruto on so many occasions. Shino, like Kiba, just sat quietly on the ground, keeping himself to himself. Kurenai was trying desperately to comfort Hinata, who at this moment in time believed Naruto hated her after the way he was treated back in Kanoha. You know we are the reason why Naruto has turned out like this Kurenai spoke, finally breaking the silence. Kakashi turned his tearful gaze to her. But he is after all, Kanoha's most unpredictable ninja Kakashi did a haunting laugh at the comment. 
He isn't Kano has ninja anymore Kurenai he replied. And it's all Kano has fault on the whole. We left him. We abandoned him. The Jinjutsu mistress signed in displeasure. Mind you, only Naruto could perform a miracle like this. To unite a vast, war-torn land in such a short amount of time, and turn it into what possibly could be the most powerful country on the continent, if not the only empire on this continent. That truly is a great feat. She stated, impressed how Naruto had managed to make a powerful ruler. Thinking about it, he really would make a great hookage if he was given the chance. Not only that, he also has the Kayubi under his command, and the people themselves look ready to die for him if he asked. Loyalties like that is something we shouldn't take lightly Shino spoke, and both older ninja couldn't help but not in agreement. Suddenly they heard a roar in anger, and turned to see Kiba standing up and punched the wall, hard enough to cause his knuckles to bleed. Damn, I haven't felt this bad in all my life he growled out, I mean, I thought he was the Kayubi, that was what my mom said he was after the secret got out. But after seeing both of them at the same time, looking nothing like each other, acting nothing like each other. Damn he clasped to the ground. Some friend I was. And we made him like this Kiba Sakura managed to say, still upset by what had happened. It's all our fault. I used to blame him for bringing Sauce Kun back like he did, but now I realize he had no other choice. And I didn't see that because I was blinded by the fear of what he contained. Sakura seemed to be nearly crying rivers at the guilt she felt. Looking at her former teammate, hatred in his eyes, did she finally realize what she had done to him? Looking back to when they were together, she also realized how she never treated him with kindness. Now she wished that she could go back in time and be there for Naruto for all those years. Hinata didn't say anything in the conversation, as she was still trying to pull herself together after the incident with Naruto. She wished now that she had confessed to him much earlier, and cursed her shyness. She also wished that she went with Naruto, but she knew if she did that, then her father would not stand for it. She now believed that he hated her like all the rest. She was brought out of her thoughts by a comforting voice. Hey Hinata, she looked up to see Sakura smiling down at her. Don't be upset, I'm sure Naruto doesn't hate you. You are the only one who stayed by him remember? Hinata wiped her tearful eyes. He's got no reason to hate you. I'm sure the glare he gave was directed at us. Don't be so hard on yourself. In fact, I would say that he still cares deeply about you. Hinata smiled at Sakura's gentle words. She now felt reassured. Thanks Sakura. The pink-haired Nin smiled. But the conversation was interrupted by the dungeon doors opening with a loud noise. Then, footsteps could be heard faintly in that direction, getting louder and louder. Finally, the footsteps stopped at their cell. The person was one of the guards that they saw to be one of the original ten that sent them here in the first place. He turned to face them, a clot glare gazing over them. Which one of you is Hinata Hayuga? They were surprised, what did they want with her? Hinata raised her shaking hand, afraid of what could happen. The guard nodded. His imperial majesty would like to see you. This was a shock, Naruto wanted to see Hinata. Maybe Sakura was right. Hinata got up and quickly walked to the cell door. The guard unlocked the door and allowed Hinata to get out, before closing and locking it again, but not before hear Sakura sing. Dot get him Hinata. With that, Hinata smiled at her teammate, and then the heiress followed the palace guard to where Naruto wanted to see her. Naruto strode through the palace halls to his destination, his twelve guards marching behind him. With Miss Tuhide off to do as he asked, he made his way to his chamber to prepare for his guest. A part of him hoped that what he had planned succeeded, as his guest was still quite important to him, even after all these years. When he turned the corner however he nearly bumped into an old monk, one that he knew well. Said monk almost had a heart attack. Ah. Your imperial majesty, I am terribly sorry about that, he spoke, bowing low. Naruto just waved it off. It's okay Kiyomasa, I wasn't looking where I was going he replied to the cabinet minister of religion. The old man just smiled his usual smile that was normally on his face. I take it your imperial majesty is off in a hurry, the teen gave a smile in reply. But then the monk hit home. I sense your imperial majesty has been troubled, at this Naruto side. I first sensed it at our cabinet meeting, but upon seeing those ninja this afternoon, I knew there was conflict inside. He spoke in a soft tone, his hand gesturing to the emperor's chest, to his heart. I don't know what to do Kato-san. My mind tells me not to get involved in this war, as it has nothing to do with us. My heart tells me however to help fire country, despite what they did to me in the past. The monk nodded his head in understanding. Bonds can never truly be severed, broken maybe, but even bonds that have been gone for decades, given enough time, can heal the ties lost in the past. Your imperial majesty however also must take the matters of those under your imperial majesty's hand, and thus when there is a conflict of interest, a choice must be made. Naruto was glad to know someone who spoke matters of personal value. This is why he was one of the few he completely trusted. Then what should I do, which road should I go down? He asked the old man. The minister bowed in reply. That, your imperial majesty, is a choice only you can decide. I will say however, that no matter which choice you take, the cabinet will support your imperial majesty completely. At this Naruto couldn't help but feel in high spirits that the fact the cabinet would be with him on side, no matter the choice he took. 
Thanks, Kato. That's lifted my spirits. The cheery old man bowed once more, his smile on his aged face. Then your imperial majesty, I will take my leave with that the minister of religion walked past the teenage emperor, who in turn walked to his destination once more. All was quiet on the northern border, the wind calmly blowing across the grass, and whistled a silent tune to those who focused, the tune of nature's call. Battlements stood high to watch any movement on the other side. Then men stood stationary like statues, watching with eagle eyes for anything that could appear. But on this day, nothing was happening, all was quiet. It was too quiet for an old man who surveyed what was before him. The first imperial legion stood ready to repel any raids sent by the Syrian kingdom to the north. Like all legions, it was a force of 100,000 men, all well-armed, equipped and trained. Divided into ten cohorts, all 1,000 strong, the first imperial legion stood at full strength, along with the second and third imperial legions within the empire. The first imperial legion had a special reputation however, compared to the others. It was this legion, which was comprised of the men who fought alongside the emperor during the wars of unification. They had stood alongside him since the start of his long campaign, and now were the first proper force to be constructed when the empire was officially completed. Their leader was one of his most trusted commanders, and was honored as being one of the first to join Naruto when he appeared seven years ago. Yoshihiro Shimazu. The old general stood over the wooden battlements, observing the land below. He was equipped with samurai armor, like all others in the military. He however also wore a sleeveless red jacket over his black armor, with the symbol of the empire on his back. That of the imperial eagle holding an ornate shield in his claws. With a small, white beard contrasting his dark skin, Shimazu was a general of experience. That experience was telling him that something was going to happen. Accompanying him was the first division of the imperial legion. Ten thousand men who were positioned all along the border close to his location. The division was then divided into ten companies, which were ten, one thousand men groups. With Shimazu now was the first company of the first division. These companies then had specific companies, numbering ten cohorts that consist of different type of units. Raising his hand high, he signaled the two cohorts within an infantry company of the first division of the first imperial legion, both containing a hundred men each, to move to their registered positions, and have the archers prepare their bows. The infantry companies were trained to utilize the bow, the spear and the sword. Not specializing in one field but able to use all. The infantry company that came from mobilized their Yari Samurai, those armed with spears and katanas to go in front. Behind them another two cohorts of bow samurai were positioned behind them, bows ready in hand. Behind them a cavalry company prepared another cohort of 100 to ready their own mounted bow samurai, to support the first two cohort in front, when the need came, while the Yari cavalry cohorts positioned themselves on the flanks. It was not long before Shimazu's fears became a reality. Small groups of cavalry began charging from overhead. The Syrians wore samurai armor like the Western Empire, but instead of helmets they wore turbans, which covered their faces. With war cries they charged forward, spears down ready to impale the infantry before them. The infantry however calmly drew their bows. Fanatical zealots the old man cursed with a deep gruff voice, before he yelled fire. With that order the bows were released. The arrows hurled through their air in their hundreds, before landing on the charging cavalry. The Syrians reeled as they took casualties as the arrows found their way through the armor, killing many of them due to the amount of arrows there. However they quickly found their cohesion once more, and charged at the infantry once again. The infantry in front of the archer, quickly brought their spears low, and the Yari Samurai infantry prepared for the charge. The cavalry landed right on top of them, many in front getting impaled by the long, sharp point weapons. The raiders tried to crash through the lines of infantry, but they didn't budge. The ears under the old general had granted them a tough will to go with their experiences they had seen, and no matter how hard the raiders pushed, the soldiers of the emperor did not move one step backwards. The fanatics tried kept up the momentum, regardless of the losses they took, but it was already too late. The amount of casualties they had suffered made what was left insufficient to succeed in their attack. It was soon made worse when the air cavalry on either side of the infantry, charged the flanks of the invading cavalry. It quickly became a one-sided massacre. Soon however Syrian infantry began charging over the horizon, like the cavalry wearing turbans to conceal their faces. The old general foresaw this, drew his sword and raised it high. The signal was given for the artillery companies behind two battlements to use their multi-arrow ballisty. Using torsion they fired many more arrows over the battlements, and hit the enemy infantry dead on. Using their stumbling momentum to his advantage he signaled for the charioteer cohorts, which formed another company of the 1st Imperial Legion to charge. They appeared around the walls and through the gates. A thousand teams of two-man light chariots and heavier three-man chariots, charged at high speed towards the Syrian infantry. The Syrian infantry tried to prepare for the charge, but were outmaneuvered by the more mobile light chariots. These two men, horse-drawn platforms fired their bows at individual targets within the compact group, softening the defense, while all the time effectively running circles around the group of targets. Then the heavy chariots, also firing bows at the northern raiders, took a more direct approach, as they smashed into the lines. 
Samurai with spears on the chariots attacked the nearest Siren towards them as the rest broke ranks and fled. While this happened, the company sergeant of the cavalry company in reserve was given the order to charge the Siren archers that were stationed further up the battlefield. With a war cry, the cohorts of cavalry rode from their position outside the wooden battlements to their appointed target. Yuri, Katana and Bo cavalry moved at all haste towards their designated target. They moved past the other areas of combat with increasing speed, and it was only when they were a few hundred yards did the Siren archers realize their presence. By the time they drew on their bows the cavalry were soon upon them. The force of the impact forced the archers to withdraw, only to be cut down on their retreat. Shimazu watched the events with natural eyes. He watched as the men cheered once more as the last of the fanatics was struck down. He watched as the men cheered for the victory they had achieved. He however knew that this victory on this skirmish was but a hollow one. The attacks were becoming more and more frequent. Not just here but also along the other areas of the borders. While the rest of the legion was stationed all across the border in their individual divisions, kept the raids at bay, and the support of the Second Imperial Legion to help bolster the defense lines was a great aid to the defense, he knew that the attacks were just a test of their strength. The real test was soon to come. Seiken Shima of the Second Imperial Legion knew this as well, he had already begun to prepare his legion for what could be an attack for the northeast province. Not only that, the emperor had moved him to that position, as there was now an underlying threat coming from the small eastern pocket. While an attack there was unlikely, it seems the emperor didn't want to take things to chance. He also got reports that the Third Imperial Legion was being relocated to the eastern region. Apparently the war in the east could spill over to the empire, and the emperor was not taking any chances in being prepared. He couldn't help but smile, it was time for Yung Yukimura to gain some experience as a legion commander. While he was less experienced than the two veterans commanding the first two legions, he did not doubt the young Sonata's ability to command. Looking at his men he watched them reorganize into their individual companies. He ordered the cavalry company commanders to move to the location on either side of the battlements, while ordering the charioteer commander to move back to their original location. With a salute, they went back to their men, and they rode off to their new assigned location. While most of the divisions stood with him, he had to divide his division, and other divisions of the legion, to protect the border on an extended length. While he had fought these raids with only essentially have the strength of a standard legion, he believed that he owned strategic ability, and the clear stupidity of the Sirens, as to only come as raiding forces and not a fully mobilized army, he truly believed he and his legion could hold the line. Shimazu sighed, it seems that even after the unity of our emperor's empire granted stability for those that dwell within, there are those who look outside who wish to destroy it, before he walked back to his command post. He had to prepare for the next raid in this area, and preparing a new strategy of defense against the fanatical Sirens. A muffled knocking was heard outside the door of the emperor's private chamber. Said emperor was at this moment in time preparing two glasses of expensive red wine. One was for him, the other was for his guest, who met this fairy. Turning to face the large doors, he shouted for them to enter. But the silent creak they opened, revealing one of the Praetorian guards opening the door with his arm, another who was one of the palace guards, and a third person who he was expecting for this evening. The young emperor of the west smiled brightly as he gazed upon his guest, happy at her arrival. It's good to see you again after all these years, Hinata-chan. You look beautiful. Said Hayuga blushed a deep crimson at Naruto's remark. Even after seven years of being away from him, she still couldn't control her feelings for her long-time crush. Slowly she walked into the room, one measured step at a time. With a gesture he signaled for the guard to leave them, who in turn bowed in respect before going back to his duties. With that his bodyguard holding the door open moved to close it, with a small clink, to make sure neither of the room's inhabitants was disturbed. Please, take a seat Naruto motioned for her to sit on the sofa beside him. A blushing Hinata managed to squeak out thanks before she quickly sat down to where the western emperor pointed to. She tried a tactic in seeing how close she could get to his while sitting on the sofa, while at the same time be at a safe distance as not to faint. Can I interest you in a drink? He asked in a kind, gentle tone, while raising one of the two glasses of red wine. Hinata stiffly nodded her head, unable to find her voice. Naruto just smiled at the reaction, she hadn't changed even after all these years, she was still the shy, yet gentle girl that he had inadvertently ignored throughout his childhood. He passed her one of the two glasses of fine red wine he prepared earlier. She kindly received it with gentle fingers from his hand, and putting it to her lips, tasted the sweet liquid with a single sip. Looking down at the floor, she finally mustered enough courage to talk to her long-time romantic love interest. Ah it's good to see you again and Naruto-kan she spoke silently, but still loud enough for him to hear. Said Blonde smiled more than he had ever smiled in a long time, those words immediately told him that Hinata still cared about him. With a soft touch he placed his fingers of hers. This action caused her to gasp and go bright red at the fact her crush, no her love was actually touching her. Managing to look at his face, she saw that his eyes were filled with sorrow. I deeply apologize for my earlier misconduct to you. I let my anger get the best of me. I didn't mean to scare you he spoke in a soft tone, which to Hinata was soothing to her ears. 
Being able to finally relax she spoke more confidently. I take it that your threat still stands however. She asked in her usual soft-spoken voice. The blonde oppositor nodded. Your group did walk into my lands with permission, and I didn't know what the reason was for you coming here. I am sorry, but I have to stay out of this war for my people. They have suffered enough war, he told her, but also to himself. He seemed determined to stay at this course of action. Upon seeing her features frown he realized he had another apology to make. I'm deeply sorry Hinata-chan that I never got time to spend some days alone with you. If I had realized sooner how you felt about me, then I would have asked you out on a date. Mind you, that offer's still open. If you are interested. Hinata was both deeply surprised and happy at what she just heard. Naruto did harbor feelings that were similar to her own. He blatantly just asked her out. But then suddenly she frowned, remembering that she had to do something when she got back to the Hidden Leaf Village. Naruto quickly saw the downed look on her face, and became quickly concerned. What's wrong Hinata-chan? Tears began to form in the girl's eyes, making Naruto even more concerned about his very precious person. He stood up from the couch she sat on, and walked over to sit beside Hinata. Then he wrapped his arms around her in a comforting manner, which she quickly obliged as she cried onto his chest, finding much needed comfort in his arms. After a few minutes she began to calm down, she found her voice again. I, I've been forced in an arranged damn marriage with a son to a very powerful noble I don't like, because my clan wants more influence in the court of the fire daimyo, Naruto's eyes narrowed. They always hurt her in some way, shape or form. Now what they did was going too far in his eyes. But to his shock, Hinata wasn't finished. They also did this she lifted her hand up and revealed to Naruto her forehand. And to his horror, revealed what she bore. The caged bird seal. I'm no longer the heir to my clan, my sister is. They put this seal on me and shoved me into the branch family. They claimed that I was too weak to lead the clan, and my feelings for you would bring dishonor to them. They have even taught the noble's son the sign to activate the seal, just in case I get disobedient soon after the explanation Hinata broke down again. Now Naruto was beyond angry. In fact, he now very close to being like a volcano ready to erupt. But he calmed himself down. No, he was not going to let his anger get the best of him. No. In fact, he was going to get one over the Hayuga clan one last time. Lifting Hinata's head up by cupping her chin with his fingers, he gave the tearful girl a gentle, love-filled smile. Then allow me to remove that burden on you, my dear Haim. Hinata blushed again with the title he gave her. Then, to her confusion, the young emperor closed his eyes, and began to do a long, complex array one-hand signs, while mumbling a strange language. She noticed that the markings on the back on the blonde's white gloves, began to glow brightly. Suddenly, he opened his eyes, and with one hand lifting the fringe on Hinata's forehead, with his other hand, he pressed two fingers onto the center location of the branch seal. He uttered but a single word. Release a bright white light covered the girl's brow. But as quickly as it appeared, it vanished, leaving Naruto with a smile on his face. He grabbed a mirror that was nearby and put it in front of Hinata's face, so she could see her reflection. She gasped in great shock at what she saw. What seal? He asked with a humorous tone, while presenting one of his foxy grins. The caged bird seal was no longer there. Hinata for one was too shocked for words. Naruto's smile got bigger. Being a seal master has its advantages. And with me getting the Kayubi free, that seal was easy to remove. She was too much in awe to say anything. She was free. Free from the curse of the caged bird. But she was also confused on what do to. Eat but what do I do now? Now that you have released me, the Hayuga clan will hunt me to put it back on me. What can I do? She asked with a pleading tone. Naruto merely smiled back and slowly began to lean in, causing Hinata to blush more than she ever did before, at how close they were, only a few centimeters apart. She felt his arms encircle her once again, and the smile became on of deviousness. Why don't we worry about that later he spoke in a seductive whisper. And with those final words he closed he distanced, leaving Hinata in sweet bliss, for having her long time dream come true for some time to come. While this certainly is an unexpected predicament, I must say Gentleman Kamei concluded as he watched the two lovebirds with a grin. He and the other cabinet members all watched the events, which transpired in the Emperor's chamber. How they did it. Kazuma was also among them, using one of his spheres to show what was happening. Many of the cabinet members couldn't help but smile at the fact that the Emperor may now have an Empress by his side, if she was to stay. By what they heard however, that may be the case. The Justice Minister Kisu Chosukup was not one of those smiling at the events. Isn't the Emperor going to be annoyed when he finds out about this? He didn't feel comfortable at watching their Emperor's private life. Kayubi however just gave him a pat on the back. You mean if he finds out the fact that he won't only made the demon fox grin more at the prospect. He always liked to get under blonde skin without Naruto knowing about it. Besides, he could be able to use this sentimental event to his advantage. His mind already began to work on ways to get at the blonde emperor. Who's young woman anyway? One of ministers asked. It was a good question, as none here knew of who Hinata was. Well, all except one. Kayubi would be the one to enlighten the cabinet. 
Hinata Hayuga is from Kanahagaka within Fire Country. As you are all aware they nodded their heads in reply. She is, well was, the heir of the Hayuga clan within the Hidden Leaf Village, as you just heard. The clan was very influential due to their bloodline, the Bayakugan. More on that later. Anyway, she was close to Naruto due to the fact of she being one of the few to hold no ill will of any kind towards him. In fact, as you can see she was in love with him from a very early age. Due to the fact Naruto has a fierce determination, it gave great admiration for her. The thing is she only finally confessed to Naruto of her love the day he had to leave, so this is a 7 year delay for those two to get together. One thing I can say for certain is that she has a kind heart, one that is rare as these centuries. At this explanation they now believe that she would be a great match to their emperor. An empress with a gentle nature beside the strong and determined emperor. A perfect match. Now all we have to do is make sure they do get together, Kamei stated. He gave Kayubi a questioning look, along with the other members, when they saw his laughing. Oh you don't have to do anything, it's all been sorted by those two young lovers already. I assure you the demon lord spoke as he went back to watching the show provided by the Ihe lord. The team from Kanoha had assembled themselves in front of the palace gates. Around them was a large group of samurai that looked to be the ones escorting them back to the border. Already they were wondering what the reactions of those in the village would be when they find out that the Emperor of the West was their former demon vessel. Kakashi signed, he wasn't going to look forward to it. During their dismal night in the dungeons of the palace, they had the chance to think on what could have been if Naruto was not banished. Most probably in the same position, but they would have had allies to support their war, instead of being on their own in the world. What was interesting to them however was the fact Hinata never returned to them after being called out by the blonde. This left many of the group to speculate. Only when they were preparing to leave did she reappear. When asked where she was at for the night, the only reply they got was a deep blush from the Hayuga, who found the floor suddenly very interesting. This got several reactions. Kurenai smiled at seeing the small smile on the girl's face. Kiba gawked at what she did. Sakura also blushed upon realizing what happened. Kakashi gave a perverted giggle, and Shino, well nothing on the surface. Kakashi surprisingly was the first to recover. Are we ready? He asked everyone. They nodded and were ready to move when a voice stopped them, telling them to wait. Turning around they saw the Kaiyubi in human form walking towards him. There has been a slight change in plan, I am to escort you to the border. The rest of you are to return to your original duties. The samurai saluted, then walk off back into the palace grounds. Kaiyubi turned to face the Kanohe ninjas, and gave them a cruel, sadistic, and demonic smile. This in turn caused the nin to shiver in fear. They were defiantly weren't looking forward to the trip back home. Kaiyubi just chuckled at their reactions, as he just loved to mess with their heads, making them feel true terror. Shall we begin the journey to the border? He asked. Kakashi reluctantly nodded, and they all proceeded to walk to the city gates. Well, all but Hinata. Kurenai quickly noticed this and turned to the girl. What's wrong Hinata? She asked. This got everyone's attention, making the rest of the team turn to the shy Hayuga. Said girl was standing very still, her eyes overcast by her dark hair. I one swift motion her fists clenched. I'm not going back at this statement their eyes widened in disbelief. What? Kurenai asked in deep confusion. Hinata had that determined look in her eye. I'm staying here with Naruto-kun. I'm staying with the person I love. It seemed time just stood still, as the members of the Kanohan team gazed upon in shock, the Emperor of the Western Empire, Naruto Uzumaki Namikis. The same Naruto banished from their home seven years ago. And boy he looked as mad as hell, and by all rights he had good reason to. He was a team, sent by the place he despised with nearly his whole being, coming into his realm without his consent, and made up of some of the people he hated most in that place. Kakashi truly was a hypocrite. He spoke about friendship, and those who broke the rules are trash, but those who abandon their comrade are worse than trash. He turned back on his own saying, leaving him alone to train his precious Ichiha. He couldn't stand this fool. He even turned his back on him when he brought the Ichiha back, which caused him to hate his former sensei even more. Sakura was just as bad, always calling him a baka, and never once showed any gratitude to saving her from Gar. Thinking about it, maybe he should have let his good friend kill her, since she was so pathetic. Looking at her now, he realized how much of a fool he had been to waste him time on this pink-haired banshee, when he could have spent it with the girl that truly mattered to him, Hinata Hayuga. Next to his former teammate was the idiot Kippa. Always going into things head first. But looking back he saw he wasn't any better. But it angered him that this dog lover was one of the first to turn his back on him. For that, he would never forgive him. Kurenai he had real no problem with, but then again he never knew her. But he did know that every time she saw him, she would look down on him with disgust. She was like everyone else, blind and pathetic, hurting a child to cure her own problems. Shino was hard to tell, but he was sure that he was like all the others. Even when they were in the academy Shino would stay away from him, as if he was afraid. The last member was one he never though he would see again, Hinata. He could still remember the day she confessed her love for him, the day he had to leave. Out of everyone there, she was the only one who stayed with him. He couldn't believe himself being so blind not to see the sign she loved him, begin so engrossed with Sakura. 
Now he regretted it. But looking into her eyes he found no hate. Maybe there was a chance to bridge the new divide made by the long seven year absence. However, he had other matters that needed his attention, such as the reason why they were here in first place. Naruto's eyes gazed around the hole. He could hear the whispers of shock and astoundment of this group from Konoha, who were from Fire Country, who had the audacity to try and sneak into this empire, our empire, his empire. He could hear the glares some were giving the group as they stood in the center of the hole, much like what the villages of Kanahagakur would give him. How fitting. He could see all the remaining nobles of the land. Those few who actually joined him rather than falling in a pathetic attempt to stop his ambition. Now they were just essentially a group of yes-men, all trying to remain on his good side to save their own skin, and their own self-interests. He could see the members of the House of Representatives and of the Senate. He knew that those elected by the common masses, as well as those of specialist fields, would not want to go to yet another war without good reason. He also knew that the speakers of those houses would be watching intently on any decision he made. While he had absolute power politically, he knew that the true power lied with the people. It was important to keep them on board regardless of the decision. He could also see his cabinet amongst those with the masses in the hall. Once they knew who this group was, they all fall amongst the members of this hall, would be most interested in his reaction, and how he dealt with the situation. Most of all he could see the old Warhawk's eyes bear the sight intently. It seems that Yoshimoto was wanting to see if he would be soft on these intruders. How amusing. Either way, this ninja team was trespassing on foreign soil without his permission, and he would make them understand that there are consequences. Then again the fear of the consequence would be greater than the actual act, if done correctly. The Kanoha team on their half were scared, very scared. They could see the hatred that welled the blonde's blue orbs, but what scared them more is that he could easily get his revenge on Kanoha, and they wouldn't be able to stop him. Looking to their side they could see the Kayubi in human form grinning like a madman. But what scared them even more was all the delegates from around the empire, members of the three branches of the empire's government, give cold glares at the fact they had the audacity to come to this place, now with hindsight, knowing they would be unwelcome. They could hear to coarse whispers about them, and some were pretty damn insulting. Kairubi on his part was obviously enjoying their discomfort, a discomfort that they had made themselves. Here Kanoha was about to find out, firsthand, at how big a mistake they had made. After all, all actions have a consequence. The Kanohan team were obviously disheartened at the face of seeing their biggest mistake come and hit them back on the head, but they had to stay focused, maybe there was a chance of him helping Kanoha, though it would most likely be at a heavy price. Snapping out of his stupor, Kakashi quickly went into a kneeling position, a sign of respect for one's great superiors. The others quickly followed his example. How it must have felt for them to face their mistakes, by submitting to the one you scored your whole life. Your Imperial Majesty Kakashi spoke, trying to sound as calm as possible. Looking back he now wished he had been there for the boy in his most needed moment, since he wouldn't be in this situation now. How he wished he listened to his own words, now he had to face his old student. It's true what they say, the past always catches up with you. Allow me to apologize for our rude intrusion on your lands, and allow me to explain why we have come here seeking your counsel. Kakashi hoped that Naruto would let him explain the reason for coming into his realm. The voices of those watching once again began to start up again, this time the tone more inquisitive than insulting. Looking up, he could see the blonde gaze into him, searching for any hidden secrets. It was there he realized that standing there wasn't his former student, but now someone who was a shrewd and powerful ruler of the most powerful nation on the elemental continent. The blonde stood up from his throne and walked slowly down the steps towards the team. This action caused the whispers around them to cease. I would advise you to speak quickly the cold tone of his voice was enough to make Kakashi and the others flinch. Well, it was now or never. At this moment our village is beset by three enemies. Kumo, Odo, and Iwa. Your Imperial Majesty, if this war continues in the flow it is currently going, then Konoha will surely fall. Not only that, Your Imperial Majesty, but our land of H no Kuni, is beset by the lands of sound, earth and lightning, with the support of several other countries. If this war was to escalate into complete conflict, we will not survive. Great Sire, we deeply ask of your aid in this war. If you were to join us as an ally in this war, not only will we stand a good chance of survival, but also maybe the war will end without any more blood being spilt. Your Imperial Majesty, I beseech you to aid yous in our time of need. I am sure that the Council and the Daimyo will pay any price you wish to send, so please Emperor of the West, help us. At the end Kakashi was practically begging, his voice easily told Naruto of the plea to send help to a losing contestant in a war. How he hated to see a grown man grovel. Tell me Kakashi Haddock the Jonin looked up to see Naruto hard eyes staring at him, what could I possibly gain in the long term, that would prove to be beneficial to my empire? Though it was a clear and simple question, the answer eluded Kakashi. Another voice spoke up for his defense. Sire, I am sure that an alliance between both your empire and our country, would greatly improve the ways of life for both countries, and I am also sure that both our realms would learn greatly from one another, for I am sure that in the long term, an alliance between our nations would allow both to prosper. 
Kakashi silently thanked Kurenai for the response, but soon felt sorry for her when he saw Naruto turn his hard gaze towards her direction. Is that so Kurenai Yuhi? He asked her. He didn't wait for a response as he quickly turned around and walked back up to his throne. You know what I see Kakashi? He asked, as he sat back down, his voice betraying no emotion. I see a group of pathetic ninja, from a village that dug itself its own grave. At this the team looked at the young emperor in shock, but he wasn't finished. I see a group of ninja who want me to waste my time, resources, and manpower on a war that doesn't concern me in any way. I see a group of ninja who want me to get involved with a village that scorned my very existence from the day I was born into this world. I see a group of ninja who want me to get involved with a village that betrayed and banished me for doing my duty. The last part was said with such anger even the Kaiubi himself flinched from the anger Naruto was releasing. He knew Naruto would never forgive Konoha, and he knew of the anger that burned inside the boy, being kept inside for so long, it was all getting released now. I can name only one person who didn't turn her back on me. I can name only one person who didn't leave me when I needed my friends the most. I can name only one person who never saw me for what I held inside. The rest of you left me when I needed you at my most venerable point. I can say only one person in your group was that only person in the whole village who treated me as a human being. Naruto left time for his words to sink in, letting them know how he felt when they turned against him. Then he decided to drop the bombshell. I will not give Kanoha aid in any way shape or form. I will let you shrivel in the mess that you created. I will not save you from your own destruction. The Kanohan team looked horrified at what Naruto said, he wouldn't help them. He actually sounded like he wanted them to fall to ruin. But he wasn't done yet. As for your trespassing of my domain, you will all be sent to the palace dungeons for the night. Tomorrow you will be escorted by my men to the borders to return to your village for your defiance. Should I find that you have entered my lands again, you will not return to your home alive. Take them away from my sight. The ten samurai that followed them from the entrance, then grabbed each of the team, and took them down to the dungeons below. No one put up a fight, too mortified at what Naruto had said to him or her. Not only would he not help them, but also he would kill them if they were found in his lands again. Sakura however managed to find her voice, and tried to call out to her former teammate, trying to make him see reason. But her words fell on deaf ears as he watched them be taken down to the cells. Not one person however saw the long tear that slid down his cheek. Silence filled the hall after the door slammed shut. The emperor gave a sigh, before sitting back down on his throne, the tear was allowed to freely drop down his chin before he wiped it away. Your imperial majesty, Naruto looked up to see who was addressing him, it was Kamei. The middle-aged man looked quite concerned. Is his imperial majesty alright? Naruto couldn't help but smile. I'm fine Lord Kamei he addressed his chief of staff. Thank you for your concern. I take it that your imperial majesty has not decided to get involved in this war. As I said Lord Kamei, I wouldn't waste the resources of the empire in a war that does not concern us. Until I see sufficient evidence that shows that we are in danger of being under threat, I will not take part in the war in the east. Before Kamei could reply however, another member of the imperial court involved himself. But your imperial majesty, after the land of fire goes, there will be no sufficient power in this small eastern bloc to face this northern alliance, it was the speaker of the senate. He was a middle-aged man who actually quite wise, and for that, he was ideal to be the representative for them in his cabinet. If this alliance actually lasts long after Kanoha's demise, and with the land of fire subjugated, then there could be a chance they could perceive us as a threat and target us afterwards. Naruto smiled, good to see he had some intelligent men in court. Others on the other hand were shocked that one would go against the emperor's verdict. Speaker of the Senate, are you defying the will of the emperor not to involve ourselves in this war? The Lord Speaker of the Lords asked in a condescending tone. A part of Naruto hated that old man, simply because he was a pompous fool at times. However compared to the other nobles, he was by far more tolerable. He was a man who had great intellect, but his pride as a noble member was his vice. Luckily he was one of the few who were able to rein it in, as seen when he submitted himself to Naruto as his ruler. I am not going against the will of our emperor, Lord Speaker of the Lords was the old man's reply, what I am afraid of the Northern Alliance, upon seeing us as a united empire, will see us as a threat. It is not just whether or not we involve ourselves in this war, it is also the fact that this alliance, fearing our power, might want to strike first. Furthermore, if they see that a Kanahagikar team came from our lands, then their suspicion will increase. Your Imperial Majesty, I humbly request that we prepare ourselves for the worst. Naruto could see that many in the Grand Hall seemed to agree with him, seeing men from all three houses nodded their heads in agreement. The request is noted Speaker of the Senate. He turned to the old Warhawk in his cabinet. Lord Yoshimoto at this said man stood at attention. Send word for the 2nd Imperial Legion to reorganize for a potential attack from the east. I'm sure all Shimazu of the 1st Imperial Legion will be able to cope with the Siren Empire. The combined might of the 2nd and 3rd Imperial Legions should be adequate to deal with any threat coming from the Northern Alliance. Yoshimoto Nisaki bowed his head in acknowledgement. While I highly doubt they will attack us, due to the Alliance being merely one of convenience, it doesn't hurt to be prepared. 
At seeing the questioning looks of the court, Naruto though it best to explain. The lands of earth and lightning have historical grievances with the land of fire. Similarly the ninja villages of Kumo and Iowa have historical grievances with Kanoha. The smaller countries that have joined this alliance feel threatened by Hai no Kuni's former supremacy, and thus hope to disperse it, and gain some land in the process. Arachimaru, the leader of this alliance has used that to gain this force, so he can crush Kanoha, nothing more. After the land of fire has been subjugated, and Kanahagikur has been destroyed, I would be deeply surprised if the alliance lasted long after their objective has been fulfilled. At this the court began to understand the emperor's logic of not getting involved. After the defeat of Fire Country, when the alliance dispersed, the balance of power in the Eastern Bloc would revert to normal, only that there would be four great powers instead of five. Still, the fact that afterwards each country would be on its own again, none of them would prove to be a sufficient threat to the Empire. But, in the chance they were to attack the Empire, however small, at least they would be prepared. After understanding the reason of not involving themselves, the court began to feel relaxed, and reverted to what they were doing before the little fiasco happened. Naruto stood on the edge of a large balcony in the Imperial Palace, thinking of the events that transpired today. He was shocked to see that even after all this time, Kanoha would think he would help them. The arrogance. He hated Kanoha with nearly his entire being. They had turned on him. Betrayed him. Used him for their own, selfish purposes, then just threw him away when he was no longer needed. How he hated them, he had no reason to help those that abandoned him after all this time. But, he also felt it was his duty to help Kanoha. After all, he promised long ago to protect it, and he never went back on his word, that was another promise he had made when he was a kid. How naive of him to think he could keep every promise he had made. This was a war that didn't involve him or his country, and so he chose to stay out of the war. Even looking at their faces brought back unwanted memories of his past treatment. Kiba humiliating him, Kakashi ignoring him, Sakura hurting him. Hinata confessing to him. That what hurt the most, knowing that Hinata was always there for him, if he had just talked to her and got to know her better, then maybe his days in Kanoha wouldn't have been as bad. But then, her father might not have approved of their relationship. He was after all a lowly orphan, a demon child, an abomination in their eyes. He knew he was an arrogant fool. He looked up as seeing the sun beginning to set. The day was near enough over, and tomorrow would start anew. Hopefully he would never see the ninja from the village hidden in the leaves ever again. He seemed troubled, a female voice brought him out of his thoughts. Turning around, he saw Yuki, Mitsuhai, and Kayubi standing near the entrance to the room he was dwelling in. I still don't know whether to stay ignorant or play the unsung hero. A part of me says not to help Kanoha for everything they did to me. But another part of me tells me to help them anyway he stated. Yuki frowned, even now she never liked how Kanoha treated him. Sure it was a good place to be in, but after finding out how they could treat a child, she was reluctant to go there again. Human nature was awful at times. Remember Naruto, all paths have their gains and consequences. While I do not like Kanoha, I hate Orochimaru even more. So if you do decide to go into war, then I will stay by your side Kayubi said. Naruto smiled. He could always relay on Kayubi when he needed support. Looking back, it was Kayubi that essentially helped him in every predicament he was in. He felt bad on relying on his friends so often, and a part of him wondered why he decided to stay with him after all this time. Thanks, you enjoyed that little show didn't you Kayubi smiled his traditional cruel smile in return. It's not every day you see some of Kanoha's finest cower before someone who is superior to them. Their daimyo is good for that, but seeing them cower before a foreign lord is far more satisfying to watch. Naruto turned around again and gazed over the city in which he inhabited. He looked at all those walking in the streets. He watched as shops began to close, turning it in for the day, and relax for the night before work begins anew the next morning. He saw children with their parents, laughing and having fun, enjoying the tranquil life he had blessed them all with. He had worked so hard to bring peace to this side of the continent, to his empire, and was working to bring it to greatness, so everyone within would prosper. To see the other in such a state. I will only enter this war if I has a very good reason to the blonde said. Kayubi and Yuki looked slightly puzzled. He turned to face them. At this moment I have no real reason to go to war. This time I put my country before my heart. As he said that he however remembered something. His eyes widened in realizing what it was. Now he had a chance to find out something, which had bothered him ever since he left Kanoha seven years ago. He had to know. In a single motion he spun around and with pace, started walking past the three over inhabitants of the room and out through the door. This sudden move caught said inhabitants of guard. Where are you going Naruto? Kayubi asked. Yuki and Mitsuhide were thinking the same thing. The reply caused the former to smile, and the latter to wonder. There is a certain person I've been meaning to get reacquainted with for the past seven years. Mitsuhide. Your Imperial Majesty. The old servant asked, running out the room to catch up with the teenage emperor. There is someone I want you to fetch. It had been only several hours since they were thrown into the dark prisons under the palace. To the team from Kanoha however, it seemed like an eternity. An eternity for them to reflect on their past misgivings to their former comrade turned enemy turned emperor, and how it was their fault that they now laid in this predicament. 
Not a single word was spoken as none could get over the fact that Naruto had not only rejected their plea for help, but also threatened them with death, should he see them again. Sakura was hugging her knees, muttering unheard apologies to her former teammate, the teammate she betrayed. Kiba just sat quietly, looking lifeless as he stared at the wall. Takashi had tears down his face, finally realizing how stupid he had been to abandon Naruto on so many occasions. Shino, like Kiba, just sat quietly on the ground, keeping himself to himself. Kurenai was trying desperately to comfort Hinata, who at this moment in time believed Naruto hated her after the way he was treated back in Kanoha. You know we are the reason why Naruto has turned out like this Kurenai spoke, finally breaking the silence. Kakashi turned his tearful gaze to her. But he is after all, Kanoha's most unpredictable ninja Kakashi did a haunting laugh at the comments. He isn't Kanoha's ninja anymore Kurenai he replied, and it's all Kanoha's fault on the whole, we left him. We abandoned him. The Jinjutsu mistress sighed in displeasure. Mind you, only Naruto could perform a miracle like this. To unite a vast, war-torn land in such a short amount of time, and turn it into what possibly could be the most powerful country on the continent, if not the only empire on this continent. That truly is a great feat. She stated, impressed how Naruto had managed to make a powerful ruler. Thinking about it, he really would make a great hookage if he was given the chance. Not only that, he also has the Kyubi under his command, and the people themselves look ready to die for him if he asked. Loyalties like that is something we shouldn't take lightly Shino spoke, and both older ninja couldn't help but not in agreement. Suddenly they heard a roar in anger, and turned to see Kiba standing up and punched the wall, hard enough to cause his knuckles to bleed. Damn, I haven't felt this bad in all my life he growled out, I mean, I thought he was the Kayubi, that was what my mom said he was after the secret got out. But after seeing both of them at the same time, looking nothing like each other, acting nothing like each other. Damn he clasped to the ground. Some friend I was. And we made him like this Kiba Sakura managed to say, still upset by what had happened. It's all our fault. I used to blame him for bringing Sauce Khan back like he did, but now I realize he had no other choice. And I didn't see that because I was blinded by the fear of what he contained. Sakura seemed to be nearly crying rivers at the guilt she felt. Looking at her former teammate, hatred in his eyes, did she finally realize what she had done to him? Looking back to when they were together, she also realized how she never treated him with kindness. Now she wished that she could go back in time and be there for Naruto for all those years. Hanada didn't say anything in the conversation, as she was still trying to pull herself together after the incident with Naruto. She wished now that she had confessed to him much earlier, and cursed her shyness. She also wished that she went with Naruto, but she knew if she did that, then her father would not stand for it. She now believed that he hated her like all the rest. She was brought out of her thoughts by a comforting voice. Hey Hinata, she looked up to see Sakura smiling down at her. Don't be upset, I'm sure Naruto doesn't hate you. You are the only one who stayed by him remember? Hinata wiped her tearful eyes. He's got no reason to hate you. I'm sure the glare he gave was directed at us, don't be so hard on yourself. In fact, I would say that he still cares deeply about you. Hinata smiled at Sakura's gentle words. She now felt reassured. Thanks Sakura. The pink-haired nin smiled. But the conversation was interrupted by the dungeon doors opening with a loud noise. Then, footsteps could be heard faintly in that direction, getting louder and louder. Finally, the footsteps stopped at their cell. The person was one of the guards that they saw to be one of the original ten that sent them here in the first place. He turned to face them, a clot glare gazing over them. Which one of you is Hinata Hayuga? They were surprised, what did they want with her? Hinata raised her shaking hand, afraid of what could happen. The guard nodded. His imperial majesty would like to see you. This was a shock, Naruto wanted to see Hinata. Maybe Sakura was right. Hinata got up and quickly walked to the cell door. The guard unlocked the door and allowed Hinata to get out, before closing and locking it again, but not before hear Sakura sing. God get him Hinata. With that, Hinata smiled at her teammate, and then the heiress followed the palace guard to where Naruto wanted to see her. Naruto strode through the palace halls to his destination, his twelve guards marching behind him. With Miss Two hide off to do as he asked, he made his way to his chamber to prepare for his guest. A part of him hoped that what he had planned succeeded, as his guest was still quite important to him, even after all these years. When he turned the corner however he nearly bumped into an old monk, one that he knew well. Said monk almost had a heart attack. Ah. Your imperial majesty, I am terribly sorry about that, he spoke, bowing low. Naruto just waved it off. It's okay Kiyomasa, I wasn't looking where I was going he replied to the cabinet minister of religion. The old man just smiled his usual smile that was normally on his face. I take it your imperial majesty is off in a hurry, the teen gave a smile in reply. But then the monk hit home. I sense your imperial majesty has been troubled, at this Naruto side. I first sensed it at our cabinet meeting, but upon seeing those ninja this afternoon, I knew there was conflict inside. He spoke in a soft tone, his hand gesturing to the emperor's chest, to his heart. I don't know what to do Kato-san. My mind tells me not to get involved in this war, as it has nothing to do with us. My heart tells me however to help fire country, despite what they did to me in the past. The monk nodded his head in understanding. 
Bonds can never truly be severed, broken maybe, but even bonds that have been gone for decades, given enough time, can heal the ties lost in the past. Your Imperial Majesty, however, also must take the matters of those under your Imperial Majesty's hand, and thus when there is a conflict of interest, a choice must be made. Naruto was glad to know someone who spoke matters of personal value. This is why he was one of the few he completely trusted. Then what should I do, which road should I go down? He asked the old man. The minister bowed in reply. That, your imperial majesty, is a choice only you can decide. I will say however, that no matter which choice you take, the cabinet will support your imperial majesty completely. At this Naruto couldn't help but feel in high spirits that the fact the cabinet would be with him on side, no matter the choice he took. Thanks Kato, that's lifted my spirits, the cheery old man bowed once more, his smile on his aged face. Then your imperial majesty, I will take my leave with that the minister of religion walked past the teenage emperor, who in turn walked to his destination once more. All was quiet on the northern border, the wind calmly blowing across the grass, and whistled a silent tune to those who focused, the tune of nature's call. Battlements stood high to watch any movement on the other side. Then men stood stationary like statues, watching with eagle eyes for anything that could appear. But on this day, nothing was happening, all was quiet. It was too quiet for an old man who surveyed what was before him. The first imperial legion stood ready to repel any raids sent by the Siren kingdom to the north. Like all legions, it was a force of 100,000 men, all well-armed, equipped and trained. Divided into 10 cohorts, all 1,000 strong, the first imperial legions stood at full strength, along with the second and third imperial legions within the empire. The first imperial legion had a special reputation however, compared to the others. It was this legion, which was comprised of the men who fought alongside the emperor during the wars of unification. They had stood alongside him since the start of his long campaign, and now were the first proper force to be constructed when the empire was officially completed. Their leader was one of his most trusted commanders, and was honored as being one of the first to join Naruto when he appeared seven years ago. Yushihiro Shimazu. The old general stood over the wooden battlements, observing the land below. He was equipped with samurai armor, like all others in the military. He however also wore a sleeveless red jacket over his black armor, with the symbol of the empire on his back. That of the imperial eagle holding an ornate shield in his claws. With a small, white beard contrasting his dark skin, Shimazu was a general of experience. That experience was telling him that something was going to happen. Accompanying him was the first division of the imperial legion. Ten thousand men who were positioned all along the border close to his location. The division was then divided into ten companies, which were ten, one thousand men groups. With Shimazu now was the first company of the first division. These companies then had specific companies, numbering ten cohorts that consist of different type of units. Raising his hand high, he signaled the two cohorts within an infantry company of the first division of the first imperial legion, both containing a hundred men each, to move to their registered positions, and have the archers prepare their bows. The infantry companies were trained to utilize the bow, the spear and the sword. Not specializing in one field but able to use all. The infantry company that came from mobilized their Yari Samurai, those armed with spears and katanas to go in front. Behind them another two cohorts of bow samurai were positioned behind them, bows ready in hand. Behind them a cavalry company prepared another cohort of 100 to ready their own mounted bow samurai, to support the first two cohort in front, when the need came, while the Yari cavalry cohorts positioned themselves on the flanks. It was not long before Shimazu's fears became a reality. Small groups of cavalry began charging from overhead. The Sirens wore samurai armor like the Western Empire, but instead of helmets they wore turbans, which covered their faces. With war cries they charged forward, spears down ready to impale the infantry before them. The infantry however calmly drew their bows, fanatical zealots the old man cursed with a deep gruff voice, before he yelled fire. With that order the bows were released. The arrows hurled through their air in their hundreds, before landing on the charging cavalry. The Sirens reeled as they took casualties as the arrows found their way through the armor, killing many of them due to the amount of arrows there. However they quickly found their cohesion once more, and charged at the infantry once again. The infantry in front of the archer, quickly brought their spears low, and the Yari Samurai infantry prepared for the charge. The cavalry landed right on top of them, many in front getting impaled by the long, sharp point weapons. The raiders tried to crash through the lines of infantry, but they didn't budge. The ears under the old general had granted them a tough will to go with their experiences they had seen, and no matter how hard the raiders pushed, the soldiers of the emperor did not move one step backwards. The fanatics tried kept up the momentum, regardless of the losses they took, but it was already too late. The amount of casualties they had suffered made what was left insufficient to succeed in their attack. It was soon made worse when the air cavalry on either side of the infantry, charged the flanks of the invading cavalry. It quickly became a one-sided massacre. Soon however Syrian infantry began charging over the horizon, like the cavalry wearing turbans to conceal their faces. The old general foresaw this, drew his sword and raised it high. The signal was given for the artillery companies behind two battlements to use their multi-aero ballistae. 
Using torsion they fired many more arrows over the battlements, and hit the enemy infantry dead on. Using their stumbling momentum to his advantage he signaled for the charioteer cohorts, which formed another company of the 1st Imperial Legion to charge. They appeared around the walls and through the gates. A thousand teams of two-man light chariots and heavier three-man chariots, charged at high speed towards the Syrian infantry. The Syrian infantry tried to prepare for the charge, but were outmaneuvered by the more mobile light chariots. These two men, horse-drawn platforms fired their bows at individual targets within the compact group, softening the defense, while all the time effectively running circles around the group of targets. Then the heavy chariots, also firing bows at the northern raiders, took a more direct approach, as they smashed into the lines. Samurai with spears on the chariots, attacked the nearest Siren towards them, as the rest broke ranks, and fled. While this happened, the company sergeant of the cavalry company in reserve, was given the order to charge the Siren archers, that were stationed further up the battlefield. With a war cry, the cohorts of cavalry rode from their position outside the wooden battlements to their appointed target. Yuri, Katana and Bo cavalry moved at all haste towards their designated target. They moved past the other areas of combat with increasing speed, and it was only when they were a few hundred yards did the Siren archers realize their presence. By the time they drew on their bows the cavalry were soon upon them. The force of the impact forced the archers to withdraw, only to be cut down on their retreat. Shimazu watched the events with natural eyes. He watched as the men cheered once more as the last of the fanatics was struck down. He watched as the men cheered for the victory they had achieved. He however knew that this victory on this skirmish was but a hollow one. The attacks were becoming more and more frequent. Not just here but also along the other areas of the borders. While the rest of the legion was stationed all across the border in their individual divisions, kept the raids at bay, and the support of the second imperial legion to help bolster the defense lines was a great aid to the defense, he knew that the attacks were just a test of their strength. The real test was soon to come. Seiken Shima of the Second Imperial Legion knew this as well, he had already begun to prepare his legion for what could be an attack for the northeast province. Not only that, the emperor had moved him to that position, as there was now an underlying threat coming from the small eastern pocket. While an attack there was unlikely, it seems the emperor didn't want to take things to chance. He also got reports that the Third Imperial Legion was being relocated to the eastern region. Apparently the war in the east could spill over to the empire, and the emperor was not taking any chances in being prepared. He couldn't help but smile, it was time for young Yukimura to gain some experience as a legion commander. While he was less experienced than the two veterans commanding the first two legions, he did not doubt the young Sonata's ability to command. Looking at his men he watched them reorganize into their individual companies. He ordered the cavalry company commanders to move to the location on either side of the battlements, while ordering the charioteer commander to move back to their original location. With a salute, they went back to their men, and they rode off to their new assigned location. While most of the divisions stood with him, he had to divide his division, and other divisions of the legion, to protect the border on an extended length. While he had fought these raids with only essentially have the strength of a standard legion, he believed that he owned strategic ability, and the clear stupidity of the Syrians, as to only come as raiding forces and not a fully mobilized army, he truly believed he and his legion could hold the line. Shimazu sighed, it seems that even after the unity of our emperor's empire granted stability for those that dwell within, there are those who look outside who wish to destroy it, before he walked back to his command post. He had to prepare for the next raid in this area, and preparing a new strategy of defense against the fanatical Syrians. A muffled knocking was heard outside the door of the emperor's private chamber. Said emperor was at this moment in time preparing two glasses of expensive red wine. One was for him, the other was for his guest, who met this fairy. Turning to face the large doors, he shouted for them to enter. But the silent creak they opened, revealing one of the Praetorian guards opening the door with his arm, another who was one of the palace guards, and a third person who he was expecting for this evening. The young emperor of the west smiled brightly as he gazed upon his guest, happy at her arrival. It's good to see you again after all these years, Hinata-chan. You look beautiful. Said Hayuga blushed a deep crimson at Naruto's remark. Even after seven years of being away from him, she still couldn't control her feelings for her long-time crush. Slowly she walked into the room, one measured step at a time. With a gesture he signaled for the guard to leave them, who in turn bowed in respect before going back to his duties. With that his bodyguard holding the door open moved to close it, with a small clink, to make sure neither of the room's inhabitants was disturbed. Please, take a seat Naruto motioned for her to sit on the sofa beside him. A blushing Hinata managed to squeak out thanks before she quickly sat down to where the western emperor pointed to. She tried a tactic in seeing how close she could get to his while sitting on the sofa, while at the same time be at a safe distance as not to faint. Can I interest you in a drink? He asked in a kind, gentle tone, while raising one of the two glasses of red wine. Hinata stiffly nodded her head, unable to find her voice. Naruto just smiled at the reaction, she hadn't changed even after all these years, she was still the shy, yet gentle girl that he had inadvertently ignored throughout his childhood. He passed her one of the two glasses of fine red wine he prepared earlier. 
She kindly received it with gentle fingers from his hand, and putting it to her lips, tasted the sweet liquid with a single sip. Looking down at the floor, she finally mustered enough courage to talk to her long-time romantic love interest. I it's good to see you again and Rudokan she spoke silently, but still loud enough for him to hear. Said Blonde smiled more than he had ever smiled in a long time. Those words immediately told him that Hinata still cared about him. With a soft touch he placed his fingers of hers. This action caused her to gasp and go bright red at the fact her crush, no her love was actually touching her. Managing to look at his face, she saw that his eyes were filled with sorrow. I deeply apologize for my earlier misconduct to you. I let my anger get the best of me. I didn't mean to scare you he spoke in a soft tone, which to Hinata was soothing to her ears. Being able to finally relax she spoke more confidently. I, I take it that your threat still stands however. She asked in her usual soft-spoken voice. The blonde oppositor nodded. Your group did walk into my lands with permission, and I didn't know what the reason was for you coming here. I am sorry, but I have to stay out of this war for my people. They have suffered enough war, he told her, but also to himself. He seemed determined to stay at this course of action. Upon seeing her features frown he realized he had another apology to make. I'm deeply sorry Hinata-chan that I never got time to spend some days alone with you. If I had realized sooner how you felt about me, then I would have asked you out on a date. Mind you, that offer's still open. If you are interested. Hinata was both deeply surprised and happy at what she just heard. Naruto did harbor feelings that were similar to her own. He blatantly just asked her out. But then suddenly she frowned, remembering that she had to do something when she got back to the Hidden Leaf Village. Naruto quickly saw the downed look on her face, and became quickly concerned. What's wrong Hinata-chan? Tears began to form in the girl's eyes, making Naruto even more concerned about his very precious person. He stood up from the couch he sat on, and walked over to sit beside Hinata. Then he wrapped his arms around her in a comforting manner, which she quickly obliged as she cried onto his chest, finding much needed comfort in his arms. After a few minutes she began to calm down, she found her voice again. I, I've been forced in an arranged damn marriage with a son to a very powerful noble I don't like, because my clan wants more influence in the court of the fire daimyo, Naruto's eyes narrowed. They always hurt her in some way, shape or form. Now what they did was going too far in his eyes. But to his shock, Hinata wasn't finished. They also did this she lifted her hand up and revealed to Naruto her forehand. And to his horror, revealed what she bore. The caged bird seal. I'm no longer the heir to my clan, my sister is. They put this seal on me and shoved me into the branch family. They claimed that I was too weak to lead the clan, and my feelings for you would bring dishonor to them. They have even taught the noble's son the sign to activate the seal, just in case I get disobedient soon after the explanation Hinata broke down again. Now Naruto was beyond angry. In fact, he now very close to being like a volcano ready to erupt. But he calmed himself down. No, he was not going to let his anger get the best of him. No. In fact, he was going to get one over the Hayuga clan one last time. Lifting Hinata's head up by cupping her chin with his fingers, he gave the tearful girl a gentle, love-filled smile. Then allow me to remove that burden on you, my dear Haim. Hinata blushed again with the title he gave her. Then, to her confusion, the young emperor closed his eyes, and began to do a long, complex array one-hand signs, while mumbling a strange language. She noticed that the markings on the back on the blonde's white gloves, began to glow brightly. Suddenly, he opened his eyes, and with one hand lifting the fringe on Hinata's forehead, with his other hand, he pressed two fingers onto the center location of the branch seal. He uttered but a single word. Release a bright white light covered the girl's brow. But as quickly as it appeared, it vanished, leaving Naruto with a smile on his face. He grabbed a mirror that was nearby and put it in front of Hinata's face, so she could see her reflection. She gasped in great shock at what she saw. What seal? He asked with a humorous tone, while presenting one of his foxy grins. The caged bird seal was no longer there. Hinata for one was too shocked for words. Naruto's smile got bigger. Being a seal master has its advantages. And with me getting the Kayubi free, that seal was easy to remove. She was too much in awe to say anything. She was free. Free from the curse of the caged bird. But she was also confused on what do to. Be but what do I do now? Now that you have released me, the Hayuga clan will hunt me to put it back on me. What can I do? She asked with a pleading tone. Naruto merely smiled back and slowly began to lean in, causing Hinata to blush more than she ever did before, at how close they were, only a few centimeters apart. She felt his arms encircle her once again, and the smile became on of deviousness. Why don't we worry about that later he spoke in a seductive whisper. And with those final words he closed he distance, leaving Hinata in sweet bliss, for having her long time dream come true for some time to come. While this certainly is an unexpected predicament, I must say Gentleman Kamei concluded as he watched the two lovebirds with a grin. He and the other cabinet members all watched the events, which transpired in the Emperor's chamber. How they did it. Kazuma was also among them, using one of his spheres to show what was happening. Many of the cabinet members couldn't help but smile at the fact that the Emperor may now have an Empress by his side, if she was to stay. By what they heard however, that may be the case. 
The Justice Minister Kisu Chasakup was not one of those smiling at the events. Isn't the Emperor going to be annoyed when he finds out about this? He didn't feel comfortable at watching their Emperor's private life. Kayubi however just gave him a pat on the back. You mean if he finds out the fact that he won't only made the demon fox grin more at the prospect. He always liked to get under blonde skin without Naruto knowing about it. Besides, he could be able to use this sentimental event to his advantage. His mind already began to work on ways to get at the blonde emperor. Who is young woman anyway? One of ministers asked. It was a good question, as none here knew of who Hinata was. Well, all except one. Kayubi would be the one to enlighten the cabinet. Hinata Hayuga is from Kanahagakur within fire country, as you are all aware they nodded their heads in reply, she is, well was, the heir of the Hayuga clan within the Hidden Leaf village, as you just heard. The clan was very influential due to their bloodline, the Byakugan. More on that later. Anyway, she was close to Naruto due to the fact of she being one of the few to hold no ill will of any kind towards him. In fact, as you can see she was in love with him from a very early age. Due to the fact Naruto has a fierce determination, it gave great admiration for her. The thing is she only finally confessed to Naruto of her love the day he had to leave, so this is a 7 year delay for those two to get together. One thing I can say for certain is that she has a kind heart, one that is rare as these centuries. At this explanation they now believe that she would be a great match to their emperor. An empress with a gentle nature beside the strong and determined emperor. A perfect match. Now all we have to do is make sure they do get together, Kamei stated. He gave Kayubi a questioning look, along with the other members, when they saw his laughing. Oh you don't have to do anything, it's all been sorted by those two young lovers already. I assure you the demon lord spoke as he went back to watching the show provided by the Ihe lord. The team from Kanoha had assembled themselves in front of the palace gates. Around them was a large group of samurai that looked to be the ones escorting them back to the border. Already they were wondering what the reactions of those in the village would be when they find out that the emperor of the west was their former demon vessel. Kakashi signed, he wasn't going to look forward to it. During their dismal night in the dungeons of the palace, they had the chance to think on what could have been if Naruto was not banished. Most probably in the same position, but they would have had allies to support their war, instead of being on their own in the world. What was interesting to them however was the fact Hinata never returned to them after being called out by the blonde. This left many of the group to speculate. Only when they were preparing to leave did she reappear. When asked where she was at for the night, the only reply they got was a deep blush from the Hayuga, who found the floor suddenly very interesting. This got several reactions. Kurenai smiled at seeing the small smile on the girl's face, Kiba at what she did, Sakura also blushed upon realizing what happened, Kakashi gave a perverted giggle, and Shino, well nothing on the surface. Kakashi surprisingly was the first to recover. Are we ready? He asked everyone. They nodded and were ready to move when a voice stopped them, telling them to wait. Turning around they saw the Kayubi in human form walking towards them. There has been a slight change in plan, I am to escort you to the border. The rest of you are to return to your original duties. The samurai saluted, then walked off back into the palace grounds. Kayubi turned to face the Kanoha ninjas, and gave them a cruel, sadistic, and demonic smile. This in turn caused the ninja to shiver in fear. They were defiantly weren't looking forward to the trip back home. Kayubi just chuckled at their reactions, as he just loved to mess with their heads, making them feel true terror. Shall we begin the journey to the border? He asked. Kakashi reluctantly nodded, and they all proceeded to walk to the city gates. Well, all but Hinata. Kurenai quickly noticed this and turned to the girl. What's wrong Hinata? She asked. This got everyone's attention, making the rest of the team turn to the shy Hayuga. Said girl was standing very still, her eyes overcast by her dark hair. I one swift motion her fists clenched. I'm not going back at this statement their eyes widened in disbelief. What? Kurenai asked in deep confusion. Hinata had that determined look in her eye. I'm staying here with Naruto-kun. I'm staying with the person I love. Miss Too Hide with a small smile watched in the distance the young emperor of the Western Empire show his new fiancé Hinata Hayuga the gardens outside the palace. He had never seen him smile as much as he did now, for the void in his heart had been filled. The old chief servant had joined the emperor when he had appeared in the east, only when he began to make his mark, taking a significant area in a small time. Their meeting was one of complete accident when the young boy entered the town where the old man had retired after his unsuccessful campaign, with the other members of the Bushido 7. Having met in the inn at the late afternoon, the two got chatting, and soon began to understand each other. Miss Tuhide Sonaka the old warrior whose dreams of peace were shattered, and Naruto Uzumaki Namikis the young general who sought to unite the western lands in the quest for peace. Miss Tuhide could not deny that he was affected by the young boy's charisma, and soon joined him as one of his many advisors. He became one of his most loyal men under his command, and after the war was rewarded with becoming his retainer within his new palace, taken from the Kyoto Shogun near the end of the Central Region campaign. Ever since he has managed the goings-on within the palace walls, and remains one of Naruto's closest confidants. His smile grew when he saw the two laugh, as Naruto wrapped his arms around Hinata and spun her around. Never before had he seen the young emperor so cheerful. 
He had always been serious ever since the Empire's founding, the burdens of leadership heavy on his shoulders. It seems now he had someone to share his life with in this world. It had been only a few days since the decisive decision on Hinata's part to stay with the Western Emperor, and accepted his hand in marriage. That decision had secured the line of the Namikas Emperors of the Western Empire, and the dynasty was born. It was in the old man's hopes that peace was finally secured within the majority of the continent. While things have certainly been interesting these last few days a voice behind him brought Mitsunade out of his thoughts. Turning around, he saw Kamei, the chief of staff of the Emperor's cabinet, gazing at the two young lovers. I do hope that this reacquainted love of theirs does not cause the Emperor to disregard his duties at this, the chief servant shook his head at the chief's attitude. Yet you were one of those who constantly pushed for his imperial majesty to find a wife, at this Kamei chuckled at the memory. When the empire was in its infancy, Kamei, along with several other members of the imperial court, tried to secure the line by getting Naruto to find essentially a girlfriend to marry. They tried the direct approach during one of the cabling meetings, handing him a petition to marry. Naruto however was not having it. He essentially told them, quite forcefully, he was going to marry someone who he knew when he was ready and would not be forced, pressured, or asked into doing so otherwise. Needless to say it was dropped soon after. Well I did what was necessary for the empire. I can see that I won't have to worry about the future of the imperial line. However I am worried that he will forget his duties as a ruler for the empire, especially since he does a lot of the written work personally. At this Mitsuhide side, he knew about Naruto's trust problems, and did admit to him that he was at times paranoid that were those out to get him, mainly those from the eastern part of the continent, that had grudges against him, his deceased mother and father. Let our young emperor enjoy his youth with his fiance. it is something we yearn to get back. To not let them enjoy their young lives would be hypocritical on our part, if we had a chance to get it back. The Emperor will not disregard his duties, he is too driven to do that. Currently he is just wishing to be with who he loves. The team from Konoha minus one member, accompanied by the nine-tailed demon fox, the Kyubi no Yuko, had finally made it the border of the Western Empire, after traveling on the open roads for a few days. While it had been a few days since their meeting with the Emperor, their old comrade Naruto Uzumaki, but they were still feeling down on not only failing to get the desperately needed alliance with the Emperor to aid them in this war, but also the loss of another childhood friend. Flashback, they could not believe what they just heard. Hinata Hayuga was staying with the Western Emperor, Naruto Uzumaki Namikis. But this was suicide because of what her father would try and do. But by the determined look in her eye they knew they weren't going to change her mind. I have nothing left in Konoha. I am hated by my family and by my father. My life would be that of servitude by a man whom I am forced to marry. Nothing is left there for me to come back to. Naruto Khan however has offered me to stay here, and has even proposed to me at this their eyes widened in disbelief, Kayubi however was grinning. All I ever truly wanted was to be with Naruto Khan, now I have that chance, and much more. I, I will not pass up this chance. Hanada, what do you think your father will do when he finds out about this? Kiba tried to reason with her. Well he wouldn't admit it, he did in fact want her to stay her with Naruto, so she would be safe, but he was afraid of what her father, Haishi Hayuga, would do when he found out, and what drastic action he would do to get her back. Shino however gave the answer. What can he do? He asked, being the voice of reason and logic like all Abiram did. They all turned to him for an explanation. As such he decided to clarify, even if he had the manpower to try and get her back, he knows that he would be risking not only war with Naruto, which if happened we would definitely not survive, but also risking the lose of his status in the council for bringing much more problems to Konoha. So she really has nothing to fear from him now. Kiba signed in satisfaction. Looks like she was safe. I admit, while Haishi may be overly arrogant, being the typical Hayuga, even he wouldn't dare try a move like that Shino finished. The Kyubi chuckled, catching their attention. If he tries anything I will personally rip him apart he spoke with a toothy grin. This threat made many of them shiver, primarily for the fact he could literally carry the threat. Hinata Kurenai started with a serious, yet motherly tone, are you sure you wish to do this? The Hayuga once more nodded her head. Hey, as I said, all my life I wanted to be with Naruto-kun. To tell him how I feel, to tell him that I love him. To marry him and be with him forever. Now I finally have that chance, and I won't let anyone, even my father, take that chance away. Kiba walked up to her, and wrapped his arms around her. Well, take care Hinata. But I will tell you now that if he hurts you in any way, I will come here and give him a good beating. Emperor or not Hinata couldn't help but giggle at her friend's antics, and returned the hug he gave. After he let go Sakura came up and put a hand on her shoulder. You take care of yourself Hinata. And make sure Naruto stays on the right track, Hinata nodded in reply, a few tears appearing in her eyes. Thank you all for being my friends. And thank you Kurenai, for caring and helping me so much. Her former sensei smiled as she gave a silent farewell to her favorite students. I hope you enjoy your stay here Hinata San Kayubi spoke. Hinata smiled back at the demon. Kakashi turned to the Kayubi, he nodded as he saw the look in the ninja's eye. Well I think it's best we get going he stated. 
And with that, they set off back to their home village, leaving Hinata behind to start a new, better life with her crush turned boyfriend, and soon to be husband. And flashback, now they were wondering about the reactions from the council when they find out about the identity of the emperor, and that the Kayubi is a free demon, one which could attack Kanoha at any time. Secretly they were hoping that they wouldn't do anything or overreact that it would cause grave consequences, as it would only cause Kanoha even more problems. But knowing the history between Naruto, Kayubi and the village, that would most likely not happen. They knew they would stand little chance at seeing many small forts containing provincial forces for the province, each containing trained samurai in the defense of the provincial capital or villages. On one particular occasion they saw a large wooden fort with several smaller forts close to the border in the eastern region, only a day's walk to the border patrols. Kayubi told them that the fort contained the 3rd Imperial Legion, which was at the standard strength of 100,000 men. Needless to say they were both shocked and scared at the force strength. How many of these legions did Naruto have under his command? While they traveled to their destination, there was an awkward silence, as they didn't know what to say or do around the nine-tailed demon in human form. They did wonder if Naruto played a sick joke on them with having him escort them for getting him confused with his former prisoner. But as they went on, the need to converse began to take hold, and thus they slowly began to open up to him. Asking him questions, both random and personal, and some of them soon began to have small conversations with him. Sakura was the first to have a long conversation talking about Naruto, and how he managed to stay sane all those years. Shino surprised everyone with how much talking he did with the demon lord of the Biju, primarily talking about logical and philosophical debates. Eventually near the end trip, Kayubi gave them an explanation of the reason why he attacked Kanoha, and told them briefly about Madara Chiha. He also warned them that although the Chiha was not as strong as he used to be, he could still level a hidden village with ease. To their utmost shock, he also spoke of the theory that he was not only a member of the Akatsuki, but also their true leader. With this knowledge they now saw them much more than a threat than they originally believed. He also, much to Kakashi's surprise, apologized for having his sensei killed. Kayubi in fact knew Minato long before he attacked Kanoha, during the Third Shinobi War. He stated that he had as much respect for Minato as he had for Naruto, and his death was one of his many regrets. Kakashi, now starting to see the Kayubi in a much different light, decided to try and let the past go, and began to act more civilized to the demon fox, even though it was hard to do at first because of their history. The others followed the Jonin's example, and soon their fear of the demon was near enough diminished. Now it was time for them to leave the demon and the Western Empire behind, and return to Kanoha for its defense. Before they left though, Kayubi handed Kakashi a red line scroll. Naruto asked for this to be delivered to the Hokage. It's for her eyes only. Kakashi nodded in understanding. It was most probably a warning from the Emperor to her. The same warning that he gave them. Now remember Naruto's warning, cause he will keep it. If any of your ninja are found in his lands, they will be killed on sight, regardless of the reason. He doesn't want this war to spill over to his lands, for he wants to protect him people. They look downcast at what he said. But I will tell you this. Naruto has been debating about helping Kanoha for some time. Ever since Shireya came and asked him first. So there may be a chance he will help, but I wouldn't put you hopes on it. The Nin group were deeply surprised about this. There was still a small glimmer of hope that Naruto would help Kanoha. But it would most probably need to be divine intervention in order him to do that. Well I think it's time we leave Kakashi spoke, and with that they crossed the border into bird country, so they could cross into fire country. Returning home to bring the grave news to the council, and the populace. Emperor Naruto of the West sat in a chair in his office looking over military charts and the status of the military legions, both formed and forming. Around him was the chief of staff Kamei, the minister of defense Yoshimoto, and the three generals of the current standing imperial legions. Shimazu of the first, Seiken Shima of the second, and Yukimura Sanada of the third. Seiken was a middle-aged man, looking gruff but firm, with a small mustache and a bald scalp, with short black hair on the sides and back of his head. Like Shimazu, he wore complete set samurai armor, wearing a jacket with the empire's insignia on the back over it. Yukimura was in contrast a young man, being in his mid-twenties. Clan-shaven he had medium black hair with a headband over his forehead and under his hair. He wore the standard general uniform of the other generals of the legions. Right, we need to introduce these new technological weapons to the legions currently created and up and coming Naruto essentially stated the reason why they were all in his office. Any ideas of the best way to incorporate them? It was Yashimoto, with his vast military experience who came up with the solution. Your Imperial Majesty, as you are aware we currently we have three legions, which all have a standing strength of 100,000 men. These are divided into 10 divisions of 1 10,000 men each. Each division is then divided into companies of a thousand. Here they are specialized into roles. The infantry, the cavalry, the artillery, the charioteer and the specialization companies. These companies are then divided into cohorts of 100 men each for easier mobilization during the battlefield, and add as a unit within the company. Due to the use of these new weapons, being primarily used by gunpowder, it is common sense to equip the artillery companies with these new gunpowder artillery pieces. 
As for things like grenades should go for the skirmishers in the infantry companies for now until they are produced in enough quantity that all infantry units can be equipped with them. What new artillery pieces have been constructed? Asked Sagan. Kamei pulled out a paper from his file of notes held under his arm. According to the report on the new weapons, we have some new powerful items at our disposal. The list is small, but the weapons are formidable. These are what are called cannons, firing large solid or hollow balls at the enemy. The hollow balls are filled with many small pellets that cause maximum damage to blocks of infantry, while the solid balls are good against defenses. Another new artillery weapon is modification of the ballista. The long-range weapon fires a single large bolt, instead of multiple bolts. Using gunpowder as a propellant, fires a single bolt over distances greater than what torsion can provide. The bolt tip is filled with a high explosive form of gunpowder, so when it lands, causes a wide range of damage in the impact zone. Also the new form of ballista fires twice the amount of arrows, this time using gunpowder as a propellant. Replacement of the torsion system allows for more arrows to be fired. Anyway these weapons will provide greater fire support for our infantry on the ground. What are the new legions, when will they be ready? Shimazu asked. The things go as planned, the 4th and 5th Imperial Legions will be ready in less than 2 months. The 6th, 7th and 8th Imperial Legions will be ready in 8 month time. When they are ready our forces, when properly mobilized will amount to 800,000 men in total, not including provincial defense forces Yashimoto replied. With that amount of men we can easily deal with the Siren Empire to the north. At this Naruto interjected. I would rather deal with the Siren Kingdom diplomatically than use force to subjugate them. Even if we conquer them, their religious zealously will make them a more trouble than they're worth, the young emperor argued. But we must deal with them somehow, two of our legions are in the north to keep them under control. The resources needed to keep them at bay are becoming too much, those two legions could be used elsewhere. If we get caught in a situation which require more than one legion in the time it takes to bring the other legions to full strength, then we could be in a serious situation long term, Yashimoto argued. It was here that the old warhawk believed war was the answer, as near enough always. The threats from the raiding parties have begun to increase due to the increase in numbers of the raids, and the increased frequency of which they come. It is my assumption, based on my past knowledge of these people, is that the increase of raiding parties in a forerunner to a full-scale assault. If that is to be the case, we will need both legions to drive them back Shimazu inputted with his pervious knowledge of the enemy. Also, if the Northern Alliance in the East also come to attack us, then we will have no combat strength to deal with any other threat that could come upon us. At this Naruto side. This argument was getting nowhere. Then let us hope they don't attack. Either way I will not commit the Empire's forces against our opponents when diplomacy could still be on the table. Yashimoto thought to press the matter, but decided not to at this time. As it was clear the Emperor had made his decision, he hoped that he was correct in his assumption. Anyway back to the matter at hand. Should we replace the current artillery units with these new ones, or should we just add them to the companies? The young Emperor asked. I think it would be best to replace the current artillery ones with the new and improved ones. If we have too much variety, then it would be harder to mass produce the necessary ammo for the artillery units. It would be best to have as few variants of artillery as possible to ease the need of supplies Seiken spoke, knowing that the sinews of war were as important as the warriors fighting on the front lines. I agree, the torsion ballista would now be useless now to use of the gun-powdered variants. There is no need to use outdated equipment, Yashimoto believed it to be the best course in the long term. How many of these new weapons do we have? Asked Yukumar, worried about the need of supply. I mean, it's all well and good to replace what we have now, but do we have enough to do a full replacement of artillery equipment? Unfortunately we only have enough of these new weapons to currently be able to fully equip one fully supplied legion. Given the next month however, supply will pick up to allow others to be equipped as well. These will include the two legions up and coming. Khmer reported, looking at the figures on the paper. Give the 3rd Imperial Legion priority of supply. If we need to get involved in a conflict, I would like the Free Legion to be fully ready if the time comes. If the Siren Kingdom does decide it to go to war, then you have my permission to go on to the offense of Shimazu and Seiken. Naruto ordered, ending any discussion before it started. His will be done. Hinata sighed in content as she gazed over the balcony overlooking the capital city. It had been several days since she decided to stay her with the one she loved more than anything on this earth. She wore a beautifully embroidered golden kimono that wrapped itself graciously around her figure, and on her finger was a golden ring, symbolizing her engagement to the one she holds close to her heart. Her marriage was to be in a few months, and she couldn't wait. Finally her biggest dream had come true. She couldn't help but gaze over at the streets, which she observed in the silent evening. She looked at the peace and tranquility that was bestowed by her fiancé's hard work into unifying the land, rewarding the people with peace never seen in centuries. One thing that caught her interest was a child being cuddled by her mother, having fallen and scraped her knee, while the father watched with a smile as he knelt down beside them. This sight made her think about her future with her husband-to-be. Did she want a family? Her hand unconsciously moved to her stomach, and began to think of what could be. 
She smiled. If they did have child it would bring them even closer than they are now. This was something she would have to consult with him. You seem quite calm your highness. I hope that your stay here has been to your satisfaction an old voice spoke out. Turning around she was met with the smiling chief servant Mitsuhide. She couldn't help but smile back at the old man's friendly demeanor. Everything's been perfect Mitsuhide. These last few days have been some of the best in my whole life she looked at her engagement ring, especially since my dream has come true. Mitsuhide noticed the direction of the gaze, and couldn't help but chuckle. You are very lucky, many girls wanted to have the emperor's hand in marriage, so I would be careful when facing the fangirls at this Hinata shivered at the prospect. She couldn't help but remember the academy days with Sasuke and his fangirls. It was never pretty. And again, after one essentially does the impossible and unites a continent that was engulfed in war for centuries, one will get many admirers. At this Hinata couldn't help be curious. How did Naruto Khan unite such a large portion of this land and in such a short time? Mitsuhide gave a hearty laugh. Through political maneuvering, military conquest, use of charisma, and fear. After Naruto first made his appearance after defeating Nobunaga Oda in the East, many lords were uninterested in him, merely calling his the East in full. He soon however made his mark after consolidating his position. Making alliances with two lords near his location, he launched two attacks simultaneously against the other warlords. He led one such attack himself, the other led by the old general Shimazu, who joined Naruto shortly after his rise to power. While he began history of Naruto's rise to power, Hinata sat down on one of the chairs to listen intently to her lover's rise to become one of the great rulers of the continent. It was a gamble, facing two foes at once, but it was Kaiubi who essentially granted him victory here. Both warlords were killed and he was the most powerful lord in the region. One of the two allies found him to be a threat, and so attempted to assassinate him. It failed and found out who they took orders from. His reply to this attempt on his life was that he took revenge by taking over his territory. The other ally found it more beneficial to join him upon seeing how quickly he gathered power, and thus became his vassal. With these territories around his base security he prepared a campaign to take over what is now the eastern region. He didn't use military force however, he played the warlords against one another. He did this quite cleverly, but simply. He had some of his men dress up the soldiers of the opposing warlords, and they committed raids of military structures and posts. The warlords who were of a hot-headed kind, thus fell for the ploy, and began to attack those who they thought instigated the attacks. As such they went to war with one another, while the emperor's forces remained unattached to the war. By the end of their conflict, their forces were heavily diminished by the constant battles. As such by playing one force against another it was easy for the emperor to take them over quickly. With that he had the largest land mass due to all the other smaller warlords and daimyo, only controlling small pieces of territory, due to being so many of them. By taking over a whole region the emperor held significant power in the region surrounding what was now his growing empire. The fact he did this in just over six months caused man to reconsider how much of a threat his imperial majesty was now. No longer was the eastern full looked down on by the other lords and rulers. The fact he now held great power caused many to try and take him out before he could consolidate his position. A first alliance of several daimyo and many warlords stood opposed to him. By the time they gathered a sufficient force to mobilize against the would-be emperor, he had managed to gather his own force to deal with this coalition. While their forces were of near equal size, the coalition was soon to collapse after the crushing defeat on the fields of Yumigawa. The emperor used a combination of speed and mobility over the static forces, which was the tactic of the alliance. After picking off groups of soldiers with hit-and-run tactics, they were forced to move to a prepared ambush site. When lured to the location, the main body of the emperor's army smashed into the main bulk of the enemy force. When hit by the ambush, for opposing forces soon crumbled. Many of the daimyo involved panicked and fled with the remainder of their forces. Their army weakened, the remaining coalition members stood no chance. It was at this point Kaiubi made his mark on the battlefield. Appearing at the location of their main camp, he killed many of the warlords and their bodyguards in one swift move. It was here that the battle was concluded. After their defeat, their lands were quickly taken over. The daimyos that managed to escape surrendered, and saw his imperial majesty as their new lord. Due to this they were allowed to keep their lands, and thus became vassals so to speak. After this, the only coalition to prove to a threat to the Emperor again would be the coalition at the Battle of Nashijiro. Hinata was in awe at what Naruto was capable of, and how his campaign started with such speed. She believed that if he was given the chance all them years ago, Kanoha would most probably stand a good chance of survivability. Before the head servant of the palace could continue his story however, the door behind them opened. Turning to see who entered, the chief servant bowed as the Emperor made his appearance. Is it the story of our campaign I'm hearing? Naruto asked with a smirk. At this Miss Tuhide raised his head, a smile on his face. Her Highness was wanting to know how your Imperial Majesty was able to unite the countries of the continent. Naruto walked over to Hinata, wrapping an arm around her and pulling her close. Hinata blushed as he gave her a quick kiss on the lips, a smile appearing on his face at how cute his girlfriend looked. Well if you're interested I can tell you all about it. All you had to do was ask. 
Takashi and the rest of the team stood at attention, knowing to look smart in the presence of the council and the Hokage within the Hokage mansion. But to the shock of them, the daimyo was present in the meeting as well, accompanied by his honor guard. He was most probably there in the hopes that the Empire would come and save Hai no Kuni. Tsunade gaze was upon them, her face devoid of any emotion. She had to put her heart away and do what was necessary to protect Kanoha. Judging by the expressions on their faces, it wasn't going to be good, but she what she also noticed was that Hinata was NT with them. Something was going on, and she didn't like it. A port. She ordered, hoping for the best. Giving a sign, Kakashi began his debrief. Okutsama, I'm afraid the mission was a failure. The Emperor of the Western Empire refused to ally himself with us for this war. His reasons included the protection of his people by not getting involved in a war that isn't his to worry about. Kakashi spoke in a calm and collective tone as he possibly could. Many on the council looked to be in uproar. But there is more at this they quieted down before they could make any real noise. The Emperor of the West is a former member of this village. This got the entire council on their feet. Even Tsunade looked shocked. The Emperor was from Kanoha. But, it was he. Demanded one of the council members. Whoever it was most probably held a grudge against their former home, which could only explain why they didn't join. Dakakashi sighed, ready to deliver the bombshell. The Emperor of the Western Empire is Naruto Uzumaki. Silence filled the chamber, every member of the council, both civilian and shinobi, looked at the jonin with shock, disbelief, and fear. And Naruto Uzumaki Tsunade was never so unnerved in her life. She suddenly had a flashback to when she berated Naruto for what he did to Sasuke, and the hurt-filled look on his face when she banished him. It was a big regret that she still wanted to correct. But now Naruto was the Emperor of the West. Sasuke on his part was both shocked and happy that his former teammate who was now at the head of a major power. But he was also saddened that it came to this, he must really hate Kanoha now, not to even send some men for aid. But after what both he and the Hidden Leaf Village had done, he had every right to. It seems in the long term, Naruto had far succeeded him. Why you sure I it was him? Chaz asked. If it was him, then they were in deep trouble. Yes, we met him and saw him with our own eyes. He in fact wasn't too happy by our appearance. He wanted to give you all a message, if any Kanoha ninja are found in his lands, they will be killed on sight, regardless of the reason. At this the council was to be in an uproar. In that instant the room was divided. One side wanted to deal with the empire diplomatically, fearing a confrontation if left unchecked. This was born from the fear of Naruto wishing retribution regardless. The other side wanted to completely leave the empire alone and heed the emperor's warning. Cut all ties and never attempt to communicate with the empire again, fearing rightly that they could anger the blonde at their presence and bring it upon the village. Well it seems the young Uzumaki is now the most power ruler on the continent. It's a pity, I was hoping for an alliance to survive. It seems we will fight this war alone. The Lord of the Land of Fire Muse, deeply disappointed at the fact that their greatest hope to survive had been dashed. He thought that if he personally asked for his help instead, and perhaps inform him that he helped him survive Kanoha Wrath, then perhaps he could reconsider. After Tsunade shouted for the council to be quiet, Danzo was the first of the council to make his voice heard by all other members. While it seems that the final nail has been brought to our coffin he muse, he will most probably plan his own invasion of Kanoha if he wished, thus is now the power he possesses. As such, it may be best that we somehow deal with the Emperor in some form or another. While it may be highly risky, if all else fails, then the need to eliminate him may be the final option for us. If we fail to try and appease him, several civilian councilmen agreed to this. At this Kakashi spoke up to the council. Naruto will not attack Kanoha, as said he feels he should not get involved in this war. Essentially, if we do nothing, then he won't come for us. How do we know what he said is true? Hiashi asked the Jonin, for all we know he could want us to believe he would not attack us, then he plans for an invasion. After all, surely he would hold a grudge to us for what he did to him in the past. It is a wonder if he would seek revenge. But even so we have no military force to deal with the Empire. All our resources are currently dealing with the war with the Northern Alliance. As such, to try and fight a possible war on two fronts would be disastrous. I say we heed this warning and don't tempt the Western Dragon Inachi argued. At this several other members nodded their heads in agreement. Seeing this now I really think it would have been best to put that demon down when we had the chance. Now we may now have to deal with the second war. The third hookage was too soft on that thing. No once again its shadow looms over us once more. As such I think we should find a way to deal with this threat personally Tsum spoke out. How she hated Naruto, thinking him to be the beast itself. Then again, due to her lack of knowledge on seals, it was an easy mistake to make. Now this hatred had turned to fear of retaliation. At this Kiba was shaking with rage. He remembered all the hate she used to spur when taking about the blonde, and how he used to, like a loyal son to an infallible mother, believed everything she spoke about. However upon seeing Naruto and the Kayubi with his own eyes, he realized how stupid he was. Now he was determined to correct those mistakes. Oh for God's sake shut up mom. Everyone turned to Kiba, who looked extremely angry with his mother. You are the reason he hates us, we all are. But do you think we stand a chance against an empire? 
Have some sense. Your hatred would bring down this village and kill your soul. He roared. Soon was shocked at her son's outburst. He was defending the demon. He is right soon aid intervened. He is at the head of a country which takes over far more than even half the size of the continent. The eastern continents combined would not compare to their size. Attacking him now, with other enemies against us would be suicide. I've seen his forces in action, and I admit it wasn't pretty everyone turned to the new voice in the room, a white-haired man who suddenly appeared in the chambers. Yuri of the Hulkage whispered, she hadn't seen him after Naruto exile. The Sanin continued on his own debrief unhindered. His forces are both well-equipped, trained and organized. If he wanted to launch an invasion of the East countries, there is a high chance he would actually succeed. He has a large variety of troop types to combat all situations, and his own ninja easily rival our own. But Naruto has a greater weapon than that. What weapon Jureyu-san? The elderly Kahari asked, concerned deeply for the fact they were essentially powerless to do anything. Loyalty he replied, that is their weapon. They would all gladly give their lives for the boy, it is their way of repaying them for the freedom he granted them. Freedom from the chaos of war. They now know a peace that was never experienced on the major part of the continent. They now see Naruto as their savior and would gladly fight for him, kill for him. Give their lives for him. Then it would be best for us not to involve ourselves with the empire and heed the emperor's warning. It would be our best bet. Since we are already in one war, to provoke another would definitely end the land of fire Sosk spoke, essentially spelling out to the council what needed to be done. While they did not like the fact of being powerless, it was the logical and sensible thing to do, and thus many with a grumble, conceded. As this took place, Kakashi began walking towards the Hokage, he reached for his pocket, and pulled out a scroll. The Emperor wanted me to give you this Hokage-sama. Tsunade took it from his hand, and was about to open it. Where is Hinata? Hiyashi asked, his look one of displeasure. Before Kakashi could reply, Kiba cut in. She's with Naruto now, and she no longer has the branch mark, and there is nothing you can do about it. However it's funny you only just realize, must show how much you don't care about her. At this the council were mortified, the Byakugan is in the hands of another. Then we will retrieve her. One less experienced member of the council. He was however quickly shot down by the older members. He actually tried to keep himself under control, since this was essentially the worst case scenario had come to pass for the clan. Not only had he lost a member who possessed the bloodline, and apparently no longer sealed as well. But he also lost any political influence he could have possessed. You will do no such thing. Tsunade replied in rage, it will cause war with the empire. I will not allow you to jeopardize this village's safety any more than what has already happened. You must agree though Hokage-sama, we cannot let the Byakugan fall into the hands of another without it having at least some control over the matter. Even so, the fact that the Byakugan is out of our hands, could prove deadly in future, even so we could try and use this to our advantage. If we can to Hinata, then perhaps we can manipulate her to get to Naruto one of the elders, Kaharu argued. Before she could reply, a demonic aura was felt in the chambers, when that was very familiar to the adults of the room. The daimyo was ready to speak about this situation, but was cut off by a voice of old. I don't think that is a good idea, especially when trying to deal against a superior foe. Suddenly the scroll that Swan held burst into flames. She yelled in pain and let it drop to the floor. The flames grew bigger and bigger, a form began to take shape. Suddenly the aura was recognized by the older people in the group, and were in terror at what was here, in this chamber. The form was that of a large red fox, complete with nine tails, before taking a human form. Sauce was the first to gain his voice, realizing him it was that caused all the adults to tremble in fear. Kayubi, the fox merely grinned cruelly back at the scared spectators of his dramatic appearance. All was quiet on the border fort in the Western Empire, one of the many forts that protected its boundaries against the east. The guards were both relaxed and alert, not expecting any form of attack. It was in fact time for the changeover of the guards, so some could rest, and let the others take their place. It was here the forts were most vulnerable. They were complacent and overconfident. They believed that no one would attack an outsized empire. So they went completely unprepared when an unknown force suddenly attacked them. The border forces tried to put up a fight, grabbing their weapons and sounding the alarms to alert the rest of the Ashigar soldiers in the fort, but the surprise attack took them completely off guard, and they fell one by one. Soon the fort was ablaze, burning the dead and wounded within. The attack moved like lightning, and hit like solid stone, only lasting just over 15 minutes, caused by this experienced foe. Soon an army from the east began to march unopposed past the burning foe, hell-bent on taking on the empire for personal gain, hoping to move with speed to end the war quickly, by striking deep into the heart of the great nation. The cheers of victory were filled in the air, they now believed that nothing would stop them now. Similar attacks on forts took place all along the central border, and the army moved across. Unfortunately for those responsible for the attack, the sentinels were on alert, and saw it all from beginning to end. The violent knock on the emperor's chamber was hard, Naruto on his part was irritated for the fact his time with his fiancée was interrupted. But a last duty called. This won't take long, he told Hinata, who smiled patiently in response. Naruto turned to the door. Come in. 
the knocker was I hey Lord Kazuma. His stance told the young emperor that whatever he wanted to see him about, it was serious. What is the meaning of this interruption Kazuma-sen? He tried to keep his voice calm. His irritation was lost when he saw that his sentinel leader spoke in tone never as serious as it was before. Your imperial majesty, my sentinels report that several border forts on the eastern border were attacked and destroyed. An army from the east has also appeared crossing the border, which has been penetrated Naruto jumped up, shock and disbelief on his face. Hinata gasped in shock, putting a hand to her mouth. The emperor's shock turned to rage, whoever did this, was going to pay. Who was responsible? He gritted out in rage. Kazuma summoned his sphere to show his majesty. As he watched, Naruto couldn't believe it, he had the guts to attack him. He watched as the forts were burned to the ground, and an army began to march over the border. Watching this he could help you feel stupid at the fact he felt invisible and complacent to thinking that the east would not attack the empire. Seeing this however brought home to him that war was now on the table, he would now have to involve himself in this war. The forces were of ninja and samurai, and they had the symbol of the stone on their headband. It was a wakagur. It was the land of earth. No one dared to move in the council chambers, too scared to move in fact, for the demonic killing intent was overwhelming. The civilian members were literally cowering under their desks, while the shinobi were rooted into place. The Sanin, Jairi and Sunade were trying to keep calm at the feeling being enveloped around the room. The Daimyo too was rooted into place, he guards trying to make a barrier to protect him, but also frozen stiff. Standing in front of them all was the Kaiyubi, now in human form, grinning at them all, enjoying their discomfort. All in the room were either deeply unnerved or downright scared by the appearance of the nine-tailed demon fox, the same fox that attacked this village nearly twenty years ago. While it seems the arrogance of Kano has still exists Kayubi taunted. How pathetic, you consider yourselves to be the greatest of all the five shinobi villages, yet now you find yourselves alone and needing help from others to survive. Pitiful isn't it, that the mighty have fallen. After saying that the killing intent ceased, allowing the room's inhabitants to finally breathe and move, the demon fox turned to the daimyo, and surprisingly gave a respectful bow, much to the confusion of the council. The daimyo, not wanting to get on the demon's bad side, bowed in return. W what are you doing here? What happened to the seal? Anachi finally stuttered out, trying to collect himself from essentially experiencing hell. The demon turned to him, and smiled his demonic grin, causing the Yamanaka head to pale slightly. Naruto released me of his own free will after learning its mechanics. The reason for that is that myself and him get along very well together Kayubi stressed the words. The council's eyes widened at this revelation. Tsunade however looked unconvinced. Why would he release you, demon? One who was the cause of his pain all his life? She asked in a cold tone. She hoped he had not just sent Kayubi here to finish the job 19 years ago. Kayubi however just laughed at the hookage's arrogance. Why should I reply to someone who betrayed his trust? You say it was me who caused his pain, but it was you who made the decision to make his life a misery. The fifth hookage flinched at the statement made, knowing it to be true. After that retort he turned to face the council, who had by now had recovered from his killing intent. Danzo, in his dark vision of Kanoha, finally saw his chance to seize power once and for all. You fool Kayubi, by coming here you have become my unwilling slave. Now submit to me and to my grand vision. He spoke with triumph as he stood up and pulled at his head bandage, and to the horror of those in the room, his hidden eye revealed the infamous Shuringen. At seeing this Sasuke stood up in rage. How do you have the Shuringen? Danzo gave a small smile in response. How he wanted to get under the last loyal at Shuha's skin. Kayubi growled at seeing this. Despicable. You have no respect for the dead. Sasuke roared in hatred as he leapt from his chair to charge at the old warhawk. Danzo easily knocked him down, his drawn sword at his throat. Tsunade tried to regain control. Danzo, what is the meaning of this? Danzo turned to her. Your reign ends today woman. I will make take over Kanoha and will rise to become the greatest empire on this continent. Once I win this war, the empire will be next he gloated. The daimyo was now deeply concerned by the turn of events. He did not need the empire on his back if this man got what he wanted. I will not let you do that Danzo-sen. You will find this village's budget cut if you declare war on the western empire. Danzo however was not phased at this threat. His dreams were now, in his mind, close to reality. He would not let the ruler of fire country stand in his way. My lord, with the Kayubi at my beck and call, Kanoha will rise to great heights never seen before. With this fire country will also rise to greatness. Is that not what you want my lord? The Demio shook his head in reply. I will not anger the emperor of the west who essentially could control the whole continent. Even with the demon fox under your command, this is a fool's errand. Again I must ask that you stop this at once. Danzo looked displeased at this, it seems he would not receive any aid from the Lord of Fire. The old fool. Then my lord, you will have to go too I'm afraid, at this threat the guards went between them. Tsunade was not having this. Like Sosk she charged him. Danzo swung his blade, going through Tsunade at an angle. She fell, not gravely injured, but incapacitated. Jiriya went to his teammate's aid. Hokitsama. Anbu came down surrounding the old man. 
However, with a signal, his brute force appeared all around the council chamber. They also appeared around the council members, their swords at their throats. When I have control of the Kaiubi, you all have the choice of either joining me for my grand vision, or fall before the winds of change. Soon Kanoha will dominate its enemies, and it will become the greatest nation on earth. Even greater than the Western Empire. Danzo's patriotic rant was stopped however he soon stopped when he heard laughter. Turning to the source, he found it to be the demon lord who was laughing, seemingly finding this situation hilarious. To Danzo's confusion, the laughter died down, and the demon was smiling directly at him. Emphasized the word of old man he gloated. Angered, he roared at the demon. You will do as I say. He tried to put a Jinjutsu onto him, in an attempt to control the demon lord. At this however demon laughed once more. Pitiful fool he raised his gloved hand, in which marking on the backhand of the glove were glowing. You have to control over me. At this Danzo's eyes widened in shock. How could this be? This shock however soon turned to horror. The demon lord extended his hand towards the old hands, and a force was sent he way. In a reflexive move he brought his armored arm in an attempt to block the attack. The blast forced him of his feet, and the armor around his arm shattered to peace, and to the horror of the denizens of the chamber, revealed to all of them his dark secret. His arm Kiba muttered in shock. His arm contained the Sharingans of all the deceased members of the Ichiha clan. It was oblivious to the members of the council that Danzo had not taken just one eye, but all of them. Kayubi growled in annoyance. You really do discuss me old man, I guess I'm going to have to rid this world of your filth. Before he could react he felt another strong, invisible force. This time it pushed him to the wall, hitting it with a force to cause him to be in a daze. Now witness my power mortals, the demon lord growled before them. In one motion he raised his hand high and clicked his fingers, fire igniting from the spark caused by energy within. In a sudden surge fire engulfed the entire rude Anbu that were within the chamber. Their screams of anguish could be heard far beyond the walls of the chamber within the mansion, as they attempted in vain to put out the shearing hot flames engulfing their bodies. Within seconds they collapsed to the ground, the flames extinguished, leaving charred remains behind. Kayubi blew on his fingers in a dramatic motion, acting as if his fingers were hot, in a gesture of mockery to Danzo, who was staring in absolute terror at the power that he attempted to tame. Kayubi grinned manically at the old man. It's as they say Danzo, play with fire, and you will get burned. Now it's time to end this summoning a flaming whip in his hands, and wielded it to be used against the old man. The end of the burning whip wraps around Danzo's neck, shearing his skin and causing screams of anguish. But the forceful tug he pulled Danzo using the whip, forcing the old man from his feet and into the air, and into the path directly in front of the demon fox. With the whip dispersed from his hands, he grabbed Danzo, still flying through the air with a clawed hand that grasped the burnt throat of the old counselor. Danzo tried in vain to release himself from the iron grip of the Nine Tails hand. No, he refused to fall here, not when he though all he wanted was in his grasp, so close to victory. Once again he tried to look into the red eyes of the demon, once again trying to control the power of the Buji, using the stolen bloodline of the Ichiha. However his Shuringen once more had no effect. Kayubi saw this and decided to end this problem once and for all. With a roar his hand glowed red. With a scream Danzo erupted in flames. It was to last only a few seconds, as he was quickly incinerated. The few ashes that remained flew from his hand and scattered across the council chamber. Nothing remained of the old war hawk of the village hidden in the leaves, only the smell of burnt flesh was to remain. Silence now filled the room, everyone trying to get to grips with the events that just transpired. Danzo was dead, having shown that he had the shurikens of those who had died during the Chiha massacre. His rude Anbu were also dead, burned to a cinder upon the floor. Sakura had moved to her master's side to heal her wounds. Tsunade and Jairi only watched in awe at how easy Danzo, a verder ninja, had been handled by the Kayubi no Yuko. The council didn't know whether to be revealed at being saved, or be fearing the might of the demon fox standing in the room. The Demio was only one of the room's inhabitants to have a smile on his face. Thank you Kayubi Dono for your efforts to deal with this traitor Kayubi merely smiled in response. Now, where were we? He mused, before he remembered what he was going to say before the interruption. Ah yes, now I remember, his face turned serious upon looking at the council. I will make this very clear for you, so listen up. I hate repeating myself. Young Naruto does not like the fact that you just think you can ask for his aid and think you will get it, he also do not like the fact you don't think that the past can be ignored. He will not tolerate your presence in his lands, as Kakashi here told you. Any one of your ninja found in the empire will be killed on sight. He turned to Hiyashi with cold eyes. As for you Hiyashi Hayuga, I have a warning of my own to give to you personally. If you try anything with Hinata, Hayuga team, I will personally hunt you down and kill you. She is with Naruto now and now she no longer has your pathetic branch seal anymore, she's a free bird now. Understand me. He spoke with a clearly threatening tone, his glare going right through the Hayuga head. Hiyashi on his part had to swallow his pride and take the blow, trying to keep his anger in check. Lest he wanted to end up like the now deceased old counselor. Kayubi smiled, knowing he wouldn't retort. His life was worth more than his pride. 
he suddenly noticed the toad standing amongst the residents of the chamber. Ah, Juri, it's good to see you again. Did you enjoy your stay in the Empire? The Sanin nodded. Yes, it was quite interesting to see the rest of the continent to west. I have to say it's not that different from our culture here in the east. I will say there is quite some rural areas down in the southern region. Kayubi smiled. But, as the threat also applies to you. Nothing personal of course Shiryu frowned. Then again he should have realized being a ninja of Kanoha, he would have to take the fall, along with the rest of the Hidden Leaf Village. As such he resigned to the fact that the past had caught up with them all. Kayubi was not finished with them yet however. I have to ask Sunade, when you informed all of this village's inhabitants of Naruto's burden, did you mean to inform them of his heritage also, or did you neglect to tell them this piece of information? It was the Hukich who was put on the spot, and her silence was to be her answer. That was all the demon needed to know. Typical. You have to tell them all one thing, but keep the other in the dark. I'm not surprised he hates you all with the way you even now continue to treat him. At this the council went in a roar. Now hold on here Kayubi, his heritage is one thing which must be kept secret. Humura shouted. Why? It was a simple question, but the answer in fact eluded them. The Kayubi knew exactly the reason why they refused, even now to reveal his parentage. Since you cannot say, I will tell you. The reason why even now you refuse to tell this village of Naruto's parentage, is because you all knew what it would entail. If word got out that the son of this village's greatest hero was abused and mistreated, then the consequences would be far-reaching. After all, the fourth Hokage had many friends in many neutral countries. The reality of this situation dawned on them. Their pride and arrogance had brought them to the worst possible situation. Now they had to pay the consequences. But suddenly they realized something. Tsunade was to voice their fears. Wait, Kayubi, don't tell me that you're going Kayubi grinned in response. Well if you're not going to, then I will. The demon burst into flames, blinding the mortals in the room. With a roar he rushed upwards and burst out of the room, out of the mansion, and appeared, in his full, nine tails form, towering over the whole village. If his appearance did not get everyone's attention, then his deafening roar surely did. Panic ensured around the whole village. The demon had returned to finish the job. Ninja of all ranks began an attempt to surround the towering monster, while the villagers tried to get away from the demon and into the safe areas of the village. With another roar he addressed the village as a whole. Yumi Kanahagikur, village hidden in the leaves, I have returned. After 19 years of being imprisoned and of travel, I have come to deliver a message from my former vessel. At this both ninja and villager alike looked up at the demon in confusion. By now the inhabitants of the chamber had rushed out to join the event, in case of fight against the monster. Tsunade had to be helped by her teammate, even though most of her wounds were healed, she still was partly incapacitated. He warns you that the past is still in his mind. He still remembers the glares, the threats, the beatings. All because you foolishly believed that I was the boy you so foolishly mistreated in the most terrible ways you kind you could do to a child. For my actions, you condemned my vessel, a vessel who was loyal to your village, till you drove him from his home. Now you will suffer for your actions. Kayubi ranted on to a scared populace. The inhabitants of the village could not believe their ears. The boy was not the demon. Had their hatred blinded them to the truth. Suddenly many began to slowly feel the emotion of regret for their past actions. The sudden realization of their sins to a child made them feel tainted by their acts of wrath. However when the demon fox said that they would pay for their actions, it made them fearful of what it would do to them. I will not kill you mortals. I will let you live knowing that you have let your deceased loved ones down for dishonoring their sacrifices. Furthermore, I will let you live knowing that you condemned the son of your greatest hero to a hate-filled life. At this the villagers wondered what the demon lord was talking about, while the council looked on, powerless to stop the flow of information about to surge. The council has kept you the dark to the truth, had put a blindfold to the fact that Naruto Uzumaki, vessel of yours truly was also the son of Minato Namikaze, the fourth Hokage. At this revelation the people of Kano had nearly recoiled in horror, a collective gasp was heard throughout the village. Ninja and villager alike. The daimyo shook his head. He knew that Naruto was the son of Minato. That was why he saved him from the council upon Jiriya's request. He never asked for the council to reveal Naruto's heritage, as he felt it was their responsibility not his. Upon having it revealed like this, it would create dire consequences for the future. As I said I will not destroy your pitiful village. No, I will leave in your disgrace for your disregard of your past heroes. In fact, looking at your monument, you shouldn't have one on there for the fact you do not deserve him. You take your heroes for granted, when they have a final wish, you do not heed it. So I will tell you now that your disregard of your heroes will not be take. With that he flung one of his tails towards the monument, more specifically, the head of the fourth Hokage. His red tail clashed with the stone, smashing it apart with great force. The blocks from the stone had crashed down into the village buildings below. People below screamed, trying to get away from the falling debris. Will the chaos ensure, Kayubi spoke on last time. Let this hold in your monument be a reminder for your failures, and your arrogance. Now you stand alone, hated in a world you're spurred and angered. If you survive you will never rise to greatness. This is the end for you all. 
The cries of the past have now caught up with you, and now you reap what you sow. See and how foolish mortals. With that he once more burst into flames, the heat caused those near him to recoil due to the heat. In a few seconds, the flames dispersed. Kayubi had disappeared, leaving a shaken hidden leaf village, a broken monument and a stiff council in his wake. The earth daimyo sat within his luxurious palace, up upon his throne, smiling at the current turn of events, which transpired in the last 24 hours. The invasion of the Western Empire has gone a lot easier than previously thought. It had only been a day since the army sent to expand the lands of Earth Country, had broken thought the border, setting up camp and preparing to the drive deep into the Empire's central point, thus end the war quickly. The daimyo of Earth had good reason to be confident of success. The war with Fire Country, even though surprisingly it had not properly escalated into armed conflict, the war was near enough one. Hainokuni was alone against Earth, Sound, Lightning and several other smaller countries. He had no real reason to fear that the sheer numbers of the Northern Alliance would easily decimate the single country, which was originally the strongest nation in the elemental plane. Earth was not alone in its attack on the Empire to the west, as two more countries that bordered on the lands of the Empire, joined the conflict on the condition that they gained some land of their own. As such the combined forces of half the Alliance were now poised to take down the Empire. It is common belief that by taking the capital of a nation, regardless of its size, the sheer loss of moral at the loss of the heart of a nation, should cause for the Empire to surrender. Such, the target of this campaign was Kyoto, the Empire's capital. At least that was the plan. But there was another reason for Earth Country to strike at the Empire. Alliance spies that operated within the neutral countries, found that a team of Kanahagakur was seen entering and then a week later leaving the Empire borders. It would seem to the members of the Alliance were in a sense worried that Kanoha, on behalf of the Fire Daimyo to try and bring an essential superpower into the conflict. As it was hard to determine whether or not the Emperor of the Empire had indeed agreed to an alliance. If this was the case, the balance of power could quickly shift. The Earth Daimyo did not want to take the chance of waiting and seeing what could happen. Taking matters into his own hands he decided to strike first. The hope was to deal a blow, by taking the Kyoto capital, which in his belief would force the empire to surrender, and gain a great deal of land in the process. If the gamble succeeded, then not only would the threat of the empire be neutralized and stop it becoming even more powerful. After this plan to deal with the empire was done, then Fire Country would surely be alone. But again this had even further implications going further than the Alliance. If he was able to take a great deal of land from the Empire, then he would easily be the most powerful of the Daimyo in the elemental countries, and the land of Earth would become an Empire in its own. After this came to fruition, he would be able to conquer the other elemental nations, making him the most powerful, if the only ruler of the continent. The Daimyo smiled, oh he could almost taste the power that was within his grasp. He hoped that this war with the Empire would be a quick one. This would show the continent the might of Tsuchi no Kuni. His thoughts were interrupted when a knock on the doors to the chamber. Shouting for whomever it was to enter, a servant wearing a kimono appeared before the feudal lord. He bowed before him. My lord, the Tsuchikijin general Kodamayo are here to see you he spoke, explaining why he was here. The old lord of earth country grinned. Excellent, bring them in. With a bold the servant left the room. A few moments later, two men walked into the room. One was the third Tsuchikij, the small old man Inoki. Despite being an old man, he was a formidable fighter, thus being a cage. He was a deeply patriotic figure, and served his daimyo with complete loyalty. The second was a young tall male wearing blue samurai armor. He had short orange hair, and his posture was one of confidence, perhaps arrogance. Kodamayo was the son of a noble who was high in the court of the earth daimyo. Being of high-born status he was highly educated, and was known for having a keen eye for tactics, and this soon led to the young man being head of earth country's military. The daimyo was slightly worried about the young Redit's ambitions, but for this operation, his was the best man to lead the operations against the empire. Both men appeared before their lord, before both falling to one knee. My lord, we are here as you requested Kodamayu proudly spoke. Indeed. Tell me, how goes the operation? The lord of earth was surely confident that with commanders like these two he was sure of victory. At this Inoki gave a small chuckle. My lord it was easy to break through the border forts, the garrisons were weak and broke the moment they were attacked. If this is the strength of the empire, then it was surely overestimated. Tell me, what is your strategy for winning this war? He already knew the basics, striking the heart of the empire, its capital. But he was keen to know what other details were involved in this operation. At this Kodamaya spoke up. My lord we plan to strike hard and fast. Since we just got into the empire's lands we have built a temporary base of operations. We plan to launch a direct attack onto the empire's capital of Kyoto. As such, we plan to travel light, so artillery will not be used, as it would slow us down. Scouts have reported back that there are many small pockets of defense forces all around the provinces, that makes up the Empire's defense forces. However the main forces have not been sighted, so we must advance cautiously in case we run into their armies. If we are lucky, we will not be confronted by the armies of the Empire by the time we have taken their capital. After the young general spoke, Inoki put his piece to the daimyo. 
If all goes to plan and move with great speed this will be done in just under two months, as it will take that long to get from our current army's location to Kyoto. What is not being hoped for is a confrontation from one of these empire legions. Apparently their army size, if we are forced into a fight, could root us due to the fact they by far overwhelm us in terms of military might. At this the Daimyo frowned. What are these legions? He asked. Anoki spoke up once more. What we know currently is that they are the standard imperial armies for the empire. While their size is unknown, if we were to be confronted by one of them, the chances are they would outnumber us significantly as high. It's only logical due to the empire's size that their armies would be also of large quantities. What is the army size to deal with this operation? He asked. Near enough our entire military force is taking part in the operation. The 5,000 men which make up of the country's military force. Plus a thousand men from the other two countries taking part in the operation. Lord Anoki has brought a significant part of his ninja force totaling 800 of his men. As such, the force taking part in this operation totals to 6,800 men. The daimyo sighed, hopefully it would be enough. Then I will leave it to you gentlemen. The fate of Tsuchi no Kuni hangs on your shoulders. This campaign will determine whether we shall become the greatest of the elemental nations, or we will cease to exist for attacking this great power. For the future of this country of Earth, you must not fail. At this the two men leading the army against the empire, bowed their heads low, before standing up and leaving the daimyo to take to the field and fight this campaign. Naruto, flanked by Miss Tuhide, Kamei and his guard, marched to the emergency cabinet meeting with a stride in his step. He could not believe how foolish and naive he was to believe that the eastern conflict would not spill over the empire's borders. But alas he was proven wrong. Now the forces of Earth Country had broken through the border forts, and had set up camp within the eastern region. It was luckily that he had ordered the mobilization of the 3rd Imperial Legion to that region, in case the worst case scenario was to take place. Now it had come to pass. What was to happen now was attempt to deal with the situation quickly, before it escalated even further. With force he pushed the double doors to the meeting room wide open, to find the entire cabinet arguing with one another. Lord Kazuma was also present, standing silently in the corner. Kayubi had yet to return from his trip to Kanahagakur, so only he was absent. The roaring voices of the cabinet continued as he and Kamei sat in their seats, the Praetorian guard taking their positions in the room. It was after he sat down that he noticed that Yoshimoto was the only one of the cabinet not arguing. Instead his gaze was upon the young emperor. No voice was to be heard, as his eyes told the blonde all he needed to know. I told you so. He could help but feel angry that the fact that the old warhawk was correct in this situation. He hoped that war would not come from the east. But now it had come to pass. He needed Yashimoto's insight and experience to help formulate a plan quickly. With the noise beginning to increase in levels, the boy rubbed his temples as he felt a migraine come to his head. He did not need this. While well, he had learned patience, thanks to Kairubi, even that had its limits. Enough. Everyone went quiet as the boy essentially roared for silence. They could see he was not in the mood for arguments at this moment in time. Now he had order, he began to emergency meeting. Right, what the hell are we dealing with? He essentially ordered, trying to get to grips with the situation. Yashimoto was to have his answer. Your Imperial Majesty, intelligence reports that an army comprising of three countries has broken through the northern border of the eastern region and have set up camp near one of our major cities in the northeastern province. Their numbers roughly add up to about 7,000 men. The countries involved seem to be Earth, Mountain and the New Rice countries. At this Naruto put his head in his hands when he realized two of the countries mentioned exactly on the border to the Empire. It's obvious how they moved undetected by Kazuma's sentinels. Why would they want to attack us? One minister asked. I believe that question is not really important now at this moment, for war has been declared. What is important is dealing with this situation. Kamei replied to the minister. At this several other ministers nodded in agreement. What can be said for certain is that the people are shocked by this seemingly unprovoked attack. They obviously want this dealt with the Speaker of the House of Representatives spoke before the cabinet, even it has just been over a day for this to start, news of the attack has spread like wildfire throughout the empire. Needless to say public opinion is essentially one of a desire for war and retribution. The people were not happy with this attack and wanted the government to action quickly. As such we are now put under pressure to deliver. This is now one of the worst crises in the empire's very short history, and thus we have to deal with it quickly and decisively before it grows out of control. Essentially the Speaker of the House of Representatives brought home the seriousness of the situation. Now they had to deliver what the people demanded less internal strife was to start up. As young Yukumar know of this situation? Old Munkato asked. He has been informed of the situation. The Third Imperial Legion is already on the move to intercept this invasion force, Yoshimoto answered. How could they achieve victory with such a small force? Another minister asked the obvious question. With a force that large or small, it would be easy for it to be swept aside with a single legion of 100,000 men. Hell, even a single division of 10,000 would be sufficient. 
if they have nothing to slow them down and travel light, then my guess they would attempt to go straight to the capital of Kyoto. Everyone turned to the emperor, who by now had pulled himself together. The plan is most probably to attack the heart of the empire, in which they hope it would cause a major moral shake-up to our forces. In theory is possible, as few nations in history had continued a war after losing their capital. It was a clear objective. After all the capital was the center of a nation, with the governing body residing within. Take the capital and the governing body, victory would be almost certain. Only a few times, when the spirit is willing, do those who had lost their capital in a war continue to fight on. But with a force that large, surely they underestimate us one minister quipped. A force of 7,000 against three full legions. It sounded foolish. Yoshimoto however was not finished with his report. It seems from the report that the Tsuchikage is among their ranks, as well as a significant amount of ninjas from Uwagakur. Several ministers paled at the mention of ninjas, and Naruto soon understand why they would be confident enough to attack the empire with a small force. So it would seem that they have many powerful warriors within their ranks. It would seem that victory of this force will not be so easily won after all he mused. The cabinet, upon hearing the emperor's words, wondered what he was thinking. Those there began to realize he was formulating a plan to deal with this problem. Those who knew him well knew of his radical and gambling tactics. It was how he won many of his wars. Kamei in fact once called him the luckiest boy alive. Your imperial majesty. Justice Minister Kisu cast, wondering what was running through the blonde's head. Naruto on his part was assessing the situation. He was aware of the third cage of the hidden rock village and his abilities. As such, he was wondering who would be able to match him. Hanzo Hattori of the Ninja Hattori clan could be a good bet, but he wondered if his abilities would be enough to take on the old man, who was rumored to rival his own father. Second, Shimazu and Yukimura were out of the question. They were commanders, samurai. They would not stand a chance against a man who had a great deal of power at his disposal. Kayubi had not returned yet, and wouldn't know when he would come back. Out of everyone in that force, it was old man Inoki that worried him the most. It was at these times did he feel the burden of leadership heavy on his shoulder. With no other choice, he had to get involved. Personally, looks like I will have to take the field of battle once more. Reluctant though I am to do so, there is no other way to deal with the leader of the Iwas forces at this the cabinet went into an uproar. Even Kamei was shocked at this declaration. But your imperial majesty, what happens if you were to fall? One minister tried to argue. Your imperial majesty, I would highly advise not to take this course of action. Kamei also tried to put reason before the young emperor. He could hear the advisors behind him also trying to get him to reconsider this choice. However, they were all silenced when he raised his hand. If the leader of a nation does not lead, then how can he expect his subjects to follow? I have fought in conflicts before I became the emperor. I was among the front lines during the war of unification. War is no stranger to me. When a situation like this arises, I must meet the challenge. The ministers of the cabinet kept their silence, but their faces clearly showed disagreement to the emperor, the symbol of the empire, decision to personally take to the field. Out of all the members of the cabinet, only the minister of defense was to be smiling. It was times like these that showed that the emperor was no coward, and was willing to take to battle if the situation called for it. Kamei sighed, it seems the blonde ruler was clear in his actions, and would not be talked out of swing from high course. He could only support what the emperor needed and prayed the blonde's courage wouldn't end him. Very well your imperial majesty, what is your orders? He asked. Naruto could eat the resignation in the chief's voice. He could understand his plight of having to risk his life, but to deal with the cage, another powerful warrior was needed. I would like for Lords Hanzo and Kazuma to accompany me. Inform Lord Yukimura to march for Kamina Valley. If my suspicions are correct, then the enemy force will have to pass through the valley to make quick march toward Kyoto. Even so if not then the position will allow us to quickly reposition if necessary. Already his tactical mind began to work on a plan to deal with the invaders quickly and decisively. The valley's natural defensive location made it ideal for defenders. Furthermore, it could be used for ambush purposes, and the high ridges made it effective to use artillery in a much more deadly manner. I shall inform them immediately your imperial majesty lord Kazuma of the Ihei made a hand sign, and suddenly a pure black raven appeared, much to the startling of the cabinet. Seconds later it disappeared in a flash. Naruto nodded his head in recognition to the Lord Sentinel's actions. After this he stood up, gaining the attention of the cabinet. I'm calling an end to this meeting. I asked the members of the House of Representatives to keep the people calm and inform them that action is being taken, and retribution will be swift. Yoshimoto I would like any other information you have on the situation, and bring Lord Hanzo to the palace so we can get moving quickly. It is time for the invaders to be shown our might. If we have to take the fight directly to the Northern Alliance to bring peace to this empire, then so be it. Yukimura, sat upon his horse, gazed on a high stance the 3rd Imperial Legion, that marched en masse towards their destination below him. It had only been a few hours when a messenger came into the command compound within the fort in the eastern province, informing them of the attack in the north. Naturally the young general ordered the whole legion to move north to meet the treat. 
So far he had little intel on who he was facing, or the numbers. All he knew was that they were based near one of the cities in the north of the eastern region. He could understand now why he was repositioned to the eastern region. While the Emperor highly doubted that the Eastern Bloc would try anything direct with the Empire, he was cautious enough to position the 3rd Imperial Legion to the east in case something did happen. With hindsight it was a clever defensive move, and now they had plenty of time to mobilize and move up quickly to meet the threat. The young Sonata watched the Legion move to meet the threat. All 10 divisions of 100,000 men, moved from the defensive fort close to the border in the central province of the Eastern region, marching quickly northwards. Infantry, cavalry, artillery and chariots, along with small units of special forces, filled the ranks of the legion, all 100,000 divided into 10 divisions of 10,000 men each. This structure essentially made the divisions individual armies within the legion. At the current rate of speed, it would take a few months to meet the force at the border. Hopefully the enemy force would still be there when they arrive at full force. Yukimura had good reason to feel confident of victory of the invaders. His force was a fully equipped, fully manned standard legion. What the Legion lacked in terms of experience, since this was the newest Legion to be currently standing, was made up for the fact they were given priority for the newest weapons of artillery and hand weapons, thus the Legion was given a further edge over their foes. As such, the enemy force was soon to meet a force of the Empire, and like the foes of the Emperor in the past, would be smashed aside like all others. Suddenly he heard a bird screech above him. Looking to the source, he saw a pure black raven dart towards him. Before it made contact, it dispersed in a black swirl, and in its place was a clearly written letter rolled up. In a swift motion he grabbed the letter, and with gloved fingers, unrolled it to see its contents. As he began to read the letter, a smile graced his face. An order from the Emperor, as it had the Emperor's seal upon it, along with the insignia that clearly shows it was sent via the Emperor's sentinels. He had his orders as to his new destination, but was shocked to find that the Emperor himself was taking part in the conflict. This meant that the situation was critical, and the ruler of the West wanted to see a quick end to what would be a bloody conflict. With the new orders directly from the top set, he raised his war fan high. At this yells for the legion to halt were heard and trumpets were heard all around, and as one, all the men in the legion ceased to move. Next he used his war fan to signal for the summoning of his division commanders. Soon they rode up from their divisions to meet him. You call this general? One of the older commanders asked. We have new orders directly from the emperor. This revelation eyebrows were raised at this revelation. He showed them the letter as proof in case any doubts were raised. We are to move to Kamina Valley where we will meet the invading forces head-on. The Emperor himself will be joining the conflict. This was hard for the commanders to take in that the ruler of the Empire was coming to the front. But the evidence was there on the letter bearing the Imperial Seal. Needless to say no questions were asked about this decision, but their orders were clear. With a salute they rode down to their divisions. Soon the commanders informed their officers of the change in location. With these orders given, the trumpets were called up once again, and the legion as a whole began to march once more, this time to the given destination, to the Kamina Valley near the edge of the western border of the eastern region. While he watched his large army marched, he began to wonder what he would be up against. For the fact that his imperial majesty was involving himself meant this was a serious situation, and thus he would not take this enemy force likely. Now it would be until he met this force personally that he would understand the mind of his soon-to-be opponent. Now it would be up to the men down below to fight the battle to protect the empire. For the Emperor, Naruto was in his chamber, preparing for the conflict that was to come soon. He was confident of victory, but he going to have to face clearly the strongest ninja in their ranks. Anoki, third cage of the Hidden Rock Village. He must not underestimate the old man. He saw how strong old man Saratobi was, even when he was old and past his prime. As such, that Susukage would be the same. He would have to go all out to at least end it soon, as he would not want to have a long drawn out fight. With luck, the battle could be over before they are, and such force him to withdraw, if the battle went bad for the eastern forces. In his hands was to be his weapon he would draw during this conflict, and in fact drawn in the conflicts of the past. This ancient long blade was forged in ages past, and carried special significance to him. The seventh star sword was a finely ornate long and highly decorated weapon. The sheath and hilt was made from gold and was deeply decorated, from the hilt to the weight on the end, to the tip of the sheath. Furthermore, along the sheath were seven stars, which had within them the seals for the seven elements in this world. The main elements of fire, earth, water, air, but also the elements of light, darkness, and the void. While the seals and the materials which make the sword is valuable, to Naruto it is more valuable because it was an heirloom from his ancestors of the Uzumakis. As such the blonde treasures this sword greatly, so far it did not let him down. The sword had hidden powers which Naruto was still trying to understand. Regardless, he had drawn this sword many times during the wars of unification. Now he would do so again. He was brought out of his thoughts when he heard the door behind him quietly open. He did not need to turn around. He knew who was coming in to see him. He felt slender arms wrap around his waist, clutching him tightly. He could feel the warmth of a body pressing against his. He could feel a head gently rest onto his back. 
With a sigh, he grasped the arms tightly with one of his own. He knew she would not want him to go. The words did not need to be said. I heard from both Kamei and Miss Tuhite you were facing them. Her voice was one of a woman trying to remain calm and not to scream out. Naruto knew this would have to come eventually, only it came sooner than he wished. I have no choice Hinata he gently spoke, but he knew she still would not want him to go, most probably fearing the worst. Her response was to tighten her grip. It screamed to him not to leave. Not to leave her. With a small, sad smile gracing his lips he turned within the hold so he could face the woman who he treasured. He almost had to swallow when he looked directly at her. Her eyes were tear-stained, no doubt due to the fact of fearing the worst that could happen to him. She looked so venerable before him, clinging to him as her only true pillar of strength. Oh how he hated to make her cry. He wrapped his arms around her, thus completing the embrace of lovers as he comforted his princess, while she silently begged him not to leave to the front. Not to leave her. Please Naruto-kun, don't leave. I'm worried what could happen. If you were to she left it open. How she did not want to think of what could happen if he was to never return. It had only been a few weeks since she was first reunited with her love. She now felt whole after finding out he loved her. Now she felt like she was losing him again, and it was breaking her. Unconsciously she tightened her hold on her royal boyfriend. She felt his hand rub her hair in a soothing manner, attempting to calm her down. Silence reigned between them, words didn't need to be spoken, for both naturally seemed to understand each other. Naruto pulled away from his princess and placed his fingers under her chin, making her look up into his eyes. Her eyes were tear-stained, with a gloved finger he wiped away the tears, before leaning in to kiss her gentle lips. This was enough to calm Hinata down. She once more felt complete. When he pulled away she gave a silent moan of displeasement, having only lasted for a short time. This won't take long Hinata. I'll be there for only a short amount of time. Once we have beaten them back, I will come straight back to you. I promise he always kept his promise, he prided himself on it. He would be damned to allow himself to die in this conflict, not after everything he had worked so hard on and so much more to do. Also, he would not allow himself to upset his princess any more than he already had by joining in the conflict personally. Hinata for her part managed to give her boyfriend a warm smile. She knew in her heart that Naruto was too stubborn to change his ways. Even so, she hoped he would keep his promise, and return safely. She watched as he picked up his sword and, with a peck on her cheek, walked out to go the meeting point with the other members in the palace going to the front lines. I'll wait for you, Naruto-kun. Always. It had only been a few days since the demon lord, the nine-tailed demon fox, had made his dramatic, freighting and explosive reappearance within Kanahagakur, the village hidden in the leaves, and made his deeply startling revelations regarding a certain blonde's past. Needless to say questions were in need of answering, and the people were demanding an explanation as to why that what the demon fox had revealed to them, had been kept from them. This revelation made people began to wonder what else the ruling class was keeping from them. This simple act would now cause a spiral that helped to serve to foster a deepening distrust between the ordinary people in the village and the ruling council, and thus worries began to arise of unrest fostering in the village, that, if left unchecked, could turn into violence. The people themselves however were not ignorant enough to find themselves blame-free. They remembered everything they had done to the boy in the past. The fact that upon the Hokage monument now no longer bore the face of the fourth Hokage, the father of the blonde who they had treated with such distance, had driven the psychological knife into their hearts and minds. It served to show that they did not deserve heroes such as Minato Namakis, since they did not even try to keep the promise that his son was to be a hero for his burden, and thus was a terrible stain on their pride. A deep blow was made, one which the Hidden Leaf Village would never recover. Sunade on her part was having the biggest migraine she ever had as she sat in her office. Now having to deal with the growing unrest of the populace in Konoha, which added to the list of problems the ninja village was having to face. Taking a swing of her sake, she had to think of a solution, and fast. The people wanted to know everything dealing with the Kayubi incident. They had a feeling there was more than what was told. The thing is this time their fears were correct. Sunade already had to deal with the repercussions of the revelation in Fire Country and beyond. Needless to say if they weren't in enough trouble already, the fact that how they mistreated a son of a hero would cause irreparable damage to Konoha's honor. But this also backfired to the daimyo himself. He also knew that Naruto was the son of the fourth Hokage, but did not do anything to help the blonde boy. So his honor and standing among the other daimyo had been hit as well, if it was not already for the fact several other daimyo wanted his lands and had already, it was unlikely he would gain any allies for this disrespect to a great country hero. Anuk brought the fifth Hokage out of her thoughts, shouting for whomever it was to enter. The two remaining elders were her guests, both with sullen faces. They were both aware of the situation developing, and since essentially both their careers and perhaps lives were on the lives. Swan was well aware of this as well. In this situation, it seemed that the ever-arguing conflict between Cage and Council had ceased to try and deal with this ever-growing temperament of the village population. How is the current climate? Kaharu asked the seemingly overworked Hokage. She now had to be extremely careful of how she acted now, as his position was now in jeopardy. 
what happened to Danza was still at the forefront of her mind, and while she highly doubted she would be killed by the demon fox, the angry populace could easily do something very similar. Well, you take the risk of keep information from the people, and now they were paying the price. Calling for the council to resign was the woman's simple reply. Needless to say the two old advisors were unnerved by the proposition the people were demanding. But that was not to be the bombshell. And with how things are going, I may just comply to their wish. This got a major reaction. What? Hamar yelled, but that would be deeply unwise. The council is there to aid the hookage in the work they do. In fact, we do most of it. If you disband the council then you would have more work on your hands, too much to do alone. You cannot do all the work alone. Tsune didn't reply. Instead she slowly stood up from her chair, walked around the table and stood directly in front of the old council members. To their horror, she grasped both of them by their clothing and lifted them up into the air. T.S. Tsune. What are you doing? Kahari yelled, too shocked to actually make a move against the fifth hokage. This council has given me, my sensei, and Minato so much more trouble than it was worth. In essence, much of our situation was due to you constantly making bad decision after bad decision. It was this council that thought it best to inform the whole of the village of Naruto's burden. It was this council who thought it best to wipe out an entire clan, and leave the survivor all alone without any help to his injured psyche, which caused him to attempt to leave the village. Finally, you have me banish a boy who was doing his duty. This council has caused more harm than good. Perhaps getting rid of it would make my life so much easier. She growled out, glaring at the two elders. What Hamura said was true, they did do a lot in aiding the hookage and managing the village, but this council was doing more things that hindered the village more than helping it. If having to disband the council is what it takes to calm the people outside, from the blunders this council has made, then so be it. She threw the two seniors to the floor, both looking at her in complete shock. With the power invested in me as hookage of Kanahagakur within Hai no Kuni, I am hereby disbanding the current council of Kanahagakur and its members. That includes both the civilian, the shinobi as well as the advisory members. Until this matter has settled I will take full control of this village's affairs. The two stricken advisors lit on, completely powerless to do anything. Hamura sighed before standing up from the floor. I take it that you are fully aware of the consequences. He asked calmly. The hookage nodded in reply. This is not a permanent measure. Once the matter has fully settled down, the shinobi council will be reinstated. I know that they will take their positions far more seriously than they have done now. As for the civilian council, the current members will not be allowed to return, as they caused most of the problems, and thus a new civilian council will be created from new members. It seemed that Tsunade already had what she was doing planned. Regardless however, one major question still remained. What will happen to us? Kahara asked, also standing up next to her fellow former counselor. Tsunade shook her head. I'm afraid your time has come. You have been so secure in your positions that you began to take risks far too regularly. As such, I'm afraid that source of pride cannot exist in the ruling body of Kanoha. Understand I'm doing this for your benefits as well as mine if this both decided not to fight the inevitable. They understood where Tsunade was coming from. Perhaps they should quit politics altogether and live the rest of their lives peacefully. Furthermore they also saw this as a move to not only calm down the masses, but also save their own hides from their mistakes. It seemed it was time to let go of the past. We understand Lady Hokage, and thank you they spoke with a bow, before turning around and leaving the office, never to return as members of the council. Tsunade on her part watched with a blank expression as they walked out, before a small smile graced her lips. It seemed that the old geezers were able to keep their egos in check after all. She signaled for the Anbu hidden in the room to inform the council members of the situation. She knew that the shinobi council would understand, especially since it was only going to last, as long as this situation lasted. The civilian council on the other hand may be a problem. Sure some would understand their position and not make a fuss, happy that nothing else would happen to them. Others on the other hand would surely cause a fuss. Oh well, she would have to deal with them when they came. As soon as they left the room, Shizun walked in, her face clearly showing confusion not only at the deeply calm faces and the smiling face of the hookage. It was clear she wanted to know what went on. My lady? She asked, seeing the hookage's gaze staying at the door. Shizun, I want my order for sake doubled at this Shizun looked horrified. Boo but why? She tried not to scream. Tsunade was already a heavy drinker. Any more could prove deadly. Instead of shouting at her however, Tsunade just sighed. Let's just say I'm going to have to work hard for the next few months. Very hard indeed. In a small tavern within the Hidden Leaf Village, the remaining members of the Rookie Nine sat round a table, listening to what the group members who went to the West had to say. Needless to say the discovery of Naruto being the Emperor of the Western Empire, caused them to feel deeply unnerved, mainly because they obviously felt that they had a part to play in the decision that he would not give the maid. The fact they saw the demon fox himself only a few days ago, only seemed to drive the knife deeper into their guilt of their conduct on who used to be their blonde friend. The group obviously had mixed reactions to the events that transpired when the small group dwelled shortly within the Western Empire. On the whole however, they all felt sick. Sick at themselves for their mistakes. 
Some friends they were, they deserved the cold shoulder which Naruto had given some of them, but would easy also be to all of them. Needless to say what was done was done, no they had to protect their home for the oncoming invasion. An invasion which, by the look of things, many wouldn't survive. I still cannot believe that Naruto is an emperor Ino spoke in wonder. Oh how silly she felt to see Naruto as a threat after everything he had done for the village. She may have been a smart woman, but she couldn't see the man behind the demon. In the end what was done was done, and they were all paying for it in terms of friendship. Yep, he unified the majority of the continent in a short period of time, he truly is an surprising, unpredictable person. A dangerous person at that Kiba spoke. At the last sentence everyone in the group looked at him. Shikamaru was the one to speak up. Dangerous? How? Now the Nara was no fool. He actually discovered Naruto's burden long before the announcement by the Hokage. It was easy to piece together the small parts to the puzzle that was Naruto Uzumaki. The glares, the date of birth, the treatment. The strange abilities he had. Now he never saw Naruto as the demon he held. In fact, he respected Naruto for his burden. He just wished that the other people of this ignorant village did the same thing. Think about it. He holds most of the continent in his hands. The power he must wield would surely be so great that the eastern countries, which were looking at the western empire, makes us look like a toddler, means he could crush us under the sheer mighty must pauses. When looking at it, Kiba's observation did ring true. Also with the added fact that the eastern countries had no idea what the empire had, only added to the fear of the great power which dwelled in the west. Perhaps, was Niji's reply, but you must remember the state of which the continent was in before Naruto's arrival. The fact that it was so divided and war toward the way it was, the very fact it was to become the power it is now is a feat in itself. If you ask me, it could be that it is such a huge size is why people fear its power. It's more psychological fear than anything else. Niji was able to look at the situation in a more logical sense than the others. In many ways he just did a Shikamaru in the evaluation of the empire. He, like Shikamaru, did not hate Naruto for his burden. On the contrary, he now understood Naruto better, for like himself, he had a burden that he had no control over, like himself. Even so, he is not getting involved in this war, it's nothing to do with him now Sakura spoke dejectedly. At this Tenten rose up, anger shone on her face. What you mean he is not getting involved? This is his home. Sauce sighed at this, gaining everyone's attention. Do you honestly think after everything we and this village have done to him, he would just come back to aid us? Naruto is not that stupid. Besides, he has an empire to look after now. If anything, we are just an annoyance. That hit home. Kiba growled at Ichiha. Well it was you who caused all this. You just had to try and run and betray Kanoha, didn't you Sauce didn't reply to the spike that Kiba managed to growl out. He didn't need to. Everyone knew how sorry he was for the trouble he caused, and they knew of how he felt about the affair on Naruto's banishment. But you have to admit, if Naruto did join us, the war would be as good as when Choji spoke, trying to break the tension in the room. The size of the empire would require a large army to maintain the borders. So it is reasonable to assume that Naruto would have a large army under his command. After all we did come across those large wooden fortresses in close proximity that contained that whole legion. Shino spoke. This caught everyone's interest that was not on the mission. How many men were inside? Ino asked, the curious part of her getting the better of her once more. If anyone saw his mouth under the coat, they would have seen Shino having a very small smirk on his face. About 100,000 men this caused all their eyes to widen in astonishment. 100,000. How many of these legions did he have under his command? Choji was right, if he had gotten involved on their side, then the war would have truly turned. However he had denied their request, and thus left them to their fate. If only something happened to change his mind. Without prior notice an Anbu appeared at the table startling the group. The Hukage wants all Jonin and Anbu rank ninja to appear in the chamber. An event has transpired which could turn the events of the entire war. Needless to say they didn't need to be told twice. They were gone in a flash. Naruto, accompanied by his Praetorian guard, walked with a purpose towards his destination in the palace. Armed with his sword in its sheath, he was ready to go to the front to deal with the threat from the east personally. It was time to show both his people and others around his empire what he was capable of, and that he was not a man to be pushed over. He was not going to let this assault on his empire go unpunished, he would drive back the invaders and take the fight to their realm. As he came to a large room, two palace guards opened the doors to allow him inside. With the hall, he saw everyone who was joining him in this endeavor. Lord Kazuma of the Sentinels was present, along with five of his hooded Ihei members. Their abilities to teleport whole units of troops as well as move completely undetected would prove valuable in the coming conflict. Furthermore, Kazuma had a trick only a small few knew, and it would be a great advantage if it had to be used. Another group present was the Hattori clan, led by Hattori Hanzo. He and his men, roughly 20 shinobi were wearing the traditional ninja attire. Hanzo was clearly visible due to decorated version of that attire. While it looked intimidating and clearly showed who it was behind the mask, it was still dark enough, so Hanzo would be able to move around without being detected. They would show the difference between the flashy shinobi of the east, and the quiet ninja of the west. 
the Hanzo clan was not the only clan making their appearance here. The dark-skinned Fiuma clan was another ninja clan that Naruto had personally at his disposal. Their group was larger, about 30 men, and like the Hattori clan, wore the traditional ninja clothing. Their leader was the, the loathed to admitting by the young blonde terrifying Katara Fuma. His outfit made him look like a devil, and when he stuck, his enemies were always frozen in sheer terror before he played the killing blow. Like all his clan members, his skin was dark, but he had black face painting, which was clearly visible, but the design, like his outfit, made him look for frightened to look upon. Despite his dark cruel nature, he was an artist. To him killing was a performance, and he was an actor making his presence on the field. How did he know? Well Naruto almost lost his life when Katara was his enemy, and when he first met him, he was frozen on the spot. If it were not for Kayubi and Miss Tuhide, he would not be alive today. After their first meeting Katara attempted to kill him a further three times. Every time he failed. Every time he escaped. But what made him join the blonde was a begrudging respect for the fact he was the only person to survive his attacks. Three attempts no less. It was after the fall of the Ashikid Shogunate that Katara swore loyalty to the boy he tried to kill previously. While others, including Kame, have raised concerns about this decision, Naruto strangely feels he can trust the dark-skinned ninja. Needless to say he has not let him down, and now this was another chance to prove his loyalty, and maybe shut up the critics. Finally, the last ninja clan in the hall was one that was completely different to the others. The Kanoichi clan of the Hirano, led by the tomboy Shinin. They were a more revealing version of the shinobi outfit, and only wore face masks for their headgear, thus allowing their hair to move freely. Nin on the other hand didn't wear a face mask at all. As such it was showed she had medium length brown hair with matching brown eyes, while her smile gave off a cheek yet experienced glow for all to see. She was not a woman to be messed with. The Hirano clan were clan with a major difference. The males were merchants while the women were ninja. Only the females of the clan could take part in warfare, while the males handled the clan's finances. Needless to say Nin was current clan head, and in fact enforced this ruling within the clan. When Naruto looked at who was present, he was still wondering where Kayubi was at this time. His disappearance was beginning to worry him. By now he would have appeared before Naruto and cracked a joke or informed him of something that happened. Currently however, there has been nothing. The young emperor sighed, he would have to do this without him. He could not wait any longer. As he walked into the room, everyone stopped what they were doing and bowed before him. Kazuma, Hanzo, Kotaro and Nin walked to the front and bowed before him like all the others. Your imperial majesty they spoke together, their heads low. Naruto nodded in response. Are all the men ready? He asked. They nodded as one. It was now time to join General Yukimura Kamina Valley, and face the enemy face to face. Then it is time to move out. Lord Kazuma, if you please. At this they all stood up. Kazuma summoned a sphere with his hands they glowed within his palms. In a flash the room went bright. When it dispersed, the room's incumbents no longer there. But Tsuchika Janoki and the Earth General Kodamaya stood ahead of the just under 7,000 strong army from Earth. Ninja, samurai and conscripted peasants filled the solid ranks. Armed with the primary weapons of the age, they were told to travel light due to the operation they were planning. A direct strike into the heart of the Empire, Kyoto. They were not foolish, they knew that for any chance of victory it would require to end this quickly and decisively. The longer this war dragged on, the smaller their chances of victory. No doubt that the Empire has been informed of their presence, and so would most likely be mobilizing their own armies, their legions, to face them. Their intelligence has told them that most of their forces were in the north dealing with the Syrian Empire. As such, what was left of their forces would be only if the small minority was able to go against them. There was just one small problem. That legion which was available had gone off the radar, as such they did not know where they were and where they were going. As such it only added to the tension of the situation, and put more strain on their mission. With so much at stake, this one roll of the die needed to score high, or else the land of earth would lose more than their army. Much more. Anoki gave a snort, causing the young general to look at him. He did not fear this empire. To him it was like a newborn child, weak and defenseless. One quick and strong punch would easily cripple the empire. But he also had his own objective, one that would drive the knife through the heart. He grinned with anticipation. He was told he was strong, and as such he looked forward to seeing the faces of the people, when they saw him destroy their beloved savior. At the grin Kodamai raised an eyebrow. Something wrong? Or are you getting senile in your old age? At this the old cage burst out laughing. Are you young ones these days? No respect for your elders he gave in reply. No, I was just wondering how powerful this emperor of the west is. Kodamai chuckled. Well if he is anything like me, he wouldn't be a pushover he spoke with an arrogant tone. Anoki grunted in response. If he is anything like you, then he wouldn't be a challenge at all. The young general glared at the old man. Oh how he hated the old man's views on the younger generation. He had asked the Earth Daimyo to be the one in charge of this operation, primarily due to the fact he knew they could easily come to blows if a situation got out of hand. However his pride unfortunately meant that he would not allow himself to be under the command of whom he though of an inferior status, he knew this well. 
He also knew that the old man thought little of him due to his age, bell of him to be an upstart with little experience. Despite the pleading for one overall commander, the Earth Daimyo would not have it. He believed that both of them could work together for the greater good of Earth country. Oh how his lord could be naive. Anoki just shrugged off the glare, and soon stood to full heights to address the men. Unfortunately, something happened which to be honest, should have been seen coming. Crick. That Tsuchikaju's eyes bulged as he felt a shearing pain run through his body. More specifically however, a certain part of his anatomy. Arg. My back. The old man clasped to the floor, pain perilsing him, making him unable to move. Kodamaya did not hold back his laugh when he observed this. Oh how refreshing to see his annoyance roll around in pain. Well old man, with a problem like that I wonder if you can fight. Perhaps it's time you're tired while he gloated, two ninja from the ranks appeared to help the old cage. They were Kurosuchi, Anoki granddaughter, and Akatsuchi, the gentle giant. As they nurtured the protesting old man, Kurosuchi turned her head to glare at the smirk young general. Now with his rival currently down and out, he turned to the army amasses before, and began to speak to them, just as old man Anoki was about to do. Hear me warriors of the land of earth, for now it is the time for you to shine. He yelled, his voice booming so even those at the back could plainly hear. You have been tasked with the chance to make Earth the greatest country in history, or having it cease to exist. You brave warriors are a lone warrior against the Mike Dragon. The Dragon of the Western Empire. A dragon we have provoked. You say this is foolish. Mad. Insane to attack a large empire that could easily crush all the elemental nations. But have no fear. This dragon, like all beings have a weakness. And we shall exploit that weakness. The men stood in awe at the practicality of the general's speech. He did not hype it up, or over-exaggerate. No, he told it as it was, so confident he was a victory. As they listened any fear they had originally of having no success died away. In his place a new confidence emboldened the men. Speeches like this one can have that desired effect. While the dragon is strong, like all beings, it heart it's weak. Strike at the heart, the beast shall die. As such, we shall gain victory by striking at the very heart of the empire. The capital is the weakness of this empire, for who lies in there than the emperor himself? By conquering the capital and slaying their savior, the men shall lose heart, and the empire shall be our. At this the men all raised their voices as one, raising their weapons high. Now we are a small army compared to the might of the empire's legions. We may have a fight on our hands if we encounter them. But you are an army with a purpose, and the fate of our country resting on your shoulders. As such, with such trust placed in you, there is no way you can lose. So fight hard and stay strong, for the power of earth shall crush this empire and bring it to its knees. One final roar was heard by the men, and Kodamaya smiled before turning to the old man on the floor beside him. Both he and the two shinobi by his side looked at him with disbelief clear on their faces. Anoki did his best not to grit his teeth, for his pride had taken yet another blow today. First his back went out in front of all the men, and then this young upstart upstaged him before he even had a chance. Oh how he hated this youth. Said smirking youth on the other hand was pleased with the fact he got one up on the old cage, his ego taking a boost. With a signal, he motioned for the army to march to their destination. It was time to tame the dragon, and bring a new age to the land of Earth. He cannot do this. In a chamber that was in a secure location, the leading members of the Northern Alliance gathered. The rakage slammed his fist into the table before him, spider cracks appearing due to the strength of the blow. Also around the table were the daimyos of the countries involved, especially Lightning Country. Said daimyo shook his head at the cage's reaction. At the head of the table was the leader of the Alliance, the Snake Sanin, Arachmer. Calm yourself Lord Rakage. The Lord of Earth has made his decision, as such we act accordingly he spoke in a clam tone, one which made many of the current members shiver unconsciously. When the Earth Daimyo had ordered the invasion into the Western Empire, the members of the Alliance soon found out. Now they were convening on how to deal with the situation, and its consequences. The Furious Cage on the other hand turned his fiery gaze to the old Sanin. Calm down. The Earth Daimyo controls near enough half of the Alliance's military strength, due to the large size of his country. Now he has decided to go on this clearly ill-fated crusade, our military strength will essentially be halved. He boomed. He wondered if this Sanin actually cared of what happened to this alliance. The only reason he joined was that he would see the fall of the Hidden Leaf Village. Now that Earth Country essentially pulled out by going to attack an empire which was clearly not involved in this war, it would most properly give a moral boost to the forces of Hai no Kuni, for the odds were now close to even in terms of overall skill. To his shock, Arachimaru merely smiled back at him. Damn that creepy smile of his. Do you doubt your own power Lord Rakage? Does the fact one lord goes astray that this whole operation will now be in jeopardy? Yes we have lost a major player in this alliance, but we are still stronger than the land of fire. We still outnumber them in a considerable manner. Do not worry, the war is still in our favor. All we need to do put forward our plans. Everyone knew what this meant. They needed to strike Hai no Kuni quickly to put them out of the war for good. What about the western empire? One of the lesser daimyos asked, bringing up the major question in the room. 
That is why we must put forward our plans, Arachimaru replied in his casual tone. Due to the fact that the land of Earth is part of the Northern Alliance, the attack they have committed against the Empire will rebound on us. As such, if and when Earth forces are defeated by the Empire, the Emperor will most probably see it as an attack from the Alliance, not just Earth Country and its allies. Arachimaru may not have shown it, but he was deeply irritated by the turn of events, and the actions of Earth, Mountain and Rice. If he was not so entangled with the preparations to do the death blow to fire country, he would have personally killed the three daimyos responsible for bringing his superpower into the war. His current plans to deal with the situation, in the best case scenario, was to first conquer fire country, and to destroy the hidden leaf village, to satisfy those in the alliance. Then try to open negotiations to the empire to try and get the alliance out of this mess. If he had to hang earth country out to take all the blows, then so be it. He was no fool, they did not have the power to deal with the size of an empire that existed in the west, and the fact that the earth daimyo thought he could take on that might, he deserved what was coming to him. I cannot believe that the earth daimyo thought he had the power to take on the western empire. Such arrogance on his part the lightning daimyo quipped. The other daimyos nodded their heads in agreement. The rakage sighed in frustration. So, what is your plan? He asked the snake Sanin. Said Sanin smiled his usual cruel smile once more. Simple, we gather our forces, then we strike at the capital of Fur's country as one. Once the country has fallen, Kanahagakur will be next at the sea smiled, the finale will be spectacular. But what about the forces of Haino Kuni? Asked one of the lesser daimyos, won't they try to stop us? Arachimaru chuckled in response. Though I do believe they will, he replied, in fact, I'm counting on them to gather their own forces together to face us. At this we will crush them in one, swift stroke. And what about the Western Empire? Another daimyo asked about the elephant in the room. I'm hoping that after the fiasco with the land of Earth, negotiations will be able to open up, and essentially explain to the Emperor that they went on their own accord. I highly doubt he would want a long-term war, besides, once Earth country has fallen their thirst for revenge may have been quenched. I am not foolish to face an empire with only a small force, and since we have lost half our combined force, as the Rakich has said, the chances of success against such an empire is dismal. We shall deal with the land of fire first, then once earth country has been beaten, we shall deal with the empire afterwards the members of the alliance looked uneasy at what Arachimaru was planning, or more specifically, what would happen if the empire did decide to attack the alliance. Nevertheless, it would happen in the future, now they had to plan on dealing with fire country. Sunaid sat alone in the large council chamber, in front of her stood all the jonin, Anbu and other high-ranking personnel were present. The clan heads were also present, but they did not sit on the council, now she had disbanded it. They did not argue since for them it would only be temporary, as to calm the storm of the civilians, which demanded action. Needless to say it seems to have worked. Everyone is present Lady Tsunade Shizun informed her. Good, now it was time to inform them of what had just transpired on the world stage. As you are now all aware, the council has been disbanded due to the resent outcry of the events which transpired a few days ago. This is only temporal measure until the events stabilize then it will be recalled. But I'm sure you are all aware of this. As she said this many of the clan heads had solemn faces. They didn't like the fact they essentially lost their political power in Kanahagakur, but this was for the best due to the civil primary reason why they went quietly was due to the fact they would be reinstated when the new council was selected in the near future. We are well aware of this lady Hokichi as she spoke with an irritated tone, annoyed at the fact he had to be reminited on this situation, but I don't think that is the reason you called this meeting. Sunaid smiled and nodded. Just over half an hour ago, I received news from the capital of events going on in the Western Empire, and the Northern Alliance at this everyone was edge, it appears that the Northern Alliance has declared war on the Empire. No one could believe what they just heard. What motivated the Alliance to attack an Empire as large as the Western Empire? It would be understandable if Naruto had allied with Fire Country, as he would be on the offensive. But he did not want anything to do with the war, so why did they attack a target not taking part? It just didn't make sense. What are the specifics Lady Hokage? Asuma asked with half a cigarette in his mouth. The land of Earth, along with the smaller countries of Mountain and Rice have in essence broken off from the Northern Alliance by doing a direct assault on the Western Empire. They have broken through the borders and are now beginning to move deep into the Empire's territory. By doing this, the Northern Alliance's military strength has essentially been halved, and the Daimyo does not want to waste this opportunity it has caught their attention. The fact that the Alliance is not as strong as it once was by half of their members going on a sideshow, which is now a critical mistake on their part, he does not want to let this window close when we can actually gain the initiative. He wants the majority of Kanahagakur's military strength to join the army of Hai no Kuni, and deal a knockout blow to force what's left of the Alliance apart. If we deal enough damage to the Alliance militarily, then the daimyos of the opposite countries may request a ceasefire. Now they understood why they were all here, they were mobilizing to go to war. Looking back the tensions that had risen during the past few months now all led to the moment, the moment when both sides would finally clash. Everyone would have to put in their two pence if they were to stand a chance and see through this war. The inevitable had happened. 
so you're finally mobilizing, eh? Everyone turned to see the toad San and leaning against the wall. Well, I might as well take part, after all. I wouldn't like to see this village fall to Rachimera of all people. At this, Sunaid smiled at her teammate. Looks like everyone was going. Right then, I want all Jonin, Anbu and Chunin available to gather outside the gates in one hour. When everyone is assembled we will march to the capital. Destiny awaits us all and we shall face it head on. Dismissed. It has been a little more than a week's journey for Yukimura and his legion to make it to the base of the valley that would be their battleground. The young general, along with many from among the ranks, could not help but gaze in wonder at the terrain formations and saw why his imperial majesty wanted to stage a defensive action here. This place surely favored the defender. The valley was a vast green field, a beauty of nature which contained a variety of different terrain pieces, nature's art at its best. Surrounding the valley was an immense mountain which acted as natural barriers for all ground dwellers and moved this way for miles. It was primarily dominated by different sized hills and slopes, the biggest of these were near the center of the valley, forming into a multi-ledge mountain that dominated the area. The mountain was ideal for placing a base camp and building fortifications. The ledges also proved perfect locations to place artillery and troop deployments. The mountain was large, but it was not the only terrain in this valley. The large forest seemed to place itself near the mountainous terrain piece, growing and changing to the varying gradient of the mountain valley. It seemed to encompass the entire region below the mountain, claiming it as its own land. The forest would prove ideal cover for cavalry and light mobile units. Ikumar noticed also that a river flowed through the valley, moving through the top end, upon which the enemy would arrive if the emperor's beliefs were correct, and moved right through the valley towards his end, moved just to the left of which his forces were currently standing. Yukimura deduced that unless a bridge was built, one side of this valley would be inaccessible to ground forces. However at the same time, it limited the maneuverability for both forces. Upon looking at this it seemed that Yukimura would have to place his troops carefully, if he did not want his men to be unable to move in their formations. As he looked at his map to see if this was indeed the location he was ordered to, he saw the reason clearly why this place was the designated spot for the showdown. It was a direct route to the capital from where the enemy forces were originally positioned. If they didn't come through here, then they would lose a week at least trying to get around the mountainous landscape. This valley was an important location for merchants, travelers and indeed military units, due to the fact it could cut travel times considerably, if they wanted to move to the capital, or any of the central region for this case. If any doubt that the enemy forces were going to come through here still laid in his mind, they were now long gone. It was common sense to come through here, if you wanted to reach the capital quickly. From reports about the enemy's progress, they would surely come through here. Region defense forces had already come into contact with the enemy, and although were defeated, not only did they reduce their numbers, even only if by a small fraction, they gave a better reading of what they were up against. Apparently they were traveling light, as such artillery trains were not in use. Not only this, but their supplies only had a limited duration, only allowing to keep their forces going for a month or two. Why would most probably have a supply train, a logistics line for the army? He received reports that the regional defense forces not involved in the direct conflict were hampering and in essence, destroying the supply lines. Due to the high walls of the towns and cities in the eastern region, an assault would be costly for them. Likewise, attacks on villages would cause more harm than good, as it would cause grown contempt against them if they attack civilian targets. If they wanted to stand any chance to succeed, then they would have to do a direct assault on the capital. Yukimura shook his head, they were playing a massive gamble here, an all or nothing roll of the dice. A defeat here against the west would certainly cause the northern alliance to reel. Yukimura saw that on the map he was closer to the valley than the enemy forces were. As such it would give him time to prepare defenses and prepare for the emperor's immediate arrival. That is until he saw the emperor and his retinue standing right before him in the legion, a smile on his face. Took your time, a eh, general Yukimura, he asked with a cheery tone, enjoying the jaw-dropped look of the young general, along with many of the officers mounted beside him. Your Imperial Majesty. They hurried of their horses and fell to one knee each, trying to save face of not noticing him sooner. Naruto shook his head before motioning them to stand. As they stood he walked towards the general. I take it you're enjoying the scenery general? He asked. Yukimura smiled. I can see why your Imperial Majesty chose his location for the defense against the opposing forces. I take it that the mountain in the center will be a center point for the defense. He asked pointing to the large hilly piece that would be perfect for the defense. To his shock however, the young emperor shook his head. If we deploy our main force there then we lose the element of surprise. While the division will be staged there for the battle, our main force will be all around this valley. At this Yukimura looked perplexed. May I ask what your imperial majesty is planning? At this Naruto smiled. It was not a kind smile however, it was a smile that showed just how cruel he could be. I intend to surround and completely annihilate this army, and send a message to the northern alliance that they had made a serious mistake is declaring war on this empire. Yukimura shall show these eastern fools just how powerful a legion can be. Kodamayu was deeply annoyed as he looked at the valley before him. 
Actually annoyed was not the right word, for he was downright furious. It had taken him and his men just over a month this far, and near enough every day something went wrong. If it were not the small local forces that appeared to hound them in person, it would be other forces that would hamper their supplies only their lines of logistics, causing if lucky only a small amount of what supplies they actually needed. Which they smashed aside every force they came across, every battle cost them a day to the capital. It was as if they were just coming towards them as to stall them to reaching their destination on time. So far they are a week behind schedule, and it began to show them in the ranks. The constant warfare, the constant harassment, the constant need for supplies, which are insufficient, has now begun to sap the moral of the men. The rations are small already, and the fact that the only way to make the supplies last is to make them smaller. Doing so however could cause severe backlash from the troops, as well as decreasing their fighting finesse. Even his rival Inoki agreed something had to be done, but it didn't find a solution to the constant assaults on the supply train for the army. Sometimes the needed recourses, food, water and materials never arrived. Even if they did appear, it was only a small part of what was actually sent, or actually needed. Pressure was put on this force to end this war quickly, or else they would not be defeated by an army, but by their stomachs. There had already been a serious debate on raiding western villages for recourses, but both he and the old man were against it. They knew that if that were to happen, then it would enrage the empire even further. They were far more than sheer barbarians, and they didn't want to fall into the trap of being shown as inhumane. That's exactly what the empire wants them to be. Needless to say it was a clever strategy by starving them out of much needed provisions while in hostile territory, and a part of him cannot help but think if they were woefully unprepared. He knew that if he came with siege equipment and other, much heavy materials, and take over the fortified towns and cities, then he wouldn't have to worry about the constant harassment to his logistics. The only problem was that conflict with one of the imperial legions would be definite, and from what he has heard from captured prisoners of war, is that a single legion would indeed overshadow his own force. Both he and the third cage of earth did not want to face the definite defeat of facing a legion, even if they were in city walls, for the people would surely help them. No, the only road to success now was to follow the plan through, no matter how tough it would become for them. As the army marched slowly into the narrow entrance to the valley pass, Kotomaya could not help but feel a wave of dread over him. This place had an eerie feel to the seemingly calm location. As he looked around from being mounted on his horse, Anoki hovered to his side. This place is a perfect spot for an ambush he muttered to the young Redid. Kotomaya sighed. Indeed, we should advance cautiously through the fields, and avoid the force. I don't want to risk any ambush if they appear. At this Anoki nodded in agreement to the general's words. General, look up there. An officer yelled. Turning to the officer, he saw him pointing to a location. When he looked to the direction, he smiled. That mountain was either a perfect place to set up camp, or was an ambush site. That scouts to take a look at that location. He yelled out. Shortly after several mounted troops rode at all speed to take a look at the mountain. All at the same time the valley was getting filled by the soldiers of the alliance. Kotomaya smiled, it seemed that so far this place was deserted. Well if the scouts return and say it's all clear, this would be a perfect place to rest for the day. The men need it, Anoki spoke with a tired voice. Indeed, pushing them any further today would be too risky. We're already behind by a week, so half a day won't hurt. Besides, that mountain is a brilliant defensive position. Indeed. I find it amusing that no one is here to meet us. I thought there would be an army there. At this the old man laughed heartily. Several officers who heard what he said also laughed. The young general smiled, but then frowned. This didn't go unnoticed by the old cage. What's wrong? Disappointed about the enemy not being here. He joked. He suddenly turned serious as he looked at the blank expression the young Redid beheld on his features. No he replied in a solemn tone, I find it hard to believe that no army is here to meet us at this location. Surely they would know this was a good defensive position. The fact that the mountain looks deserted, with no banners, no sounds either. All is quiet, too quiet, it's as if this place was. Then it suddenly hit him. With a loud shout, he roared to his troops. Everyone out the valley now. He moment his words left his lips, explosions burst all around him. Men were blown apart where they stood as everyone scrambled to try and get out of the valley. Any sort of discipline was lost as explosions ran through the ranks, turning the army's retreat effectively into a route due to the sheer shock of the attack. Kotomayu was thrown off his horse along with some of his officers, due to the sudden explosions that rocked his army, all of which was heading to the exit. But suddenly the exit for the Alliance army was sealed. Explosions rocked the mountains, and large rocks of various proportions flew down into the valley below. Men were crushed under the large stones that came into the narrow valley entrance. The men soon found to their horror that the entrance was blocked. There was no way out. They were officially trapped. I never thought it would say this, but thanks Kotomaya spoke in a depressed tone to the fact he was in his rival's debt. Anoki created a barrier around both them and the officers around him, that protected them from any form of blasts. As he looked around, he saw bodies of his men laying motionless on the ground. 
Some were even in pieces, those unfortunate to be directly onto the explosions. Why didn't I see this coming? He managed to growl out, annoyed at the fact he was blind to this tactic. Anoki looked at him, assessing any damage course. You know what happened? One of the officer asked, trying to get to grips with the situation while getting up from the ground. It was all set up. The mountain was made to look deserted so we would be compelled to go to it. The fact is that we have fallen into their trap. This entire valley has been rigid. He turned to the now blocked entrance. And there is no way out. At this Anoki smiled. Well looks like we're going to have a fight. Well he prepared to give orders, only to be silenced by the sounds of roars of men all around him, so many voices which just seemed to surround them. When he looked to the mountain, he saw banners being held high. Unexpectedly one of the officers shook a fear. My god they turned to him, seeing his go pale at what he was looking at. What is it? Tell me. The general demanded. With a shaky hand he points to the mountain, where the banners are held high. It's the 3rd Imperial Legion the officers paled, while Kotomaya slowly turned to see even more banners being held, along with a lot of men standing tall on the mountain. As he looked closely to the banners, even though they were some distance away, he could make out the ancient numerals for 3, 3 capital I's. Looks like we are going to find out what these legions are going to be made of firsthand. Anoki muttered, before turning to the officers. Get the soldiers back into formation. As they scrambled to reorganize the army and restore order, the cage then turned to young general. You ready for this fight? He asked. He sighed. Well looks like we are going into the jaws of hell itself. If this is to be our last fight, then let us give them a battle they shall never forget at the Sunoki grinned. He liked that idea. Yes, let's show them what we are capable of. Now? Yukimura yelled as he raised he wore fan high. Men stationed all around the mountain pressed the detonators, thus setting off the mines that were buried in the ground They caused the army stationed in the valley floor to lose all cohesion. This was the start of their plan to completely obliterate this invading nation and show the eastern nations the power of the western empire. Naruto smiled as he saw his plan fall neatly into place. He watched as the black powder mines he had the legion place all around the valley floor go off, causing the army to essentially fall apart. Then as he looked upon the routing army, he watched as Yukimura signal for the mines that were carefully planted on the mountains to detonate, thus entrapping the enemy forces in the valley, with no way out. Looking down he saw on one of the ridges the corpses of the men sent to scout the mountain, they didn't stand a chance. A part of him couldn't believe how easily this plan worked. The enemy was either overconfident or desperate for a defensive position to settle down to. Needless to say it did not matter now. This would be the Empire's finest hour. He chuckled as he watched the enemy force try to regain its discipline and cohesion to try and prepare for the inevitable. Grasping his sword tightly be the sheath, he raised his hand to gather everyone's attention that was on the top of the mountain. Look legionnaires at your opponent upon the valley floor. Look at him groveling and reeling at just a small portion of what you are capable of. These fools believe that they are a match against this empire born from blood, sweet and tears. They are soft, weak and deceived into believing they could bring down our empire. Now look at them. Their arrogance has led them to this, their arrogance has led to their demise. Now show these invading parasites your wrath. Show them your fury at the fact they have dared to taint this land with their presence. Show them no mercy. Bring them down with the might of the empire as your righteous fist. And shatter our adversary. At this roars were heard throughout the mountain, and it soon spread throughout the valley, showing that the entire valley was covered by the legion and its divisions. Naruto smiled as he watched events fall into place. Very shortly his third imperial legion would smash aside this pitiful excuse of an army. While the legion dealt with the army, the ninja clans that accompanied him from the palace would deal with Earth's ninja. Soon the difference between styles would be apparent in this battle. He could see his own personal battle as he gazed upon the reforming ranks of the alliance army, as he spied on one figure in particular. It was time to end this one month war. Now the Battle of Kamina Valley was about to begin, and the fate on the continent was hanging in the balance. Thanks for watching.